Data log of Selian First Contact 2667, War Chief Torlak. What say the scanners? demanded Torlak at a young bridge officer. Nothing currently, War Chief, just some background noise of the nearby gas giant, he said before continuing his work. He pondered the viewport from his raised seat and took in the hum of electronics present on the bridge with the crew manipulating data on their respective screens. Before him, a series of celestial bodies were dotted on a holographic display in the center of the bridge. Six planets were present with an asteroid that separated the fifth from the sixth body, which happened to be a large gas giant with several more moons orbiting it. Instead, he turned his attention toward the fourth and fifth planets which orbited relatively close but barely outside each other's influence. He manipulated the display on the two and in full color showcased two planets vibrant with blue and green, indicating a possibility for life. Creo, what can you tell me about these two worlds? Torlak asked his chief star scientist. They are Demira and Anmira. Sister planets recently discovered just last year by a group of explorers commissioned by the Fathers to explore this region of space, he explained. As long as it's away from Galactic Union space, Torlak said, garnering small snickers from the crew. They're nothing but fanatical. His crew nodded in agreement before one of the crew members called his attention. War Chief, I'm picking up a signal opposite the planet. It's small, but I think I can access it. Torlak pondered the notion before waving his hand with assent. What felt like days was only mere minutes before he exclaimed his findings. Chief, I have it! Shall I bring it up on screen? Torlak nodded. Do it. Before he and the crew were a series of images and sounds that assaulted their ears before being isolated into individual entities. Torlak looks upon the cycling of images and video before him. Hairless bipeds with the only evidence of hair on their heads and face. Creo began cycling through his datapad on all the known races within the Galactic Union, but came up empty. I thought this area of space was void of a colony, Torlak stated. It should be, Creo responded. The Home Council has yet to approve this system's colonization. It is still pending. So far, the images and video, while still jarring, were not as much of a concern as finding a new race of sapient beings. However, he held on to his reservations. Cease all communications and ensure we haven't been detected, he ordered. His crew did as they were told and awaited his next series of instructions. After it was reported, they were clear. The bridge returned to only the hum of electronics and ventilation before he answered. Return home, he said promptly. Leave a probe in the asteroid field and arrange a meeting with the War Council in interspace. They did as they were ordered and noticed a probe make its way into the asteroid field closest to Anmira, facing both planets. Their orbits were more or less in sync, and Torlak used that to keep an eye on both planets. The probe was the latest in stealth capability, and is primarily used for military operations to keep their eyes on the edge of Union space. However, he had a feeling about these beings that didn't sit right with him, and instead chose to convene with the War Council on the matter. The chamber was in an uproar. Are we sure they're not one with the Galactic Union? One councilman asked. Beyond our region of space? Are you absurd? Another rebuked. This continued with War Chief Torlak standing before them as they argued among one another before ultimately turning their attention toward the one in question. What say you, War Chief? The center-most council member beckoned. His demeanor was calm and his leathery-like skin was wrought with creases and scars from battles past. I have provided what information we could gather, he said, projecting the information on a hologram projector in the center of the room. Many of the photos and videos showcased were innocent, showing parental figures and their offspring, much like how his people would memorialize their travels. However, we did come across what seems to be a news report within their people. Phonetically, yes, our language is similar. Their script, however, is vastly different from ours. I had some of our technicians translate it. He turned on the audio log across the bottom. TRSC troops secure refinery depot in Alameda system. Do they use Galactic Common War Chief? One council member asked. Phonetically, yes, our language is similar. Their script, however, is vastly different from ours. I had some of our technicians translate it. He turned on the audio. 
Republic forces in proximity to Alameda system, led by Vice Admiral Wolf, retook control of the largest refinery in the system, and workers are rejoicing at their rescue. On the ground, leading the decisive assault was Lieutenant O'Brien, who... The feed was cut off and the council members groaned with dismay. I am sorry, but that was all we could retrieve before we had to leave the system, Torlak responded to their groans. The council members looked at one another and began their debate. If this is truly an independent race, should we not induct them under the Union? One in green robes suggested, but was rebuked by one dressed in red. Are you crazy? Our relationship with the Union is too strained to bring them in. I'm surprised they haven't sent the Flag and Legion Unions after us. As long as they hold up their end of the treaty, we should be fine. I think we should make diplomatic contact with them. Another in blue added to the conversation. This would continue back and forth, and Torlak could do nothing but wait. After several hours, it seemed they had finally come to a final decision. It is the opinion of this council that this new race be promptly and swiftly eradicated. A member who donned purple spoke. May I ask the reason? I find this decision most ill, Torlak responded. The one in purple rose. He had an arrogant face, and his actions felt like they were wishing for a fight. You know our history with the Galactic Union and our hard-fought war to gain our independence from them. Torlak nodded. We simply cannot risk another species into the fold. They have shown that they still fight among their own and show no sense of unity. In any case, this might provide a needed advantage to gain favor with the Union, he said, his nose raised slightly to the air. Do you accept this task? I do, Torlak said, kneeling. He was dismissed, and he left for his ship. The decision weighed heavily on his mind. He would resolve himself and complete his task. He entered his ship and with his battle group set off to their first target. Torlak and his battle group drifted through space scanning all parts of the sector. They entered from the outermost part of the system with the planets Demira and Anmira. Ensure all ships are at stealth output and jam any signals that enter our sphere, Torlak commanded. He peered out into the void and magnified images of the respective planets were in front of him. He noticed more buzz around the bodies, more than before, and issued a caution to the group. He once again thought to himself about the purpose of his mission. He understood that what he was about to commit goes against much of what he believed in, but found ways to rationalize it. Stealing himself, he spoke to the group. Attention to all within the War Council's attack force. We are about to engage whose expansion is imperial and threatens our borders. Just like with the advances of the Galactic Union, we will not yield our home to invaders. Cheers rang out from the intercom of his ships and among his bridge. His speech renewed his resolve, and he gave the orders to advance. The speech he gave was the official declaration among his people, and they accepted it. If anything resembled the Union, they hated it and sought its destruction. A result of this is also the increase in recruitment into all branches. They needed more soldiers, and this was the perfect reason for them to join. Utilizing their medium-sized vessels, they started toward all communication relays, which only numbered four. Their forces split, and two-thirds headed for Demira, while the other third headed for Anmira. As soon as they left sublight travel, they destroyed the relays and bombarded stations that orbited the planets. The ships nearby were all cargo and no bigger than their small frigates. They were commercial, but that didn't stop Torlak and his group. They continued their sudden attack and chased any ships that tried to leave, jamming all signals as they did so. When their scans showed no movement, they turned their sights onto the planet and sent out raiding parties. During the start of the raid, he received a call from the leader of the ground forces. Chief General Torlak. The individual called. What do you want us to do with the non-combatants? Torlak pondered. He knew he was cruel as a commander, but he wasn't a monster. Kill the warriors and take the rest as slaves. Perhaps we can sell them to the Union. He paused. But keep the young and healthy. Kill the rest. Yes, Chief General he said, and cut his transmission. Several large cargo ships made their way to the surface and promptly loaded their newly acquired prizes. He hadn't planned for slaves, but felt that if they could take as much as they can, 
It could buy favor from the Union and improve their standing to not be their target. He knew it to be cruel, but pushed it to the back of his mind. Operations were smooth when the planet scarred. He and his group pressed on before receiving notice from one of his crewmen. Chief General, picking up a singular ship on the edge of the system. Do we have ships nearby to intercept? He nodded. We do, already on their way. Torlak nodded. The ship in question was a stubby ship with room for two, and the engines made up almost the entire ship. Nothing was outstanding of the ship to warrant suspicion. It just looked odd. As he was peering at the hollow projector, he was notified again by the same previous crewman. Sir, the ship is leaving the system, toward an intersystem gate they had entered from. He raised his non-existent eyebrows, urging the crewman to continue. We got scans of the ship from the closest interceptor. He paused. Sir, it's a data runner. What? Torlak roared. After it, and destroy it! The three interceptors fired a volley of projectiles largely missing their mark. The craft was accelerating faster than the interceptors before it opened a tear in space near an intersystem gate. Torlak was dumbfounded, along with the rest of the crew. Among the silence, he heard a mumble from one of the crewmen who manned the sensor arrays on the ship. T they don't use a gate? He said in an audible whisper. B but that's impossible! Creo, what's he talking about? Torlak ordered from his chief scientist. It, um, appears that this race doesn't use the conventional inter-system gate that us and the Union use. He swallowed. Instead, they just tore through space and, well, vanished. He was at a loss. All ships, both Selian and Galactic Union, utilize two forms of travel. Sublight is used for travel between celestial bodies in a system and the inter-system gate a tunnel of space that connects one system to another. Previous eras utilized large gates that could open up an interspace gate, but now ships have that technology on board, and they can open it if they are close enough. So whatever this ship did was outside their realm of knowledge. Forcefully, he shoved those thoughts aside. All ships advance to the nearest IS gate and await your orders. All slave ships proceed home. I will send word of our cargo. Torlak cut his transmission and proceeded toward their designated spot. This is just the beginning, he said aloud. His crew nodded, and he and the rest of his fleet readied before the intersystem gate. As he said, he relayed word to the War Council about their latest cargo and what was to be done. With that out of the way, he pressed on and waited until all available warships were present before entering the gate. Before advancing, he addressed all ships present. Now is the moment of truth. We are embarking on a journey foreign to us. Much like the Union, this Republic has encroached on our territory without so much a warning. We will not yield to invaders. Press on. A large circular gate opened that separated tunnel space from real space. The tunnel swirled in green and white with jagged sparks of plasma intermittently dancing from the tear in real space. One by one, Selian ships entered the gate and as the last entered, space was returned to its silent void. Transmission incoming. Dima System Inquiry. To Stellfleet Com, Orb Com, Raid Com. From Star Runner 4311, jumped to Dima System for routine data pickup. Dima Ivor and V Com relays were offline. Using advanced visual scanners, Dima Colony was attacked by an unknown entity. Ships of unknown make and model. Scavenged data from a damaged satellite. Colonists were dead and captured. Damage to long-range transmitters. Hard data only. ETA. Seven days to Sol. End transmission. Data log of Celian first contact, 2667. Chief Counsel Column. Column exhaled an audible sigh once Torlak left. Other members of the Council began discussing among themselves once again the matter at hand. Two of the council members, Galem and Reka, who donned green and red respectively, were once again arguing the decision on this new species. Should we not at least have voted to initiate diplomatic relations first, Reka? Galem, I give you credit for your diplomacy with the Union, but please keep in mind how much blood was shed just to maintain our borders. We can't risk that. Do not let your sympathy cloud your judgment. Galem resigned, leaving Reka with his head high, having won their argument. Kalim motioned to speak, and the four councilmen quieted. Reka is right. 
It was not long since our border wars with the Union were fought. Reka raised his nose high. However, if not for Gollum, we would not have such a sturdy treaty to use against the Union, and as such, they are honor-bound to it. The four nodded in agreement. What say you, Breka? He motioned to a blue-robed individual, small in stature to the rest. Logistically, we don't know how these people would fare against our military. We're not the best in ground warfare, so our best bet would be ship warfare, he added. If they are new, it's possible this campaign will be swift. I do hope so, Callum said with a heavy heart. Polis, you look like you wish to say something. The purple-robed individual rose from his seat, towering over his fellows. Of course I do. With the fathers before us, we as the current have a duty to uphold. I do not regret this decision to brand these spacefarers as an enemy akin to the Union. He paused, regaining his composure. It is the right thing to do for our people. We need that territory, and the farther from Union space, the better. He garnered the collective nods from his brothers and sat down. Kalim slumped into the back of his chair that rose above him, and his white drapes provided cushion on the already comfy chair he sat upon. Polis, state to the people. If we wish to make this campaign a decisive one, we will need the support of the masses. I do not care how you do it, just do it, he said before rising from his seat. The four rose as he made his way out of the chamber, and he sighed heavily. Callum removed his ceremonial robes and sat at his desk. He had all the time to contemplate his decision, but shoved them aside reluctantly. O oh, fathers, I ask that you watch over the war chief and his forces for a successful campaign, and for our victory and mercy to wash us of our sin. He prayed to himself. Not long after he retired to his quarters, he received a notification on his desk monitor. It was a speech by Polis. My, he certainly works fast. Callum mumbled to himself and played the video. It was the central square in the heart of their capital, Artrey. It wasn't far from the War Council's chambers, but it was also the most populated for all to see. He played it. Fellow Selians, hear me now! He paused. For how long have we lived under the fear of the Galactic Union? For now, our borders with them stay quiet, but ever vigilance is required to stay their hand and protect our borders. He paused once more before continuing. Our honored war chief has come across a new and fearsome foe. They stay silent in the stars, stalking new and upcoming colonies. What can we do with such a foe? I say we attack. They have encroached on our latest colony and have killed fellow citizens of Celia. Booze and vulgarity sprouted from the crowd and Polis continued. That is why we need every able-bodied individual to aid in this fight against this scourge. He began playing doctored videos previously played to them by Torlak. They have no unity, and they prey on each other. The video shocked the crowd, and anger was present in their eyes. Barbarians, savages, and all related terms were thrown at their new enemy. So join us. Join the fight against the Scourge of the Stars. Join Salia. The crowd bellowed in support. It was due to the speech that all branches saw a vast increase in recruitment across all of their space. Not just the military, but industrial jobs as well. Callum accesses records of each source of production. While the military saw the highest, shipbuilders and military technology saw a rise in applicants. Such a case would generate a large boom for their economy. He was ecstatic at the rise of the industry for his people. He wouldn't let the War Council let his people down. He was now invested in his people and actively sought to keep this craze. It is what the fathers would want. As such, Callum would issue endorsements to a multitude of industries. Their approval would be through the roof, and if they maintained this, well, they might just go down in history. After several days, Callum received notice from Torlak about some cargo he recently acquired. What news do you bring, Chief General? Callum asked. We were successful in our raid on Demira and Anmira. I have sent cargo ships back to Artre. I suppose you find a way to utilize them, Torlak responded. What did you bring? I have captured slaves of the enemy. Oh? Then I will get Galem and Breca to broker some sort of trade agreement with the Union. This will bring us goodwill, and hopefully they will leave us alone, Callum said, running the newfound success of their once waning economy. I will procure more cargo ships to the front upon the subjugation of the worlds you come across. Torlak bowed 
but not before he stated his final request. I fear the more we press on into their territories, their security will only increase. Do we have any word on the other war chiefs to send to the front? We do, Callum said plainly. I will issue a call to available chiefs. Currently, I can only offer Chief Commander Brollo. He will do, Torlak said with a hint of disdain. I will report after my next conquest. He gave a final bow and cut the transmission. Callum changed his call and Brollo's name was selected. After a moment, the person in question answered, To whom do I owe the pleasure? Brollo said in a scaly tone. His face was scarred and he wore damaged ceremonial armor. His lower jaw was replaced with one made of metal. Ah, uh, Chief War Councilman, this is unusual. I assume you've already heard, Callum said sternly, placing a callous facade upon his face. If you mean the speech by Councilman Polas, then yes. Then you must know what I am asking of you. Brollo nodded. I am redirecting your forces to the front alongside Chief General Torlak. Brollo laughed before reassuming his previous demeanor. Little Torlak made Chief General. Well, I am surprised. That won't be an issue, will it? Callum asked. It will not. So, what do you wish of my forces? Callum thought for a moment. Torlak will require extra hands in his campaign, and his fleet is not well versed in ground combat as yours are. Very well. I shall see to it. Where will I be going? Just beyond the new colony system of Yamela, there is an inner space gate opposite the system. You are free to raid what is left of Demira and Anmira, Callum explained. Very well. He hissed before cutting off the transmission. Callum rested upon his bed and before he knew it, drifted off to sleep. The first days of the war had started. He and his people were now committed. Callum woke up from his nap to a plethora of messages, and from his quick assessment, most were good news. All were domestically related, and so he pushed them onto the other four council members. Several stated a need for a draft of terms for diplomatic trade, with Brecca manning all relations of logistics, both militarily and commercial. All messages directed toward the military were sent to Reka. He had ways voiced that there needed to be a change in the training regimen to get their ground troops familiar. Finally, he moved the last of the messages that dealt with public relations to Polis. After sending those messages to the appropriate recipients, he donned his white robes and made his way to the central council chamber. The other four were present, but were busy dealing with issues he had just passed to them on their podium monitors. The drum of clerical workers ran about, each cog in the machine giving orders to their lesser. It was normal for him to see, so he paid it no mind. As it came closer to high sun, the workflow slowed and the chamber was found mostly empty, save for some guards scattered about the room. In the center, a well-dressed worker stood at the center with a data pad in his hand, and he began to disclose the next order of business. For the following hearing, we have the promotion of two war chiefs. The first is War Chief Dalagon. He has been in service during the end portion of the border dispute with the Union and has since curbed any unauthorized Union ships from operating within Selian space. The council members were pleased with his assessment and motioned for a second. The second is War Chief Namu. He oversees our armored division and was responsible for the subjugation of multiple Halen death worms at Mining Facility 113, effectively securing materials needed for ship manufacture and ice gate engine cores. His efforts greatly contribute to the current threat we are facing. A round of applause went around the council. All in favor of their promotion, Reka announced, and was met with unanimous assent. Bring them in! He gave a slight bow and motioned for the doors opposite of them to open, and the two in question made their way to the center and knelt. Raise your heads, warriors, Callum spoke in a tone that demanded silence. You both have done great work for the Selian people, and it will be my honor to grant both of you the title of Chief Captains. Another round of applause came from the councilmen. Both were given a band of cloth that was wrapped around their collar. It was black with a single golden icon of an avian predator native to Selia called a Revan. All Chief Captains begin with the Revan. This occasion was showcased on video and to many military installations, especially those these chiefs have served with. Colum spoke. Now, with your new titles, you will be allocated 250 ships each. Namu and Delogon were in shock. 
I know it seems like a lot, it is, but I have confidence you will both deliver to Celia and her people. They affirmed in unison. Before you go, once you are acquainted with your fleets, you are to assist Chief General Torlak in his efforts of our most sacred crusade. They both nodded fervently and, when dismissed, promptly left the chamber. When they were clear, the councilmen took their seats. Only 250? Reka questioned. I was sure we planned to give them each a fleet of at least 500 ships. Now, brother, Reka calmed. The issue on Halen dampened production, and those death worms were wreaking havoc on the entire world. It can't be helped. 250 each. Reka resigned to the facts. Besides, an additional 500 ships would do well to bolster the campaign fleet. Again, Reka sighed and quietly returned to his podium monitor. Reka, how many ships does that bring the main force to? Column asked. Well, Torlak boasts most of the fleet at 1,000 ships total, and with Chief Commander Bralo and now Namu and Dalagon with a total of 650. So 1,650 total ships. Breka answered, that's almost as much during the Union border war. It's practically the embodiment of death, Gullim retorted. Isn't that the point? interjected Polis, who received agreement from his brethren. There's no reason we should lessen our forces now. We need to maintain some by the border to keep up appearances so the Union doesn't get any funny ideas. Callum and the other councilmen agreed. They couldn't back down now. But they also couldn't sacrifice forces from the border. Chief General Torlak would have to make do with his current and incoming forces. The War Council adjourned for the day, keen to the workings of increasing military and the threat of Union intervention. Callum thought to himself about the implications of hiding such an entity. Luckily, the time it would take them to reach Selian space would only take about a year from their closest colony in the outer reaches of the Union. As such, he jammed all signals outbound in their direction. With the day now over, Callum and his council retired for the day. Outbound transmission, Xenoforce inquiry. Two, stealthfleetcom.orbicom, raidcom. From early warning defense system, Athena, Draxa system, anomaly detected, 1,000 signatures detected. Detecting additional 650 signatures. Asset report, relays, zero. Stations, one. Satellites, zero. Orbital guard unresponsive. No present military force. Requesting support. Nearest response. Alameda system. Estimated arrival 0000. End transmission. Error. Did not send. Data log of Celian first contact 2667. Star Runner 4311. Pilot J. Kurt. J. looked out into a brightly colored tunnel that swirled purples, blues, and white as they zipped by toward their destination. With a half-eaten burrito in hand and his legs propped up on his dash, he called for his one other crew member. Hey, how much longer to Demma, Cam? An audible sigh could be heard from a station behind his pilot's seat. If you just look at your displays, you would know. I know, he paused, taking another bite of his station burrito. But I'm eating, Jay said with a smirk. Just under an hour, Cam said, returning to his station. He manipulated a series of functions on his display, and the audible sounds of redirecting power could be heard. What you doing? Jay asked. Just rerouting power to generate the shields before we exit our jump. I swore we were maxed, said Jay. What's our signature output at? I would not be surprised if there were pirates this far out. Cam scanned his monitor and gave a short reply. IR is dancing around 1 to 1 1.5 thousand. EM is around 2.6 thousand. I'll lower power output once we exit our jump. Good to know, Cam. I could always count on you, Jay said before returning to his remaining burrito. Several minutes passed, and the crew was reaching the end of their jump. Like a fish out of water, the crew was met with the silent void and only the drum of their engine to keep them company. Shields are full, lowering power output to a minimum. Hey, Cam said with a hint of worry in his voice. Are you reading this? He said, directing Jay to a monitor on his dash. No. It's just showing up for me. Jay maneuvered his fingers and brought the signal online. Check the status of Dima 4 and 5. I'm not picking up their waypoints on my HUD. As he said, the signal came through as an urgent plea for help. If anyone can hear this, please, send the fleet, the guard. I don't care who. Just come. It played before the signal was cut off and began to loop. What the hell? Jay muttered before his attention was brought back by Cam. Got a signal from a lone commercial satellite. Long-range capabilities are shot, so it's only transmitting in the system. 
Delta Band. Delta Band? He thought. Cam, check the other commercial bands. He shook his head. Just noise. Then a sudden realization came upon Cam and suddenly began furiously tapping away at his station. After a few moments and calls from Jay that went ignored, Cam spoke. It ain't pirates! And motioned for his findings onto a free monitor in front of Jay. It was a series of still images from the lone satellite. Several large ships were followed by a series of smaller ones. Jay noted three large ships he thought to be a carrier of sorts, due to the amount of much smaller ones, the size of a typical fighter, who were entering and leaving. Surrounding them looked to be a series of cruisers, frigates, and corvettes, with the smaller version boasting a large presence. It's an entire invasion force, but from what? Cam said, scanning the material once more and adding notes. Switching to optical lenses, increase power output, Jay ordered. I doubt that's a good idea, Cam rebuked. Jay sighed. Just do it, Cam. With a motion of his finger, he slid the indicator for power output beyond the minimum. And with that came brighter lights, electronics, and their signature. Just a moment, Jay said in a focused trance. And got it. Sending you the data now. It was another series of videos and images from the satellite that detailed images on the surface, as well as high-definition shots of the invading forces. Jesus, they're taking slaves, Cam blurted. We have to notify the fleet. The ship can't send that amount of data. It'll only get corrupted. And the station here is nothing but dust. Jay paused. We're gonna have to head back to the Draxis system and at least issue a read-only transmission. Fine, I'll prep a statement. Cam said right before alarms began blaring in the compartment. What the hell? We got contacts. Three. Jay reported urgently. Shots of red plasma flew by his ship, and the shields flickered from the impact before settling. Jay swung the ship in an erratic U-turn and ordered max output and max thrust. What about shields? Cam hollered. We're fine. Focus shields to the rear until we jump. The alarm still blared, and a red light flashed intermittently in the singular cabin while Jay did his best to outmaneuver his enemy's shots. He cycled the targeting system through each enemy, but did so intending to gather as much information as possible. His ship was defenseless. No missiles, no guns, only thrust. Nearing the edge of the system, the ship rocked, and Cam reported that their shield was depleted and long-range communications were shot. I was able to send a message to Stellar Command, but I don't know if it'll reach them in time. Not without a slip-space laser array. How long before it reaches then? Jay probed. Seven days. Despair engulfed the cabin. The rattling of the ship and red light were the only constant in their escape. Well, good news. We got distance, preparing to jump into slip-space. Cam refastened his harness and began transferring all data onto a single drive, out of the many they already possessed. Just so you know, I scrubbed all the data from the ship and put it on a drive. Good. Get ready. I'm making the jump. Cam nodded, even though Jay couldn't see him, and executed the slip space sequence. A dark purple, blue, and white circle appeared in front of them, almost seemingly out of nowhere. It was just large enough for the ship to enter. Jay looked at his radar and every other sensor he had, and found the interceptors too far to engage with normal fire, but an alarm indicating a lock blared. You have got to be kidding me, Jay yelled. A symbol of fire appeared on his screen with a countdown that descended rapidly. He waited until the countdown reached three before he launched countermeasures. A series of rapid pops were felt from the ship, and when the countdown hit zero, an explosion rocked the starboard side of the ship. Seeing that they weren't dead, and the flares worked, he accelerated into the sphere. As soon as they passed, their opening closed behind them. They had survived. Hey! A large, frustrated sigh erupted from Jay. What the hell, man? Another sigh was heard from Cam, just not as loud. Did you analyze their ships? Jay asked. Not yet. They're heavy on the fighter front, and I don't even want to know what kind of weapons those ships have. He slid into his chair. Silence regained hold of the cabin once more, and the light of slip space filtered through the cockpit. How long until Draxus? Silently tapping on the monitor, Cam responded. About eight hours. All right, I'll take my nap first. Wake me up in four. Jay pressed a button and his seat moved back on a rail before swiveling 180 degrees from the cockpit. Cam's station faced the bulkhead to his right, and their bunks were just the opposite of that. The rack that held their data drives was placed next to his station. 
The restroom was situated opposite next to the bunks and was sealed. Beyond that were solely maintenance doors that had access to easily replaceable components. Jay took some time to siphon through them before setting on one designated for communications. We don't happen to have an extra size one comms package, do we? Jay asked. Nope, just rations. Jay sighed and yanked the smoky component from its slot and set it down. He figured that damage from the plasma shot fried the circuits as they sent out their final message to Saul. In any case, long-range communication was out of the question until they could get a replacement part. Jay retired for now to his bottom bunk and dozed off. The hum of the ship and the tapping away of fingers on keys. Incoming transmission. Dima system inquiry, urgent. To Draxis system, Mantis station. From Star Runner 4311, Cam Farron. Dima system is compromised by an unknown entity. Requesting Republic Stellar Command Liaison. Request is urgent and high value. ETA, 7.5 hours. End transmission. Error. Error. Did not send. Loop. Yes, no. Data log of Celian first contact, 2667. Star Runner 4311. Pilot J. Kurt and Cam Farron. Jay settled into his seat as it swiveled him to face the cockpit and secured itself. He brought up a holographic display and selected some buttons on a related display, and the image changed to that of their destination. Draxis system, it's a single star system with four planets. The closest to the sun, Veru, is inhospitable, but had a large following of miners that scoured its numerous cave systems. Then Gala, a gas giant with three moons that each houses separate research facilities. Draxis, the main colony with its small moon, and finally, Drona. Another planet similar to Veru is used primarily as a mining colony. He scanned the hollow display and set a course for Mantis Station. It was the largest station that orbited Draxis and was the center of trade in the system. That was his destination and his only source to get word to the Republic about an impending attack. His travel time was just a little over an hour, but his anxiety aided him. It was a wonder was able to sleep at all, he did pre-operational checks on all his systems and occasionally rerouted power to regenerate his lost shields. When everything was fine for the time being, he just stared off into space. Just a few minutes before they exited the jump, Jay woke Cam. They entered their seats and prepared to exit. With a flash, they were met with the same familiar void, but this time both sighed in relief. Oh, thank God, Cam voiced. Normal comms traffic. That brought reassurance to Jay as he maneuvered himself for a slipstream jump. Slipstream was different from normal slipspace in it that slipspace was used for intersystem travel, while stream was only ever utilized for intrasystem travel. With ships as small as his, that's all it could allow. Newer models of ships allowed slipspace jumps in the system, but that needed heavier computational power, so such a function was only available to ships larger than medium frigates. He didn't mind it. From where he entered from, a stream jump would only take about ten minutes. As such, he oriented his ship to align with Mantis Station's nav beacon. When his engine was spooled, he jumped. Upon approach to the station, Jay finally made contact with the station, although it was only automated. Please proceed to your designated landing pad, the voice said in a feminine sway, and the beacon popped up on his HUD for his landing zone. The landing pad was an exposed deck with a nearby airlock and blinking lights to indicate the area where he could land. When he made his way above it, he issued an auto-land command with a press of a button. The ship oriented itself and landed without issue. Jay readied his helmet and motioned for Cam to do the same to which Cam nodded. I'm going to stay with the ship, he said. I just got a feeling, and handed the drive in question to Jay. Jay nodded and opened the hatch. He had in place a second-generation air shield, so there wasn't a need for Cam to don his helmet. However, just to be cautious, he was quick in his egress and promptly sealed the door. He tapped his wrist-mounted device and spoke. Keep the ship warm and call for a refuel order. I'll see if I can see the liaison. Got it, Cam replied, and Jay made his way into the airlock. When the airlock cycled and opened into the main foray, he was met with a bustling station. He entered the station and made his way to security. On his way, he stopped by one of the local food shops. Welcome. How may I help you? The clerk asked. He was an older gentleman with a belly that could barely be hidden by his issued apron. Jay pointed and a sealed burrito and motioned for two. Of course, that'll be 13 credits. 
Jay quietly transferred the funds and continued on his way. He found a seat nearby one of the windows, removed his helmet, and began eating the first burrito. As people passed by, he heard inklings of their conversation. Have you been able to contact your cousin and Dima yet? No. They might be doing repairs on the relay. You would have thought they'd have issued some kind of notice. Jay's heart sank. He could very well reveal to them the state of the Dima colony. But what would that accomplish? It would either incite panic, or they would just label him a madman. He couldn't do that to them, but he also couldn't let whatever happened to Dima happen to Draxus. Draxus has a larger population than Dima did, since it was new, so it's possible that they might have a chance. Or so he wished. He wolfed down the rest of his food and continued towards security with a renewed vigor in his step. How may I be of assistance? The female clerk beckoned. I need to speed with a Republic Stellar Command Liaison now, please, he said. She began tapping away on her computer before she spoke again. First, I need a name and reason for your appointment. Jay Kurt, he said as she typed away. And the reason is confidential. Liaison's eyes only. He responded sternly, trying to impose urgency. She looked at him and stated, Sir, if it is urgent, then I need to know. I'm sure the Draxis militia can handle a few pirate. It's not pirates, okay? The moment he raised his voice, the guards that waited by the doors slowly made their way toward him. Look, sir, I can't help if you do not tell me exactly what you need, she calmly ordered. Jay collected his composure and restated, Look, Dima Colony was attacked. Not by pirates, not by rogues, I don't know. They weren't human. She raised an eyebrow at his request. Very well, let me call for him. She tried to call using a handheld device. Huh, that's weird. The call's not going through, she said. Let me fetch him. He should be on his break. Before departing, Jay called out to her. By the way, where's the nearest fleet? She paused a moment. Alameda. She left and the guard stood by the door. As each second went by, his anxiety soared. It was thus that his fear became reality. The station rocked violently, and the luminescent lights turned from white to red, and the alarms began ringing out. Alert! Alert! Damage to station relay! Enemy combatants inbound! Alert! Alert! Another explosion rocked the station, and Jay ran out from the security office. Data drive in tow. Panic was set, and the residents of the station ran in all directions. Some tripped over themselves and over others to try and get to safety. Jay tried to hail Cam, but the call didn't go through. As he ran, he looked out the station's innumerable planes of multi-layered glass and saw what unfolded outside. He noticed a small cluster of ships between him and the moon. It was large enough to view the silhouettes from the station. Immediately by the station, however, a battle raged on with station forces and militia against an unknown aggressor. From the get-go, the battle was disorganized, while the enemy maintained a state of orderliness. Station sentry guns assisted in the fray and promptly weakened the few that got too close. Those unlucky ships were bathed in flames and rested as a metal coffins for the occupant. He was glad to see the bastards get vaporized, but his joy was short-lived. As the enemy withdrew, several bursts of plasma peppered another section of the station. He ran. He fastened his helmet and continued running. Shots periodically missed their mark, but the ones that did deliver a jaw-shattering shock to the station. Each moment, he tried contacting Cam, and each attempt failed. Running, he peered out the window and noticed his ship still in one piece and a frantic calm in the pilot seat. They saw each other, and he ran even faster, not knowing when the next volley would land. He entered the airlock and waited. The cycling felt like ages, but when it finally signaled that it was clear, he made a clumsy dash to his ship. He was grounded as long as at least one foot was on the deck. As he got closer, Cam exited the pilot seat and opened the door wearing his helmet. Were you able to talk to the fleet? He asked frantically, as Jay made his way into his seat and Cam followed suit. No, they didn't listen, and before I could give them the drive, these assholes arrived and blasted half the station to dust. He yelled as he fastened his harness and placed his hands on his ship's throttle and stick. Where are we headed now? Cam said, urgently putting on his harness at his station. Alameda, he said, lifting off the platform and providing Max thrust as soon as he was clear of the station. The sun was in his way, so he would have to maneuver to Veru and then correct to a proper just location. As soon as he was clear and past the influence of the sun, he could make his slip space jump. As he flew past, he cycled through the comms channels. He was met with static when a thought struck him from their first encounter. 
Cam, switch all bands to Delta and notify all friendly ships. On it. And he furiously sent his hands into a frenzy. After a moment, the sounds of battle came alive. What the hell? It works! One pilot shouted and was followed by several more individuals. Get the word out, Delta Band only! Encrypt it! Another ordered. Through the change in communication, their forces organized, and they were at a standstill with the enemy. All right, who was it? The same pilot from earlier questioned. Me, sir, Star Runner 4311. Jay Kurt, he replied. You've done some good work. What do you know about the enemy? Jay quickly summarized the events in the Dima system and their newfound mission. I understand, he said solemnly. Then you boys have no time to lose. Leave this to us. Yes, sir, Jay replied. Then if they fight like how you say, then there's no point in running. Not for us, he said with calmness. Normally I would have signals from this system's relays, but they've all gone dark. Jay and Cam both understood that implication. You two go now. Send word to Vice Admiral Wolf in Alameda. Tell him Captain Roy sent you. He gave a final farewell. As they departed, the howls of combat from pilots rang out through the intercoms. Fate sealed in sudden static during mid-sentence or cry. An encrypted message notified their ship, but it wasn't directed to him. It was a last-ditch cry for reinforcement system-wide for all who could hear it, but was instead met with silence. Nevertheless, Jay set his course for Veru and activated Slipstream. As he and Cam left, so did the cries and howls of his brethren. All that was left were dust and echoes. As Jay approached Veru, silence remained constant. All bands were silent, including Delta. No relays, satellites, or stations reached out to their pleas, his hope for sending another message to Nye hopelessly. Cam, he said softly, do you think we'll make it? Silence engulfed him, but he spoke out, his words choking him. We have to. We're the only ones who can. Without looking back, Jay nodded, tears forming at the corners of his eyes. He set the course for the outer edge of the system. From his hollow display, he had a few more systems to go before reaching Alameda. Jay spooled the slipspace drive core, and once it was set, he entered the ever-entrancing portal to their next destination. Incoming transmission, Delta Band, Draxis Militia Defense. Two, Drax Mill, Mantisec, All Avail. From Captain Roy, Jericho D. This message goes to all with combat-capable ships. Enemy forces are present near Mantis Station. Requesting fire support and colony evac. The enemy is attacking unprovoked. Initiate militia protocol. Expend all munitions with extreme prejudice. Looping transmission. Source transmission online. Signal lost. Ending transmission. Data log of salient contact. 2667. War Chief. General Torlak. Mm. Torlak mumbled. The battle unfolded on a screen at the front of the bridge. Something the matter, Chief General? A bridge crewman asked. I find our campaign too easy. I expected more resistance. The video we had of their navy exhumed might, not whatever this is, he said with a raised tone. The fighters at the front line re-engaged the ragtag team of enemy fighters and met a force of least resistance. Those sentries are doing work on our fighters. Order the fighters to disengage and have the corvettes prepare a final volley against the station, ordered Torlak. Yes, General, complied a lowly helmsman. The corvettes positioned themselves to not fire on one another and sent one final volley of cannons. The shells themselves were small and so was the yield, but focus fire proved effective, even more so against a vulnerable orbital station. The station exploded spectacularly, throwing debris in all directions. Some even smashed directly into his ships. Make sure all fighters are clear. We can't lose them to pieces of the station. He analyzed the battlefield and noticed a standstill with a collection of enemy forces. What of these forces here? He motioned to an analyst that was scanning the opposite side of the hollow display. It says here there's only around 50 enemy ships here and are holding back our forces. I understand your concern. He started. We did some focused scans, and most of them are boasting what looks to be new models of ships that previously perished. They're not going down as easy. Torlak looked in dismay. What of the ship with the larger signature? Looks to me that it's keeping most of the ships at bay. He pointed to the larger icon, and a visual was brought up upon request. It was a large ship relative to the others surrounding it. 
It was long that came to a tapered point. The dorsal portion of the ship had a series of guns on the left and right with a dual set of single-barrel cannons that lined to spine. Some of the enemy fighters baited some of his own, and when they came into range were promptly decimated with well-placed shots. Torlak's body alarms rang and ordered several corvettes and his fighters to swarm the group. The closer they approached, his fighters would be picked off, and some larger fighters would be swarmed and summarily executed. He felt some pride in their drive to survive and ordered their execution. Four corvettes made their way to the enemy's location and awaited their report. He returned to the hollow display and on it showed his forces evenly split. He initially arrived with four carriers, five cruisers, and fifteen frigates with a mix of small, medium, and light. In addition, he sported around twenty corvettes. The rest were fighters that each found a home with their ships. Most were stationed on the carriers and cruisers, and some were placed on frigates, and the rest escorted the frigates. As soon as they entered the system, he made it essential that they jammed all signals for inter-system communication. Gotta hand it to the science depot for the jammer? It's working wonders, Torlak commented, to which Creo agreed. We figured it would do well against the Union, but it needed some... field tests. We were about to use it in the Halen system, but then the War Council commenced this invasion, he said without lifting his head from a data pad. My statement still stands, he replied before he received a report from the field strategist. Chief General, he said, we finally have reports from the other assault groups. The ships from the mining planet suffered minor losses, and the group that made its way to the gas giant is meeting resistance. What do they report? he commanded. Surface defenses, we've already lost multiple corvettes and frigates. The field strategist reported. He expected total annihilation for the enemy, but this colony was fighting fiercely. We weren't given an exact number, but the fact that they reported losses instead of conquest was cause for concern. Sir, the enemy is moving! A shout came from the previous field strategist. They're headed planet side! Perhaps they plan to evacuate the non-combatants. He studied the view before him. Issue orders to Chief Commander Bralo and have him and his soldiers descend onto the planet, taking a company of corvettes and frigates to assist. Chief, with only his fleet of 150, he responded, should we not just bombard the surface and risk what knowledge they have? No, he ordered. Prepare support for a ground invasion of Bralo's forces. Yes, Chief said the strategist as he began issuing orders to the multitude of ships as his fleet began towards the planet. Reports born of chaos flooded his bridge. Many ships made it to the surface following after the insignificant fleet that fought them earlier, but a new case of chaos flooded the ship. Chief General, a visual came online that took a spot on the forward-facing viewport. It was Bralo. What's wrong? We're getting reports of mass casualties. Torlak commanded a response. Did you not properly survey the planet? He snarled. We did proper scans of your landing zones. There was no evidence of there being defenses. He pointed to a scanner. Y yes, sir. The planet showed no signs of armed defenses. We thought it safe for landing. He cowered behind the chief general. You thought wrong, Bralo retorted. What happened? Beckoned Torlak. The planet is swarming with an increased force of fighters not seen planet side. Not to mention that nearly all of my accompanied fighters were assaulted and now lay with the dirt or in the waters. Torlak thought for a moment. This is fine. He garnered surprise from both the scanner and Bralo. They have no way to call for reinforcements, he began. But sir, the data started the scanner but was promptly hushed by Torlak. Torlak continued. They have no reinforcements, so we have that covered. Just focus on striking at their military installations and city centers. We have slaver ships inbound to this system. Yes, General, he replied, and the call was cut. The scanner resurfaced his earlier comment. But sir, what about that data ship? Surely they've made their way to the edge of the system for a jump. Don't worry, I've sent a ship ahead to intercept them in the next system. With what orders? he asked. To capture. The reports of losses slowed and with a view on his hollow display showed that both forces were at a standstill. While he could very well just bombard the planet from orbit, he decided against it. 
he found that information on the enemy would greatly give an insight into their greater community. While awaiting on the bridge, Torlak received a call from one of the forces below. It was Dalagon. Chief General, he said, my fleet is ready for a second assault on the planet. We await your orders. When the combat stalled, he ordered all available forces to pull back and maintain vigilance around their impromptu field base. The ground team suffered severe losses, and without guaranteed air support, they couldn't support their request for targeted strikes. The enemy was recovering, and Torlak didn't like where that would lead. Hold fast, young captain, he ordered. Regroup with the nearest group and await my orders. Dalogon nodded and cut off the call. Torlak knew he was eager to prove himself, but he couldn't allow that. Not when they knew so little about the enemy. Have you calculated the populace of the planet? Torlak inquired. The scanner manipulated his station a moment before answering. From some of the data recovered by ground teams, approximately ten million. It seems like a relatively lightly populated colony. Most seem to have been taken to bunkers. Can you find them? Torlak probed, to which the scanner shook his head in the negative. There's strong interference from the city centers, so it is difficult to tell. We will focus on that at another time, he said, before returning to the hollow display that revealed the planets and his collective forces. Torlak studied the information and scanned the field once more when was notified of a likely target by his strategist. How about here, General? He showed an isolated compound away from the city's defenses. From what we've learned from the rest of the planet's defenses, this compound is lightly defended and scans indicate it is lightly populated. Forward scouts believe it to be an intelligence base. Torlak was pleased. Then we'll strike there. Good work. The scanner bowed and returned to his station. He then turned to the strategist and issued his new commands. Contact De Logan and the rest of the fleet planet's side to attack these targets. He pointed at several large city centers that boasted many of the defenses that took down the first wave. This time, Keep them out of effective range and just maintain on drawing their fire, he ordered. Contact Bralo and notify him of our target. Yes, General, responded the strategist. Incoming transmission, Delta Band, Shield Base Gamma Inquiry, to Draxmill Mantisek Alavale from Shield Base Gamma Defense System. Urgent, enemy combatants attempting entry into the compound. Entry unauthorized, requesting immediate assistance. Defense system limited. Personnel status error. Current militia forces insufficient. Looping transmission. Request accepted. Data log of Celian contact. 2667. Captain Roy. Roy and his band of fellow militiamen stood at a standstill. The fighters that previously assault the station held the advantage, but when he and his men switched frequencies, they were able to mount organized resistance. He, like many others, was unaware of Delta Band. It wasn't a common band in the current age, but with some digging noticed all ships carried a form of it. It operated in a very short range, and found itself arbitrarily switching from the extremely low frequencies encrypted through radiation from stars. As a result of this, the connections through it can be made, but its effect grows the closer in proximity one is to another, capable of transmitting the band itself. Surprisingly, are many ships built from 2400 and later. Gotta hand it to those kids finding this out, Roy muttered to himself. The cannons from the large ship beside him rang out through the speakers of his ship with dramatic feedback. Another enemy fighter went down. When one perished, another took its place, and the eerie silhouettes of ships larger than their own plagued him. He noticed that fighters began backing off, and indicators showed that the enemy was advancing. With their jammers, he was stuck with limited radar, as the feedback proved to be inconsistent and the Delta band for ship-to-ship -ship communication. So, he took his chance. All ships, this is Captain Roy, head of Draxis Militia. Descend planet side to regroup and rearm, sending coordinates now. He ordered and led the way. Roy connected to a comms officer on the ground at his rendezvous. It was a worn-down military installation when the colony was first founded some ten-odd years ago and was largely abandoned by the Republic. However, that didn't stop the militia from taking control and making it their planet side HQ. He was initially locked on by base defenses, but they ceased when he came closer to the base. When he landed and departed his ship, 
he was met by a well-dressed man accompanied by several guards. Captain Roy? He exclaimed, what the hell is going on? We lost contact with Mantis Station and our communications on the ground are a mess. Roy held his hands up in a motion to try and calm the man before him. Just calm down first, he started. We were attacked and not by some pirates or mercs, something else entirely, he said, confusion visible on his peer's face. That's why I need you to send out a notice over Delta Band. The enemy is bound to enter that atmosphere any moment if we don't have time to lose, he commanded. When the young officer did budge, Roy commanded with a visceral scream, Move it, Lieutenant! This is a fucking order! The officer scrambled away with a guard in tow, and Roy ordered the rest of the guards to remain. Right now, we don't have much time, but an enemy is looking to assault the planet and it's our job to stop them, at whatever the cost. He ordered, You probably don't have handheld equipment that can transmit in Delta, so get some techs to rig the antenna to do that. We can tune our radios to hijack the signal. Get to it. The men did as he ordered, and commanded or notified their commanders of the changes. Within several minutes, Roy received reports of the successful implementation of the new frequency. City centers were notified of an attack, and all non-combat capable individuals were taken to bunkers. This time Roy stood around a table that projected a holographic display of not just the surrounding area, but also the planet. How are surface-to-space scans coming? He inquired. The band doesn't fare well in the atmosphere and the best we can get is the top of the stratosphere. That's as early as we're gonna get. One officer spoke. What about planetary defenses? What do we have available? Planet-wide defenses are slowly coming online. Once they're up, they should be able to retaliate without a wireless connection. Another reported. We've already got reports of enemy contact and defenses are reporting mass enemy casualties. They didn't know what hit them. Good, he started. We just have to be able to hold out until the fleet arrives. The officers surrounding the table looked at one another, and skepticism filled their faces. I mean no disrespect, but... One officer started. Do you count on that Star Runner to make it? He sighed. They have to. We've got no other choice. The others reluctantly agreed. For now, the best we can do is defend and keep an eye out for landing parties. I don't want any more surprises. Yes, sir. They collectively answered. The first wave left as fast as it came. It was just over a couple hours since their initial descent onto the planet and made arrangements to unify their communication within the enemy's jammer. Reports came in of landing parties out from the city center's influence and periodic strafing runs were conducted to try and destroy what emplacements they had. Some managed their mark. Reports also came in from militiamen on the ground encountering the enemy in gunfights. Roy commanded ships with surveillance tech to support the ground troops and relayed shoddy videos of their engagements. One such engagement took place in a dilapidated housing sector that was more flatland than actual homes. His men took up locations in buildings that have yet to crumble, and flashes of tracers filled the battlefield. The enemy returned in kind with red flashes that filled the air. Get me a report from the ground. What kind of tech are they carrying? He ordered, and an officer manning a series of monitors beckoned for the battlefield. Got a direct line from one of the troops, patching him through now. The call came through and sounds of gunfire filled the audio and the screen came online with choppy video. The operator managing the call did what he could smooth over the video. Sergeant Cooper, reporting. The trooper said, ducking from incoming fire, and pieces of a wall flew from the impacts. The trooper was fitted with a camouflage pattern that looked to be dated in the 23rd century. He wore a modern up-armored chest rig and his sleeves were rolled just up his forearm and wore a single hold balaclava and a worn ballistic helmet with an up-armored attachment on the frontal portion of the helmet. Sergeant, I need to know what kind of weaponry the enemy employs. The sergeant looked over the barricade and gave some orders to some of the troopers under him. Calls for the cover fire were heard and a litany of cracks from the friendly suppressive fire filled the scene before the sergeant turned his attention to the camera. Hostiles employ a mix of ballistic and energy. Shoots like a repeating laser. Few of their ground forces use it, so I think it's new, even for them. Good work. See if you can recover their tech of personnel. If you can't, don't leave one standing. Yes, sir. The sergeant responded before the call cut out. For now, defenses were holding, and small engagements occurred on the outskirt of the city centers. How are we looking for our spy satellites? I don't think they've hit them all, inquired Roy. We've been trying to get a stable connection using the Delta Band, but the signal can't get past the stratosphere. 
We'd need something to boost the signal, then we might be able to link whatever satellites we have, answered a comms officer. Do it, he ordered. Send the most stealth-capable ship we have to act as a booster. The young officers surrounding him got to work, and he turned his attention back to the hollow table. The battlefield casualties danced between forces with humanity losing ground while keeping in range of anti-air battery defenses. A call rang from the previous officer as he reported news on the booster. Great work, he said calmly, as the hollow table updated in real time. You've got to be kidding me, he mumbled. The display of the planet was in view, and as more satellites came online, more red indicators filled the space around the planet. Classifications were given to each indicator based on sizes, and were constantly updated with scans from select satellites. A wealth of corvettes, a multitude of frigates differing in size, a handful of cruisers, and four carriers. The rest of the scene was filled with fighters in formation in support of their ground troops. They were at the enemy's mercy, and Roy struggled to find a way around it. However, that changed when he was alerted to a notification from the comms officer. Sir, I have a message. It is automated, but it seems to be coming from Shield Base Gamma. Roy played it and analyzed the hollow table. He noticed a strange contingent breaking off from the main force and gathering in what was almost a seemingly deserted area. What kind of information does Gamma hold? He said urgently. The OWL program, military intelligence, tech, and location of Terra. The realization dawned on him. Get a strike team together. We can't let that base fall. I need a team yesterday. Aye, sir. The room responded in unison, and Captain Roy left the command center, toward his ship. Incoming transmission Delta Band, Shield Base Gamma Defense Inquiry. To Drax Mill. From Shield Base Game Defense System, Athena, request accepted. Reinforcements inbound. Updating IFF tags for authorization. Base authorization. Granted. 26 personnel. Sub-level authorization. Granted. 1 personnel. Defenses. Compromised. Threat level. Critical. Initiating Athene protocol. Final authorization required. Ending transmission. Data log of Cilian contact, 2667. Pilot J. Kurt. J. relaxed in his seat when his ship made the jump to slip space when he was beyond Veru near the outer edge of the system. However, his thoughts lingered on the station and the militia he left behind, his mind still a mess and incoherent. It was all still a fog to him. He entered the station, tried to meet with security, then... Boom. Did we not have enough time? I swore we had more than enough time. Jay thought to himself. He ran the scene in his head multiple times. They landed, he grabbed some food to go and rushed over to the Mantis security offices. The route from his ship to the security office was no more than ten minutes as he ran, twenty-five if you walked it. Jay? Cam called from behind. Are you good? He ignored him and shook his head. I... He choked. I thought we had more time. What do you mean? Jay, what's wrong? Cam pleaded for an answer. Jay gave in and reluctantly pressed the button to have his seat finally turn and face Cam. Cam was dirty, and the previously fried communications component sat at his desk, broken. Evidence pointed toward its manual repair, but nonetheless worried about Jay's state of mind. It's my fault, Cam, he uttered. I thought we had more than enough time, but security took their sweet time. Next thing I knew, the station was being blown to dust. Cam tried to comfort Jay, but he shoved away his advance, averting his eyes from him. He handed the data drive back to Cam, who secured it in a reinforced data slot beside his station. There were a series of racks filled with similar data drives, but Cam taped the side that was exposed and wrote on it the type of content that resided within it. Don't worry, Cam said in a low tone. Once we reach Alameda, I'm sure the Stellar Fleet will help those on Draxus. He returned to his desk and began to work on a damaged communications component sustained from their earlier encounter. Jay kept those words close and was the first to retire to his bunk, the most recent event now haunting him. Several hours passed, and Jay awoke from his stiff slumber and looked around the cabin. Cam was seen dozing off at his station as he did his best to stay awake, but with a tap of his shoulder silently made his way to his bunk. Jay returned to the cockpit, taking an undamaged burrito from the station prior from his pouch, and began to eat. He hated rations, and would rather opt for station food instead. The thought of the shop owner raced in his mind, souring the thought of the meal. He thus returned to his seat, and noted that the communication component that was previously at Cam's desk was no longer there. He peered at the rear of the ship, 
and noticed the panel it belonged to was shut and secure. He turned the chair around and began a series of ship diagnostics and searched for the communications tab and ran a test. Several moments passed by, and he was greeted by a pleasant ding. While he couldn't do long-range inter-system communications, he had the majority of capabilities for in-system communications. He looked back once again to Cam and silently thanked him for his hard work and kept it at that. Six hours had elapsed, and there were four hours left into their jump. Jay continued his silent contemplation into the swirling void before him. Again, hues of purple and blue dominated the view, with an electric display of white that caressed the edges of the two previous colors. He was entranced. He let his mind slip and finally succumbed to a second dose of sleep, this time only lightly. When Jay came to, he heard the tapping of keys behind him, and when he turned, Cam was away working at his station. Jay wanted to speak to him, but he couldn't. He instead turned his head forward and viewed the unending whirl of faster-than-light travel. He peeked at a timer that sat in the top left corner of the cockpit and designated that he had roughly 30 minutes until they would exit slip space. He analyzed the next system on his map that was generated in front of him, albeit a small form factor of the much larger ones on the bigger ships, and the light blue hue generated from the display lit up his portion of the ship. The system they were about to enter was called Altea. In terms of distance, it was farther to Draxus than Dima was by a few light years, and was a much larger population than all of Draxus, by about 200 million people. As one of the few stops on the edge of known Terran space, it had a great presence of a mix of militia and sleuth of private security. There was also a fleet liaison station present in the system that housed itself on one of the smaller mountainous moons of the central colony, Alta. The system was large, with several other planets beside Altea that could sustain life, albeit at a lower rate. It had a total of three planets close to the sun, that all were capable of life since their locations all shared the Goldilocks zone. In order, it went, Rayla, Altea, Altai. Beyond them were two insignificant planets, reduced to mining colonies, Fora and Flanning. It had in its possession an asteroid belt, but after years of vigorous mining had reduced it to a fraction of its original size since the system's founding. Then beyond that were three gas giants and their plentiful moons, Jerilia, Hori, and Flavin. Those gas giants and their moons operated as a training area for militia and security pilots, as well as a vast collection of research centers that belonged to many corporate entities, as well as some belonging to the Stellar Command. Their presence alone was his only hope, and the fact that they operated near the farthest planet, Flavin, which by the time they exited slipspace would be oriented closest to his exit point. As they left slipspace, Jay reached for several switches in a practiced motion and flipped them in a sequential order essential for operation. He tapped on the display that housed communications and input a sequence of numbers. After testing that it worked, he began broadcasting on a wide frequency on all bands. Emergency. This is Star Runner 4311, Pilot Jay Kurt, broadcasting to any military or authority vessel. We have news of an attack on Draxis from an unknown party. Over. With no immediate response, he felt that perhaps the short-range comms were still broken. He tried calling many more times before simply looping the message. He expanded his already limited range of frequency and proceeded to manually advance toward the closest fleet-affiliated outpost, still broadcasting his message. He spooled for a slipstream jump, and just before it was charged, his ship rocked, and his shields flickered before ultimately fading from existence. What happened? Jay yelled. I don't know, but we weren't locked. We don't have shields. Cam replied. Cam manipulated his screens and provided maximum power to the power core and diverted some of their thrust to shields to try to increase their regeneration. Jay instead began evasive maneuvers from an unseen enemy, but when shots flew wide from his rear, he reoriented his ship and began facing toward the shots, doing his best to make his ship unpredictable to lead. However, that tactic failed as his ship held no weapons. Whatever shields the ship regenerated, we depleted in the initial run. The ships flew past each other. Jay was able to glance at its silhouette. It was a slim-looking ship and larger than his own. It sported a dead green luster with a series of black markings on it. It was angular, with overt curves on the spine and bottom of the craft. The frame of the angles tapered toward the front, giving the overhead cross-section a look of an elongated trapezoid. 
He circled his ship in a reckless maneuver, and the two found themselves headlong towards each other, but Jay accelerated whatever he had left on his throttle to Max and sped away. In the time it took for the enemy craft to circle back and train his sights on Jay, he was already too far. At least that's what he thought. He looked at the radar and noticed that there was no signature, but his ship rocked once more with accurate shots of the enemy. With a ping on his radar, the signature of the enemy revealed it to be much closer than he believed. An alarm rang, and an indicator for a missile appeared on his visor. When it was close, he popped his flares and a series of thumps erupted from the ship and an explosion rang out from behind, the concussion still shaking his ship. He thought he was clear as he sped away, but in a split second, the icon for incoming missile flashed and his ship was hit. The ship spiraled out of control and Jay found himself fighting for control. When he did so, a fire erupted in the cabin and Cam tried to fight it. His once shattered helmet refitted with shoddy repairs atop his head. When vying for control, and still under ever-slowing acceleration, shots passed the ship wide and tracked toward his ship, and when the red projectiles vanished, the ship rocked once more, this time spelling the end of their acceleration. Now his ship was at the mercy of inertia. Jay looked for a solution, only to be met with grim failure, except for one. Jay resolved himself and sequenced for a timed scuttle of his ship, and a timer of three minutes appeared on one of the numerous cockpit displays, he removed himself from his seat and approached the firefighting Cam. Cam, we have to go, now! A look of worry and fear on his friend's face. The ship is time to blow. Grab the drive and prepare to jump. A moment of clarity came across Cam, and he scrambled to depart the drive for its slot. At first he struggled, because the mechanism for it was jammed. He grabbed one of his numerous tools to forcibly eject the drive, which was successful, and prepared his personal tank of oxygen, same as Jay. Jay opened the door and, with Cam behind him, jumped. The ship they left behind continued on, and they fell behind the concealment of debris and smoke before his ship ultimately detonated. The ship that once trailed them flew past them toward the remains of his ship and ultimately left upon the end of its investigation. When he thought they were safe, a pained scream erupted from Cam. When he turned, Cam's face was pained, and when Jay asked what was wrong, he pointed to his back. The canister for his oxygen was venting at a rapid pace, and so was part of his visor. Blood also erupted from the wound, and a piece of metal the size of his hand was lodged in his spine. Fear and worry overtook him. He looked desperately on his person and on Cam's for a solution, but found none that would help. As he continued looking, the weakened Cam put his hand on Jay, prompting him to stop. I'm sorry, he started weakly, using what oxygen he had left to issue a final request. I should have done... More, please, find Alexandria. Make sure she's safe. Cam's eyes lost their light, and his skin turned blue, then ultimately pale white. He felt a bump on his chest and noticed it was his friend's hand. In it was the drive, and a portable distress beacon attached. It was Cam's last act. Jay returned in kind and held him, noticing as he did so that his friend's eyes closed for an eternal slumber. Jay wanted to cry, one last time, but knew if he did so, all his oxygen would be wasted. Instead, he buckled down and held what little composure he had, drifting in the endless void of space. He drifted into space for several minutes when he noticed a glare in the corner of his visor. He turned, and what he thought to be his savior was the same ship that had chased them into the Altea system. Anger arose in him, but knew he could do nothing out here. The ship slowed and oriented itself so that the rear faced Jay. The rear was smooth, with a circular portion of the rear he thought to be the entrance. He wished he had a sidearm to empty into the first soul that opened those doors, but relinquished the thought. As it moved closer, the doors opened and two silhouettes appeared in black, a contrast to the white-gray interior and the light that reflected on its surfaces. They inched closer, preparing to retrieve him and most likely leave his friend to the mercy of the void, lost to time. They were no more than fifteen or so meters before the actions of his captors grew rancid and fearful. It looked like they wanted to expedite the process, and the ship began moving closure at a faster pace. However, their efforts ended as quickly as they started. A piercing light of blue found its way into the upper hull of their ship with a brilliant shatter of their shields with melted slag peering from its edges, followed by a burst of green flames. Another round found its mark, this time arcing its way from above Jay into the open compartment, 
rendering one being completely obliterated and the other without an arm. Of course, the round continued on and found its mark through the center of the ship. It jolted forward and clumsily moved away, erratically veering direction with an unintended course. Flames were already enveloping the ship, but a third shot found its mark true and the ship exploded in its failed getaway. Jay wanted to turn to meet his savior, but he was already running low on oxygen and his eyes began to feel heavy. However, his curiosity and his fear were alleviated when a ship sporting steel gray and navy blue came before him. Its rear ramp opened and the familial uniform of the navy appeared. Before they could bring him into the ship, his eyes closed, no longer able to keep their contact with his saviors. Incoming transmission. Distress beacon inquiry. To TRSC Sword of Reckoning Vice Admiral Wolf. From TRSC Maiden of Blue Commander Eau Claire. Good afternoon, sir. We received a distress beacon from the Altea system while on patrol near Oliver Research Station. It was unusual as most of our communications were down that we chopped up for repairs. Turns out the distress beacon we picked up was transmitting in Delta Band, and it was the only source to go by. The initial distress call reported news of an attack on Draxis by an unknown entity. Upon reaching the location of the source, it died. And we were left with a simple coordinate beacon, the ones used for personnel. We've secured the two, but one suffered fragment injuries and succumbed to his injuries before we found them. The sole survivor is a J. Kurt, and in his possession was a data drive labeled Dima Draxis Attack. We took the liberty of reviewing the contents, and they are evidence of an attack on the outer colonies, requesting mobilization of 7th Fleet. Documents are attached. Very respectfully, Commander Eau Claire. TRSC Maiden of Blue. Ending transmission. Sending attachments. Attachments sent. Data log of Celian contact, 2667, Vice Admiral Wolf, TRSC Sword of Reckoning. An aged man sat atop a chair that sufficiently overlooked a series of stations manned by a multitude of personnel that buzzed about with technical chatter. In the center was a table waist-high that took up the center of the moderately-sized bridge. The room was dark, and the dim lights of the monitors and select light fixtures illuminated the room as if battle-ready. There was a large monitor that sat in the rear of the room that Wolf faced, with several faces that shared the limited screen space. Each wore their respective branches' service uniform. If what you sent is true, then we have no choice but to go to their aid. Spoke to a woman in a gray and navy blue. She was the fleet admiral of the navy and was nearing the end of her tenure. Thank you, ma'am, Wolf replied. If their force is sufficient, then I would like access to units from the 4th ODR Battalion, requested Wolf. A man in black and silver spoke on the subject, his face aged and scarred, evidence of his time ground side, and a general of the orbital drop raiders. That authorization has been granted. I'm sending you the same unit that assisted in Alameda. Wolf nodded with affirmation. Thank you, sir. We haven't time to lose. If they've already attacked Draxis, then it's only a matter of time before they overtake the system. That's, the ma'am spoke, another item we wish to talk to you about. Wolf grew curious and prompted her to continue. It's about the facility on Draxis. The man in silver and black interjected, We have a compound planet side that's home to several top-secret projects. A star map collection of current and future colonies near and past Dima system, as well as a wealth of R&D technology. The ma'am acknowledged with a nod. There's a reason we didn't have a strong military presence near the system. It would have drawn unwanted attention from the colonial pirates, and our navy is stretched thin as it is. Don't we have more ships in production? If this is just the initial invasion fleet, they may outnumber us. Wolf's strategical aspect began to turn. But from what I have seen, their ships aren't any better than ours. Three well-placed shots of a size 6 rail cannon decimated a medium-sized ship that tried to capture the survivor. About that, another many spoke, this time one sporting green and dark brown. It was the general of the orbital guard. You said he was with another. What happened to him? As per the report generated from Commander Eau Claire, Cam Farron was struck with debris from their ship when they scuttled it and passed shortly after. They applied regenerative therapy and resuscitation, but he was too far gone, Wolf replied. As for Jay Kurt, 
He suffered minor trauma to the abdomen and the head, but he said it was before the scuttle. Crew quarrel? The general in green commented. Something of the like, Wolf answered. However, we gave him the option to return Planetside and ferry him home, but he adamantly refused, said we wanted to enlist immediately. And what did you tell him? said the madam. We sent over the application and he returned it the same day and chose the raiders. We'll see to it he gets properly trained, said the raider general. We'll have him join the local recruiter station on Altea. If he wants to be a raider, we'll see if he has what it takes, he said, and terminated his call. I'll notify all orbital guard stations to be on alert and I'll send out a notice to all system militias to be wary, he said before cutting out. This left only the ma'am and wolf. I should be going as well. I have a meeting with the Secretary General with this latest development. I rerouted the rest of the 7th to your sector and they should be there within the hour. She informed, All ships have been told the nature of this mission and are able and willing. They're eager to fight. That's good to hear. This will be the first combat engagement for many. I just hope they are prepared. They will be, Vice Admiral. Carry on with the plan of the day. The transmission was cut, leaving a blank screen. Commander Randall, the person in question stepped away from the hollow table where he and other officers analyzed likely targets for the enemy in the Draxis system. Yes, sir. As soon as all ships are accounted for, prepare a jump to Draxis. Ensure we are MCON Alpha upon exit. Expect our comms to get jammed. Aye, sir. Randall gave his orders and the crew followed them to the letter. All they had to do was wait for reinforcements. Wolf approached the hollow table to analyze the upcoming field when a simple holographic figure sporting only simple eyes and in the shape of a turquoise oval appeared. What can I do you for, Admiral? Lumi, the log from the Maiden of Blue, what can you tell me about their encounter? The ship they encountered and promptly obliterated was a jammer ship of the medium class, similar in size to the Ice Hawk medium fighter, she said in a jumpy tone. You mentioned it was a jammer ship. What were they jamming? Most forms of common communication, from low band radio to the lower band of gamma, she said with her avatar making a bouncing motion. What about the distress beacon with the star runner? I was informed it was transmitting in the delta band, inquire Wolf. It was, the AI replied. However, delta band is an ultra low frequency radio wave that can be encrypted on high frequency gamma rays. The transmission is possible with most ships, and but it's not actively inputted as a design choice, but a byproduct ingrained in the basis of ship technology. The founder was lost to time, but the basis for his designs have not. That's, uh, very informative, Lumi. Thank you, Wolf replied. Hard to find, hard to jam. And her form dissipated and the map of Draxus remained. Let's have a hunt. And he returned to his seat. The bustle of the bridge filled his view eagerness and rage apparent. Sensors picked up multiple ships exiting slipspace, totaling a fearsome expeditionary force. When the jumps were done, they were blessed with a bountiful amount of destroyers, patrol boats, corvettes, cruisers, frigates, and additional carriers. A report was generated on the total count. 45 patrol boats, 10 corvettes, 9 frigates, 5 destroyers, Four cruisers, two carriers, one assault carrier. It was practically a small invasion force in and of itself. The only time a fleet of this size was mobilized was during the Solomon advance at the height of territorial expansion some 400 years ago. A religious group that garnered an immense following and tried to wage a bloody war for the home system after they had seceded. This occasion would mark the second time against an enemy they knew nothing about except that they raised, killed, and took into slavery the survivors. As far as he was concerned, this was extermination, and humanity will respond in kind. Set up an all-call with all available ships, military frequency only. Wolf waited until he was given the go-ahead from a helmsman and grabbed his personal intercom transmitter, the wire tied to his chair. Attention all stellar fleet vessels, this is the TRSC Carrier Sword of Reckoning. He began, Right now we are being exterminated. Exterminated by an enemy with no warning or reason. They do their best to block our communications to be free from hearing our pleas. Saving themselves the trouble of knowing who or what they are fighting. He paused. Dima Colony was the first and now they currently assault Draxis. 
Were it not for a lone ship carrying the evidence of their advances, we would not have met them with the force we have now. The second largest in our history with an occasion to mark in all history books. Do your duty, and do so with the aggression bestowed upon you by the grace of your humanity. Resounding cries came not just from his bridge, but all across his ship and throughout his fleet. All vessels, prepare for slip space. He have his order, and all large vessels opened a sphere in front of them and proceeded through their respective portals. All current naval vessels had their slip space drives tuned to match their respective types and class. In the case of an attack group such as theirs, the largest ship would generate the slip space portal, and it allowed for the smaller ships to hitch a ride. In this case, like a school of fish, the ships were separated into predetermined attack groups and set their exit points at the most likely point of contact with the enemy. The largest attack group would launch an assault on Altea itself, while the second largest group would secure the research stations on the moons of Gala. A third group would act as a perimeter early warning system. When it was verified all ships had entered slip space, their portals closed as the last entered. It was noted to the Admiral that their collective journey would take only four hours of travel. Have the crew well rested before we exit. We need them all in the right mindset, Commander Randall ordered. Oh, I wouldn't worry about that, Randall, Wolf replied with a smirk. I'm sure my motivational speech has them all fired up. They're eager to do their duty. You're right about that, Randall commented. I was speaking with some of the pilots. They're ready, sir. We'll be hosting a briefing for the pilots in an hour. You should join us. I'm quite fine. I shall remain here. Shame. Randall with a sigh as he exited the bridge. Wolf took his seat and turned toward the rear monitor. Bring Lieutenant O'Brien online. Yes, sir, replied the comms officer. Exiting slip space in ten, announced the master helmsman. The crew jolted forward as their ship exited the space and before them was a small, verdant planet that was flush with vast forests and mountains. Get me sights on the enemy, and establish comms and get ready to launch the alert aircraft, commanded Randall. The intercoms on the launch bays sounded off, and alarms blared. Wolf observed the flight deck monitors and noticed all kinds of fighters spooling their engines and the personnel on the ground, ensuring they were fit for flight. Commander, we have enemy locations pinged near the planet. They have a light blockade spread out on the planet and a large concentration in the space above shield base Gamma, reported the intelligence officer. And we're still trying to contact the forces on the ground, still can't reach them. Understood. Once they're in MAC range, fire at the smaller ships first. Aye, sir, they replied, relaying the orders to other ships capable of firing a similar weapon. The MAC is a magnetic accelerator cannon that fires a projectile weighing several hundred tons a fraction of the speed of light. Depending on the model of the ship, the size of their cannons varied, and thus, so did their power. Nonetheless, when it connected to a vulnerable target, the effects were devastating. In range, sir. Fire! Their ship sat in the rear, but that didn't mean they couldn't view the spectacle that was tens of syncopated shots to devastating effect. Most of the ships that fired we already nearing the planet and already found themselves in the thermosphere. They met them at their level and the ships engaged in broadside fire, a tactic the enemy seemed ill-equipped to engage in. Their fighters launched alongside the patrol boats, which provided supporting fire with a wealth of missiles and point defense. Several enemy ships hastily departed, including their largest ship with a large detachment of escorts that gathered from the surrounding planet, leaving the ones over shield base to fend for themselves. Sir, picking up hundreds of signatures planet side, Underground. Randall looked at the relaxed wolf and returned his look to the officer. Friend of foe? Friendly, sir. We're also picking up chatter from the ground. Looks like we destroyed a jammer ship in the initial attack. Playing it now. This. Captain. Roy. The audio started before the signal gained clarity. I repeat. This is Captain Roy, head of Draxis Militia. Shield Base Gamma has enacted Athene Protocol. The base is overrun and final authorization requires stellar command official approval. They're sending everything they have. Wolf glared and the viewport and the battle unfold. They were quickly gaining space superiority, but in the atmosphere, the enemy was launching an all-out offensive on the base. It was only a matter of time before the base was overrun 
and the enemy broke into the area containing the most sensitive data the research station had to offer. Get O'Brien on the line now! Aye, aye, sir, the comms officer replied, and the screen to his rear lit up to life a man wearing black and gray armor stood before him, his helmet held at his waist, and his rifle slung around his chest that rested on the left side of his waist. He had a large scar on his left eye, and his armored helmet shared the likeness. A series of scratches in the shape of a smile with sharpened teeth were made on the thick visor. A gold-painted brand was present on his shoulder pauldrons, signifying his team's role. You're up. Give him hell and ensure no enemy leaves with the base intel. Done, he said gruffly, turning toward members that shared a similar style in personalized modifications to their armor. Except they all wore their helmets, and the scene shook some of the bridge crew, including Randall, while Wolf remained steadfast. Get in your pods and prepare for a hot drop. Eliminate with extreme prejudice. He ordered the group before the video cut off. The crew looked at one another, especially Randall. Is that legal, sir? He asked. Oh, the helmets? No, not by a long shot. Wolf replied with a slight cackle. Why don't they get issued new ones? The last time a superior officer tried to enforce O'Brien and his troop to regulation, well, it said he resigned and requested a transfer to the guard. He said with a laugh, I heard he's living it up in Alpha Centauri. Randall was at a loss for words, for the blatant disregard for regulation and the severe damage to government property. Maybe I should notify General Slaughter. He's the orbital raider in charge. He has to have some pull to deal with disobedience such as O'Brien. Do that, and no ship will safely harbor you, Wolf said with a hearty laugh. I guarantee that. He finalized with a wink. In any case, Wolf continued, let's see how his pack hunts. Incoming transmission. Draxis Defense Inquiry. To Drax Mill. Captain Roy, Jericho. From Athena, Shield Base Gamma. Incoming friendly reinforcement, attack force 1000, exo atmospheric entry, caution, open ground, danger close, high velocity friendly combatant, Athene protocol 99%, awaiting stellar command authorization, ETA, 2 minutes 35 seconds, authorized executor, 1st LT O'Brien, Kaler. Hold your ground, Captain. Reinforcements will tend to the enemy shortly. Ending transmission. Data log of Celian contact 2667. War Chief General Torlak. The forces surrounding the planet were engaged in a multitude of enemy encounters that ultimately ended in some form of a stalemate. However, now that most of the aerial were dug in within the cover of the numerous large ships, they began to rain fire in dug-in enemy locations and still operating anti-air emplacements. The attack was going well, and reports came in from some cargo ships that had just entered the system. Torlak received a hail from the leading ship of three. Their presence still didn't sit right with him, but he did so for his people's economy. It was the only way that he felt would keep the Galactic Union at bay. Ah, General, the pudgy Selian said, his face and body stretched and sagged from years of overindulgence. Kalorian Buma of the Porter's Guild is here and ready to retrieve the merchandise, General. I'm sending you some coordinates now. Torlak ordered one of the navigation specialists to deliver the location. These were in a location separate from the major defenses, so targeting them for subjugation was the more apt choice. The cargo is made up mostly of young offspring and their matriarchal parent, he commented. My, how gracious. We'll be on the ground shortly, the fattened pilot said before cutting his transmission. The hall would be light as he didn't have access to the bunkers in the city but saw that the fighters and supporting corvettes and frigates were quickly making work of the defense, allowing a plethora of ground troops to flood the city streets. The defense there was the heaviest, and with their depleting defense grid, troop advancement went nearly unmatched. Well, these beings certainly know their way around ground combat. They're on par, or just above average compared to our infantry forces. Torlak thought to himself, in any engagement where forces were of equal number, the enemy would almost always come out on top, utilizing odd tactics unknown to him. When any single Selian unit was entrenched, the enemy would fire upon them with utmost disregard for ammunition, while another smaller force would engage on the flanks, promptly neutralizing them. 
while amid chaos, they made order. There were more instances where unorthodox means of enemy tactics overwhelmed their opposition, leading to sometimes a decisive victory for the enemy. It was frustrating, but without an update to the training program, he opted that any force engaged in a toe-to-toe -to -toe firefight retreat until they were granted reinforcements. That's right, he simply opted to overwhelm the enemy with ground forces that Torlak had plenty of. Much of the fights after that returned to his favor, and the enemy forces were quickly diminishing. Soon, he would have the planet. He looked at the previous point of interest, a compound deep within the hills that was designated a prime location to nab data right from under their noses. Several thoughts came to him regarding his enemy. They had gone by two names, Terran and Human. Those were the official terms, but he refused to acknowledge them. To him, it would make them more sentient and less of a foe that needs to be put down. It wouldn't help recruitment if they found out the enemy was like us. Homes, families, civilized. So it was simple. Just label them the enemy and that they exist to take our borders and slaughter their sons, daughters, and wives. He found it kept their minds right. We need these worlds. The farther we are from the Union, the better. Truly a shame. He thought once more, reflecting on the orders given to him by the War Council. What is the status of our conquest? He ordered. We have control of 90% of the airspace, but the fighters are having a difficult time near the heart of the cities. We are picking up smaller signatures, but they fade as quickly as they appear. Beyond that, Chief General, our forces are steadily gaining ground, reported a simple crewman. Good. What about our forces near the gas giant? I was aware that there were some facilities present whose primary focus was research. Their signals are clear, but the stations are heavily defended with long-ranged anti-ship capabilities. They are, however, also steadily improving their ground. They are nearing complete control of one of the stations. That is pleasant to hear. There will be many accolades to go around once we return home, Torlak said in triumph. The crewmen beside him voiced his growing concern, as his original understanding was that they were going straight to their home world. There is much we do not know of the enemy. What we have seen today is a rough display of what looks to be conscripted forces. Look here. He tapped a button on his command podium, and an image appeared in the center of the bridge. It was an image of several of the enemy together. They are non-uniform, and wear bits and pieces of what I can only speculate to be from a complete set. Their gear is worn and battered, and so are many of their weapons. He directed attention to what seemed to be a leader. He wore a helmet whose design was nothing but foreign. A mask that covered his face, save for a portion that revealed the eyes, and a chest-mounted rig with two marks from one of their prototype plasma rifles, and his sleeves for what he thought to be a long-sleeved shirt rolled up the forearm. What purpose does it serve to wear such light clothing in combat? Torlak mentioned, bringing up another photo of their ground unit for a side-by-side -side comparison. Look, it makes sense for the infantry to be covered head to toe when in combat. The image was of a standard Selian soldier. He wore a thin brown colored bodysuit with padding on the knees and elbows. Contoured and rounded armor was placed on the chest, shoulders, thighs, and knees, which were all colored gray, all aspects that he was proud of for the infantry. This here, this makes sense, Torlak finished, out of breath from his rant. He didn't know he would get so heated from just comparing the two soldiers and the gear they wore. That's why I don't think what we are fighting are the true forces of our enemy he said, comparing the photos once more. Then I fear what their military can do, the previous crewman said, gaining acknowledgement from his peers. The general's rant didn't help when it seemingly supported or recognized that a normal human put up so much of a fight that they opted to just outnumber them. While the crew engaged in casual conversation, a call rang out for the general. General! It was Brollo. How goes the assault on the compound? It fares well, but they have dug in. They repelled the initial force and made their way, locking us out. I have a team trying to breach the doors, but I fear the enemy may be planning a counterattack. We are keeping an eye on sensors, and we'll notify you of any developments. He replied when a memory regarding the earlier report came to mind. That may very well be the case. We'll divert most resources your way. I need whatever is in that facility. 
Bralo bowed and cut the transmission. The resources diverted were corvettes and frigates that had completed their duty and escorted the cargo ships away. The skies over the compound were littered with layers of ships that stretched high into the lower atmosphere, his ship included. Minor reports still came in from the units in the cities, and their now singular corvette and frigate pair were now making their rounds through the homes and offices, occasionally engaging in urban warfare, something they were still not acquainted with. So their advance drastically slowed to a crawl. Be ready to pull out the troops in the city. Once we breach the compound, we'll have little time to evacuate them all, ensure none leave are left behind. Yes, General, replied the bridge crew. The redirected forces made their way to the perimeter of the compound when they received alarmed reports. The enemy had launched a counter-offensive, and many were held up down the road from the facility, trying to push through, which some did. The hollow map focused on the field and numerous indicators of the enemy flared in the surrounding area, and their fight began. While the facility existed within the heart of the surrounding mountains, there were plenty of plateaus and forests, starting at the base of the compound out into the wilderness. How did we not notice them? Torlak commanded. We don't know. They just popped up from nowhere. Send all available units. Ensure they do not breach our perimeter. The crew did as they ordered, and Torlak viewed the hollow map as it displayed the battle in real time. Vehicles on four wheels raced the roadway, and a gun on top fired into his forces. They caught them off guard, but they had previously placed mines all along the roadway. This deterred the quickly advancing enemy, and kept them from coming any closer. He noticed more signatures from the air, and they showed to be almost negligent. They were small troop transports that operated with primitive rotary blades slapped onto an engine. They approached from many of the blind spots, but as soon as they entered the central courtyard, they were targets for the mobile anti-air turrets. The initial clash was chaotic, but with the mix of weapon emplacements and their cover, Selian forces were fending off the new attackers. They tried to rush toward the main's doors that Bralo and his group, but they were repelled by a wall of bullets and plasma. Their sudden advance had worried Torlak for a moment, but when they were effectively suppressed, his worry subsided. He had more numbers and firepower compared to the enemy, and they were now on the backpedal, their forces slowly diminishing. General! A call rang out from the open line. We have gained access to the building, beginning our sweep. Hurry, we don't have long. I've got a terrible feeling, Torlak responded to the report. As they were close to eradicating the sudden attackers, alarms rang out and chaos overtook the bridge. The hollow display, now encompassing the planet, showed several ships disappearing and their signals ceased to transmit. He tried to look for the assailant when they came into view. He expanded the map and found the enemy on top of them, rapidly descending the atmosphere. He felt stupefied by the sudden development. Words choked in his throat. Of the ships that remained, they were met with their likeness beside them. He zoomed on one particular pair of combatants. It was a medium-sized frigate. Its top hull sloped towards the sides, and the underbelly was a loose frame of decentralized compartments that housed a small hangar and some cannons. While on top of the hull, they had a series of dual-barreled cannons big enough for a rubber kickball. There were a total of three sets, and they were placed on the spine of the ship with the bridge placed near the front of the ship. Their enemy was the opposite. The ship was black with white markings that had a rectangular frame for the bow of the ship with rectangular compartments extending on the sides of the bow. Lined on them was a series of cannons, each cannon sporting three large barrels with a total of five turrets on the top and bottom portion of the outcrop. The rear, by the engines, housed an armored hull that was angled both on top and bottom of the engines, and each angled toward the other farthest edge. An insignia was placed on the most exposed portions of the hull. It was that of a wreath, a bird of prey, and a star. Near the bow, Characters were painted on. It was scanned and promptly translated, TRSC Knight of Dread. A Knight of Dread? The translated words were given, but not their meaning. They could mean anything, whether it was subtle or overt. Like the fear of night, he thought. But he shoved those thoughts aside and focused on the battle before him. The Selian ships prioritized the engines, 
but their shots bounced off with a large deflection, eventually falling toward the planet. It was then that the wealth of a total of ten massive cannons fired that cracked the very air that surrounded them in a brilliant display of smoke and fire. The shots were bright, and from a distance, one's eye could easily track their intended destination, the entire broadside of a Selian frigate. He thought the shields would hold, but it was actively releasing aircraft, and for that, they would have to drop shields momentarily. That was the moment they attacked. The hangar, subcompartment of the engines, and their dorsal guns were destroyed, and fires erupted from the exposed compartments, and the enemy ship continued to fire. The result was a large ship crashing towards the ground, smoke and fire alight. This occurred to many Selian ships almost simultaneously. Fear overcame his composed figure. Get us out of here now, and get Commander Brallo on the communicator, he dictated. The ship fled with a handful of escorts, but they stayed behind to try and halt chasing enemies. He subsequently ordered a regroup of the forces around the planet. While some were able to answer the call, there were many engaged with the enemy. Troop transport ships made their route to the closest ships as the main fleet was departing, many ground units now stranded on an enemy planet. This is Bralo, the call came through. What is your situation? Do you have the information? Torlak questioned desperately. I have, Bralo said solemnly. I apologize, but I was unable to pry any further. I have already sent what I could over a secure line. It's not much, but think of it as my final act. Phacelia! Bralo, what? Have you not seen the skies? He said, prompting Torlak to view the compound one final time. The skies have been forsaken here, and soldiers in coffins of steel assault the earth, and masters of death assault my troops. What Bralo described was precisely what he and the bridge crew were witnessing as they quickly fled the planet. Hundreds of individualized pods in the shape of an aerodynamically machined metal tear were shot out from a multitude of enemy ships. A trail of white smoke trailed the metal tears, and some would change direction, as if they were alive. When they reached a certain speed, he saw metal flaps extend from the singular craft, and their descent would decrease drastically. It would detach when they slowed, and among the frantic soldiers of Celia, they crashed into the earth, and soldiers embodying death assaulted them with lead and hate-filled violence. This is... farewell. The visual and communication with Bralo vanished when the ship exited the planet, and the sequence to the inter-system gate was input into the ship's navigation computer. As soon as the engine was ready, the ship entered sublight speed toward their exit. When they arrived, Torlak inquired about the other ships in the system. No signal. The only ships still transmitting are the ones fighting on the planet, a solemn helmsman answered. Torlak retired to his seat in defeat. It was swift and meticulous, and what's worse, it was precise. As much despair it brought him, he had to give credit to the one who organized the assault. He recomposed himself and ordered the opening of the IS gate, and before they entered it, he received immediate notification from the comm specialist. Sir, we are receiving an audio message, source unknown, most likely from the enemy. It has been translated into Selian Common. Shall fine-tuning play it? Those words shook him. How did they access our network? Do it. The audio was filled with static, and then it cleared with some fine-tuning by the communications specialist. I do not know who you are, or where you come from. You have assaulted innocent lives of descendants of Terra. Killed them, made slaves of them. I know, but be warned. Your unprovoked attack will be met with hellfire and destruction. No one of your race shall be spared. Because an attack on the innocent is an attack on all of us. You have been warned. There was a momentary pause that grew deafeningly silent. Perhaps you should have tried diplomacy. The message was said with a chill. Torlak readied what was left of his group and departed the system. The bright lights of the gate closed as the final ship entered. All that was left was the void. Incoming transmission. Xeno Slipspace Inquiry. To Vice ADM, Wolf, TRSC, Sword of Reckoning. From CMDR Loretta, TRSC, Will o' the Wisp. This is Commander Loretta of the Stealth Class, Will o' the Wisp. As per your orders, we have identified what might be the Xeno Threat's main form of FTL travel. 
During their exit from the system, a single ship generated a portal large enough for the group to pass through. Their entry point generates a different type of space and looks to be fixed for the system. Readings indicate a lingering presence of differential slip space energy. More research needs to be done and access to an enemy ship is greatly suggested. From the looks of their escape, their technology does not allow access to slip space from just any way in the system. I suspect it to be a fixed portal entry. I say again, access to an enemy vessel is imperative. Respectfully, Commander Loretta, TRSC will owe the wisp. End of transmission. Celian contact. Shield base Gamma, 2667. Target of inquiry. Celian Commander Brallo. Hmm, they truly are dug in. Good work, Scout. The Scout in question silently bowed and returned to his brethren some feet away. Brallo eyed the compound that was his target designated by Chief General Torlak. He was a mighty tactician, but he felt he was getting on in years. The facility in question was built into a vast mountain range that allowed no such travel by foot, unless your goal was to scale the sheer cliffs that were the mountain itself. Luckily for him and his band, they surrounded the plateaus that extended from the mountain that overlooked a large depression that was filled with auxiliary buildings. There was a previous detachment of soldiers before he arrived, but upon his arrival, they were killed. As an urgent response, numerous warships of the fleet descended over the skies above. Emplacements were set up, and a staging area for ground troops littered the area. Most of the equipment used was older tech should the enemy get hold of it. For all he knew, his enemy favored kinetic weaponry and showed no signs to evolve it, unlike his people which were just now fielding prototype plasma weaponry. They were essential in their formations, so a couple per squad was equipped with the new weapon, offering a new type of advantage in battle. He scanned the main courtyard before the entrance to the facility, and it was barricaded with a shoddy put together of wood, crates, and vehicle. However, the courtyard to it was open, and so began a systematic raid of dropping troops into the courtyard. He ordered it to be slow to gauge their defenses, to which he received a report from one of the returning pilots. We've managed to get an idea of what we're working with. They've already breached the facility and their number is few. He reported, fighters destroyed the aircraft that transported them so they are stuck. We can strike now and I'm sure we'll find an opening. Brallo silently acknowledged the report and issued his next set of orders. Begin the assault. Ensure we have the main road covered and continually sweep the perimeter. Main force begin the advance. Brallo issued his orders, and thus the attack began. They cleared the poorly erected barrier to the facility's courtyard, and the enemy already began their defense. Shots were traded, and the dug-in enemy provided more trouble than he thought. But it was as he expected any siege to go, except this time it was only a handful of soldiers they were up against and their ammunition supply had to be in short supply. After several hours, his suspicion finally bore fruit, and a right flank opened up. A wealth of Celian fighters assaulted their right flank and swarmed the enemy. He initially expected them to go down quite easily, but the enemy combatant was fierce in his defense. The weapon he had was turned into a club, and he began using it against the first wave. He closed the distance quickly, and they were caught off guard spelling their gruesome defeat. Not trying to shoot their brethren in the back, they hesitated taking down the lone warrior on the right side. When his weapon was too bent to use, he quickly swapped it to a bladed armament. He has a knife, back up, shouted a group of soldiers near the lone fighter. When they were finally clear, he tried to lunge, but was met by a wealth of bullets and plasma fire. His fellow troopers advanced, and a line of the defenders was present to them. Some took notice and fired at the advancing group catching some, but the amount was too much. He ran out of ammo and with little cover, was subsequently neutralized. The right flank quickly fell and one by one the enemy fell. Soon the fighting ended, and now they were left with a set of sealed double doors. There were more on the last run when we came through, commented one of the soldiers. Must be dug in, replied another. Silence. Begin the breaching process. We do not have much time. The soldiers nodded and silently complied. It took some time before they could get the equipment, but they proceeded with haste. The doors were of medium height and stood about half a torso higher than Brallo himself. He was fairly tall and found himself taller than some of the enemies he had fought against. 
Now he waited, the breaching team moving quickly in their process. Perimeter teams, status update. Each gave a board all clear or nothing new or unusual. He was glad that was the case and hoped for it to remain as such. Another set of minutes flew by and the team was clear to finally open the doors. Using a moderate yield concussion device, a soldier placed it on the weak points of the breach and prepared to detonate it, prompting all within proximity to be clear. A loud crack enveloped the air, and a loud metallic clang could be heard, and the teams peered at the entry with caution. They entered when it was initially deemed clear, and they found themselves in a large reception hall. It extended high into the mountain with an open space in the center, and planes of glass lined the sides. Papers and electronic devices littered the floor and desks of the spaces above. Brollo ordered a small team to digitally collect and analyze all documents found and prepared to send them to the general. When it was deemed clear, the group relaxed and scoured more of the complex. Even after finding nothing more, he denied it and believed there to be another entry that led deeper into the complex. It was near the end of the main reception area down a long hallway that they found a series of doors, one leading deeper into the compound. Brollo gathered his warriors and set off toward the newly found door and made their way inside. What they entered was a large room that resembled a warehouse. There were crates littered about, and a glass door at the end that read, Entry to Sub-LVL. A personal translator read to him the meaning and designated that at their next target. The room was dimly lit, and they advanced further, when a flash from his left brightened near a crate with a sharp crack, a nearby soldier yelled in pain. His body limped from the lethal shot to his upper chest cavity, just above his protective plating. Chaos let loose and shots were exchanged on both sides. The shots from the plasma rifles lit up many parts of their end that provided an educated guess for a hail of fire into the silhouette. A cry rang out, and a thud followed. This continued for several minutes before shots from the enemy ceased. Brollo and his group advanced warily before noting that the six that fought here now perished and they were free to proceed. As they went for the door, a panel opened beside it, and a wall of text appeared on a blue-tinted monitor. For what purpose are you brought here? For information on your race, Brollo answered. Could that not have been exchanged in a friendly diplomatic manner? That is not my place to question my superiors. Now open up. There was a pause before it returned with a simple answer. No. Blow the door. I will not waste my time with insolence such as this. The team hurried the explosives and readily blew the door apart. With forceful access, the rest of his party descended into the depths of the complex until they reached a room with a series of casings and electronics. The room's temperature dropped greatly and the whirs of technology and blinking lights filled the dimly lit room. All right, begin sifting through the data. Now. Brollo left his soldiers and left for the reception hall. Chief Commander Brollo called one of the soldiers over the radio. We have what we could gather, but the data is actively being deleted on their system. Good. Compile the data before we send it to the general. Muffled booms we heard from the outside, but we waited for confirmation from the soldier he had left behind with the others. Yes, Commander. A yell came over the comms, and cracks of fire were heard. Commander. The enemy. They were hiding. A blood-curdling cry came from the caller and another series of rapid-fire came from the soldier. He ran towards their last no position, and when he entered, the once serene hum of the chilled room was now nothing but broken tech, and bodies of his fellows mixed with the enemy. He readied his weapon and scoured the room, every inch. That was until he made his way to a hidden corner of the room. What he originally thought was a mirror was now a transparent plane of glass. Beyond it, he found a severely wounded enemy. A path of blood led from where he stood to where the enemy sat now, his back resting on a glowing podium. Anger roused from Brollo and he fired into the glass, but was promptly deflected. His plasma round melted a small portion of the glass, but it looked like it actively froze over when he went to cool his weapon from overheating. A low laugh grumbled from the injured being. You're not going to break it with that, bud. He coughed and blood stained more of his torn body. You... Brallo thrashed at the reinforced glass to no avail. What did you come here for? Intel? Where do we live? Where to strike next? The bloodied combatant choked. Well, congrats, you got it. 
Now get the fuck out of here before this place blows, he said, and a timer visualized on the glass. Zero hours, four minutes, and fifty-nine seconds. If what he said was true, then he had no time. As frustrated as he was at the shame of losing his, he couldn't risk it to self-destruct. He ran toward his fallen comrades and picked up the transmitter with the data and made his way toward the entrance. The closer he got, the sounds of war raged on compared to the relative silence when they assaulted the compound. When he stepped into the courtyard, he saw it. Many of his ships fell to earth in fire and smoke. As he gazed upon the sky, he received a call from the general. He was inquiring about the status of the data he had retrieved. As he called, he noticed metal pods from ships he did not recognize rain down and land among his frantic comrades. Some were crushed and others were too far gone from their mind and fell to the brutal efficiency of the enemy. I apologize, but I was unable to pry any further. I have already sent what I could over a secure line. It may not be much, but think of it as my final act. For Celia. The general tried to interrupt, but he continued. Have you not seen the skies? He said, prompting the general to view the compound one final time. The skies have been forsaken here, and soldiers in coffins of steel assault the earth, and masters of death assault my troops. Before he could retort, he gave a farewell and cut the call. He sent the data before he could be captured, and made his way to a brethren who fought in the Depression with the previously mentioned auxiliary buildings. This was their last stand. He began firing towards the ever-encroaching enemy, all who donned black and gray. Many had on their shoulders white markings led by those with red. This time around, as they fired, their shots did little. They either missed or, when they landed, only knocked them on their rear only for them to get back up. They were encircled, and his soldiers fell one by one, until only he remained. What he thought to be a quick death was instead met with silence. He looked around, and the soldiers that he fought were all trained on him in a half-circle now realizing his back was to the concrete wall that separated him from the inner courtyard. Brallo checked his weapon and found it to be empty. He tossed aside his rifle and prepared his fists, hoping for an honorable beatdown and televised execution. But that didn't come. They all stood watching, and a single man approached from the group. His armor was worn much more than the others, and he wore gold on his pauldrons. He had scar-like damage that ran down the left side of his helmet, and rows of smiling, sharpened teeth scratched onto his helmet with pair of sinister eyes where a predator would have them. Instead of facing him in what he hoped was an honorable bout of fists was anything but. The man before him pulled a sidearm and consecutively fired two shots into his chest. Brollo collapsed, his breathing ragged and his vision rapidly fading. He looked for the man who shot him and found him standing over him. His translator picked up what it could in his fading consciousness. Well, 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 he said. Quite a shame. If it were up to me, you'd be dead. He pressed the sidearm against his head. But we just might need information from you. He pressed his free hand against his helmet and spoke something indecipherable before returning his attention to Brollo. Turns out you already did that for us, the man said, laughter apparent beneath his demon-like veil. A shot rang out and Brollo's consciousness was forever obscured in darkness. Incoming transmission. Reporting, Shield Base Gamma. 2. Vice Admiral Wolf, First Lieutenant O'Brien. FR, 47H3N4. Report. Athene Protocol deployed. Status. Success. Full authorization required. Accepted. Initiating OWL Program Defense Protocol. Success. Initiating OWL Program. Hunter Protocol. Success. Targets identified. 104,597. Beginning Hunter Protocol. Athene Protocol. Initiated and deployed. Connection established. Beginning Data Siphoning Protocol. Initiating Shadow Protocol. Masking complete. Good evening, gentlemen. It is my pleasure to meet your acquaintance. You may call me Athena. Transmission end. Data log of Celian contact. 2667 4th Orbital Drop Raider Battalion, Raptor Company, 1st Lieutenant O'Brien. O'Brien sat in a large room designed for pre-deployment briefings. He, like many others in his vicinity, was wearing the current generation of orbital raider gear. 
It came with a full-face helmet that could be vacuumed and sealed with a curved visor blackish-purple hue that offered little reflectivity. It came with a multitude of functions to aid one in combat with a compass overhead that gives a numerical degree and direction with the poles of any given planet. His armor consisted of a chest rig fastened to an underlying set of harnesses atop a set of the Raider battle dress uniform that was connected to a set of greaves and low-profile up-armored pauldrons and gauntlets. A matte gold mark was painted on the bottom portion of his pauldrons, and this design ran a similar mark on his greaves. However, his helmet was personally marked with deliberate carves into the visor that created a jagged set of teeth with a set of eyes where his own would be but fashioned in a predatory manner. This was accompanied by a hollowed mark that ran down the armored portion of his helmet where his left eye would be. When faced with it, one would think that they were faced with a demon trying to mimic a wolf. This room was linked together with the same layout, each having a set of benches and weapon lockers with a central tactical hollow display table. Off to one side were a set of vacuum-sealed doors with reinforced glass embedded into the central part of the door. Beyond that was a series of open pods that faced the catwalk with the end behind met with another door that led into another part of the ship. On the hollow table was a display of their target. It was a rough image of the terrain with the compound itself embedded in the mountain. A smaller closed-off courtyard stood between the complex and the open grounds that housed a series of auxiliary buildings, most likely for clerical and groundskeeping purposes. The area was large, and a group of three similarly armored soldiers was huddled around the table. The only difference with their armor was the marking on their shoulders, which was red, and the designs they made on their visors. Look here, they already have a set of anti-air batteries on the plateaus. One individual said sporting a red mark that ran down the center of his chest with another pair flanking the central stripe. The letter Darien were printed on a space at the top of the cuirass. I know what you mean, Darien. I can take the larger plateau and you take the smaller one. A female spoke. This time the red markings on her chest were like fangs that protruded from the outer shoulder toward the center. The nameplate marked her as Strega. The final individual besides the table was a large fellow, sporting all the gear except for his gauntlets. His utility uniform was rolled up to just past his elbows with a set of gloves reinforced at the knuckles. His pauldrons were larger than the rest of the group. His helmet, too, was given more armor except the design was contoured to the helmet and acted as a second layer of skin to the helmet but was fastened like strips on the helmet. His chest marking was that of a sharply designed skull that resembled a demon rather than a human. The doors to the catwalk were sealed. While Strega and Darian talked strategy, he just sat quietly beside the table. Strega turned to him and spoke. What do you say, Gray? He lifted his hand and pointed to the center of the depression. Gotta hit him where it hurts. More fun that way, he said with a light shrug and returned to his seat. Well, I think that a swell plan, I Gray, Darian commented with a snide remark to which Gray paid it no mind. O'Brien approached the group to comment on the topic when the nearby monitor came to life. At the first sign of a secure connection, the three donned their helmets, the scars emanating fear. Only O'Brien was the one with his helmet off, held to his right side and his rifle slung to his left. The face that appeared what the officer leading this charge, Vice Admiral Wolf. You're up. Give him hell and ensure no enemy leaves with the base intel. Done, O'Brien said gruffly, turning toward members that shared a similar style and personalized modifications to their armor. Get in your pods and prepare for a hot drop. Eliminate with extreme prejudice. He ordered an alarm set accompanied by flashing red lights. The rooms situated beside the pods were littered with soldiers standing by, but now they were in a full combat mindset. They grabbed their designated weapons and ensured their magazine pouches were all filled. With their gear check finalized in mere seconds, they entered their pods and awaited a countdown, and a red light indicated that they were not going to open unless the entire sequence was aborted. The deck below the pod opened and light from the planet filtered through, illuminating the previously dimly lit room and catwalk. O'Brien was visible on a monitor that was transmitted to his company's drop pods and issued his orders. Heads up. Contacts in the AO are hostile, and your HUD has been updated with IFF signatures. We've got local militia hitting them at the perimeter. He said, 
his voice raised to compensate for the sudden increase in background noise. Let's show them how the raptors hunt. A collective oorah was sounded off from the raiders and a single tone beeped its countdown until a drawn-out beep played and the drop indicator was green. The pods dropped in waves and his heat was the last. The pods expelled propellant for the initial drop and O'Brien felt his stomach rise inside him. A feeling he was all too familiar with but rather enjoyed it. He ensured his weapon was fastened in a designated spot beside him during the descent. O'Brien and his company were aboard the TRSC arm of Saul, an assault carrier retrofitted for operations involving large-scale orbital drops. Otherwise, many in his company would be separated across multiple ships that had drop pod capability, which was mostly heavy frigates and above. As they descended, the view from his pod showed a naval battle that unfolded with a quickly declining enemy force. Several ships of the heavy frigate class were able to finally unload their guns into the defenseless ships. The scene was the same all around, and the cracks and booms of cannons filled the very air they fell through, and it only grew the more they descended past the titans locked in combat. The most casualties were of the smaller ships, like the gunboats and corvettes. Pieces of both the Republic and the enemy floated in through the atmosphere, many making a descent into the earth below. Indicators blared, and he was forced to make a course correction with a quick burst of propellant until the alerts cleared and his drop point returned to normal. He now had less than five minutes left before he touched down. He had just entered the lower part of the atmosphere and the heat of friction dissipated, and his pod was now in freefall. The descent gauge was decreasing dramatically until they broke through the upper layer when they finally reached terminal velocity. Hundreds of pods descended together, hell-bent on engaging the enemy. When their pods entered less than 3,000 meters, their metallic drogue chutes opened increasing their descent further until their pod was close enough to the ground for their braking rockets to engage. With a crash, hundreds of pods landed on top of the enemy. Many were crushed, and their comrades shook in their boots. The door blew open with a series of explosive bolt charges, and O'Brien's door flew into the nearest enemy, splattering him and any behind him as the door continued unimpeded for a couple of bodies. He readied his rifle and began firing into the enemy crowd in their stupor. His fellow raiders joined in the fight, and an unrelenting wave of bullets found their marks. The enemies that had it in them to fire back did so, but ended up hitting their friendlies, with the raiders catching shrapnel. They aggressively pressed on using much of the environment for cover and oversaturating the enemy with fragmentation grenades. O'Brien landed on the left side of the depression, and he and his raiders moved toward the center, neutralizing the enemy with lethal proficiency. The battle raged for no more than a few minutes before his soldiers routed the enemy to only a few. They were encircled, and the surviving enemy soldiers were shot one by one until only one was left. Firing halted when the combatant tossed his rifle and raised his hands in a warrior's stance. Sir, what do we do with him? A soldier with white markings inquired. Guess we'll take him alive, he said and slung his rifle to draw his sidearm. He speculated that the enemy wanted a warrior's death. He didn't know how capable this one was in combat. His size was larger than those below him, and he looked like he could fight. But O'Brien wasn't going to let him have his way. I'll incapacitate him, he said, then firing two shots into the chest of the fighter purposely avoiding what he assumed to be non-vital areas. It went down, its chest still rising. O'Brien knelt beside the downed enemy and summarily called for one of the medics to gather him. At that time, O'Brien spoke to him, knowing he probably didn't understand him. Well, 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 he said. Quite a shame. If it were up to me, you'd be dead. He pressed the sidearm against his head. But we just might need information from you. He pulled the weapon away from its head when he received a call over his command network. O'Brien, there's no need to take prisoners. Athene protocol was initiated, and we received confirmation of its deployment. Execute all survivors. Yes, sir, he said with no hesitation, and fire a shot into the already felled enemy. Its body jolted momentarily and its breathing ceased, green fluid now present on his armor and underlying battle dress uniform. Great. Pretty sure this is gonna stain, he said, regaining his stance, the medics curious about the execution. Sir, weren't we going to bring it in? We could have learned a lot, one of the corpsmen stated. 
O'Brien shook his head to the sides. Orders came from the Admiral. There was no need to bring them in alive, he said, trying to remove what he could of the brain matter that plagued parts of his greaves and gauntlets. O'Brien gathered his squad leaders and issued prompt cleanup of any stragglers and brought with him the Grey, Strega, and Darien into the compound. Tell me again why we have a stellar fleet research facility out here with no protection, Darien commented, to which Strega replied. The way I heard it, it was to keep it as hidden as possible. Can't do that with a navy right above it now, can we? And? It looked like they were throwing everything they had at this place. We still got guys fighting out there. Darien aggressively inquired. What do you think, Gray? His weapon at the ready, he replied. I don't know, I don't like this place. Seems eerie. The four advanced, their weapons in alert, and proceeded to the waypoint generated on their HUD that led to the rear of the reception hall into a long hallway to the back left. When they entered the dimly lit room, they activated a night enhancement feature, and they were able to see as clearly as day. Several of the bodies closest to them were of the enemy, while those by the door were part of the local militia. He knelt by the one closest to the door and pulled the tags from his neck. Sergeant Cooper, 8231145478, A.B. Neg. The rest of his team gathered the fallen militiamen's tags, while the tags near the entrance were gathered by the external teams before they entered the complex. They descended to the sublevel and found a series of rooms and a long hallway. They went through each room methodically and the muffled thuds of their boots filled the area. They cleared what rooms they could until they made it to the room at the end. It was a server room that looked like it was blown to hell. A wealth of both militia and aliens littered the room, and the occasional spark from the machines popped at intermittent intervals. The three gathered the dog tags from the militia in the room, and O'Brien made his way further back of the room. There he met a plane of glass with what looked to be melded plasma burns. Beyond it, he saw a man slumped over with his back to the podium. His body faced the glass, and he saw no signs of life in him. A panel of black glass revealed itself to his left from the wall, and he placed his hands on it. The words, access granted, were displayed on the device, and the glass wall opened with a hiss. O'Brien approached the body, and his tags revealed him to be Captain Roy. Call a recovery team. We have casualties in the compound. He spoke into his comm set. As he was about to leave, a voice called out from behind him. Good afternoon, Lieutenant, the voice said in a soft tone that equally demanded attention. He turned to find a person donned with flowing robes beneath an ornately decorated breastplate and a similarly decorated helmet with a plume. You may call me Athena, she gave a curt bow. What are you? He said. You don't look like our regular AI. The AI the Navy utilizes is a rather inferior form of artificial intelligence, more like a digital manifestation of information and calculation. Hardly do they ever think for themselves. So what is it about this facility? I've been told that I am required to a full authorization request. Why couldn't the captain here do it? O'Brien questioned. My protocol dictates that only my approved handler is allowed to give full authorization for all programs I possess. What programs are those? He inquired while messaging the Admiral. Most notably, the OWL program. She replied. He raised an eyebrow. What kind of program is that? He asked, his team now by his side. I am sending the details now, but to summarize, it is an autonomous subroutine linked to a mechanical chassis for all sorts of purposes, from search and rescue to search and destroy. So, drones, he commented. I would prefer you not call them that. That term is below them. She shot O'Brien a glare. He sighed. Can you locate the survivors of this bunker? Unfortunately, they have perished in a cave-in. I can, however, assist with the civilian bunkers as well as termination or capture of the enemy forces. She said, regaining her calm demeanor. Do that. Scour the planet for the civilians and terminate all surviving hostiles. I'm sure you can differentiate between our biosignatures. She gave a bow. And another item, Lieutenant. I am required to inform you of my latest protocol. What might that be? He inquired. I do find that it would be best if we speak of this with the Vice Admiral.
she said with stern conviction. Very well, he said with a pause. Do you have something I can carry you in? She pointed beside her, and there was a handheld device with an opening that had yet to be filled. I can transfer onto a personalized data chip and insert it into this device for ease of use and temporary storage until we can find a more suitable method of storage. O'Brien did as she suggested and pulled her chip out from the podium and placed her in the device that was ready for her. It was small and in the shape of a hexagon, with a slight depress in the center with hollow display glass. He held it up, and her form appeared much smaller this time. He acknowledged the new device and put it away in one of his thigh-mounted storage packs. It was big enough for the device and had been barely utilized, and he closed it. It came with a wireless link, and she was able to communicate with the squad. Upon departing the compound, the fighting had come to a complete stop, and now the soldiers, both Raider and the militia from the perimeter, were clearing the bodies. He signaled for a ride for himself, and any wounded and a medium-sized ship landed after some time. Its rear ramp lowered and revealed several Navy personnel sporting white and turquoise, assisting the wounded. The compartment was sized for two small or one medium land base vehicle, and beyond that was the troop compartment behind a set of wide doors. The two side doors remained closed, and a gun attached to a swivel rested against the wall in a secured fashion. He entered the troop compartment and relinquished his weapon on a rack and took a seat. It took a moment before they got off the ground, but when they were, O'Brien closed his eyes for the ride. It wasn't long until he was on the carrier that Vice Admiral Wolf commanded from. When they landed, he promptly exited the vehicle and made his way to the bridge, ignoring the stares he garnered from the crew. After several minutes of fast-paced walking, he finally made his way to the bridge, where Vice Admiral Wolf and Commander Randall were present. Good, you're here, spoke Wolf. Let's make our way to a more secure area. He nodded, and the three made their way to Wolf's quarters. Wolf sat down, as did Randall, while O'Brien remained standing, refusing to seat himself. I'll be fine, sir, he said, and presented the device to the eager officers. Gentlemen, meet Athena. Incoming transmission, subroutine Athene report. Accessing archives. Data successfully passed. Incoming data intercepted. Data successfully manipulated. Records falsified. Data flow normalized. Beginning siphon drill routine. Time to completion, 1 hour 56 minutes and 43 seconds. Coordinates logged. Generating coordinate map. Initialize masking routine. Complete. Masking routine. Stable. Connection established. Recording data flow. Recipient. Athena. Data sending. Data log of Celian contact 2667. Chief General Torlak. Torlak took what remained of his fleet and hastily fled the system formerly known as Draxus. His fleet was now no more than a handful of ships. The remaining ships could barely be used to defend a simple refueling station. They were battered and low on ammunition stores, their shield generators took a beating, and the power they generated was being used for other services such as life support and engine power. Those that survived the onslaught had craters in their hulls, and some had entire sections of their outer hulls missing. Torlak was distraught at the sight before him, and his fleet continued on past Demira and Anmira, the two sister planets they invaded first of this new species. Set a course for Lassus, he ordered, and returned to his quarters. The fleet was still on alert, but the further they fled, their unease subsided. He met with a computer technician on his way, and inquired about the status of the data they had received from Bralo. Yes, Chief. The technician spoke nervously. We are currently diving through the data as we speak, but I must say, we are having a difficult time translating the data. What have you gathered so far? We have found what looks to be star coordinates. Our team is currently comparing them to our database, and then we may be able to find more targets for our fleets to attack. That is good work, uh, Alan. Yes, he replied with a slight fluster. Alan, that is good work on your team's part. I expect great things from this. Yes, Chief, Alan replied happily. We just need to connect it to our database for a complete comparison. Is there any other data you've found? He asked, urging to change the subject. 
We have learned what they call themselves in some of their history, but the rest is still being downloaded. Very well, Torlak replied. Continued with your work. Allen gave a bow and continued on his way. Torlak, on the other hand, continued on toward his room where he was met with a large bed and the finest covers the fleet could afford. He refreshed himself and readied himself for bed. It was a long and drawn-out engagement. He almost forgot what his bed felt like. Before he knew it, he was taken into slumber the moment his head touched the pillow. Several days followed and when he made his way to the bridge, he was met with a new yet familiar system, Lassus. This system was five jumps away from the system that was home to Demira and Anmira. He didn't know the name of the colony because it was so recently founded. But after sifting through some of the data found on Draxus, it was named Dima, and that's what he suggested they call it. Aside from Dima, there was not much data beyond the Draxus system for their coordinates log. He thought the technicians would have more than the two systems uploaded by now. But their reasoning was that their systems were too slow and that it needed to take time. They had already connected to their central navigation archives to map the coordinates, so it wasn't clear to him why it was taking so long. He let it go, but ordered that they report any new findings within the data. Returning to the hollow map in the center of the bridge was the Lassus system. It is a binary star system home to a series of four gas giants and a lone rocky planet in between the four. The planets orbited a fair distance from their stars, and the two closest gas giants were orbited by many moons. The lone rocky planet, Lassu, followed them. It had no moon, and the planet was nothing more than a husk, but was home to a large fuel refinery depot that orbited it, and a large population of depot workers, totaling around 50 million. The final two gas giants orbited beyond Lassu, and they had a brilliant display of rings. This was one of the largest forms of resources for materials, while the gas giants operated as an abundant source for their fuel refinery. Torlak ordered the ships down to Lassu after speaking to their flight control. They were granted access, and all ships were able to find a docking port for their respective sizes. When all ships were docked, Torlak granted them time off for the duration of their stay, as he also ordered ship repairs. It wasn't his money he was spending, but that of the military. Surely they would understand the need to repair somewhat still serviceable ships. Torlak needed a break, and he already passed some sizable fleets at some of the previous systems, so he felt relative ease here on Lassu. He silently walked about the station and was greeted by all the citizens of the station. His title was evident on a cloth he wore around his neck, and the markings stitched on the sleeves of his uniform. It was a red cloth with a gold-embroidered star and the planet of Celia with the landmasses depicted on it, and on his sleeves four red chevrons that contrasted the white and gold of his outfit. It wasn't long before he arrived at a fancy-looking restaurant with a multitude of naval servicemen mingling outside the establishment. Many looked ragged as they spoke, and their facial features sagged from what he can only suspect was from stress. He walked towards the entrance and met the gaze of one of the junior war chiefs, a title appointed to those who pilot many of their fighters. Ah, General, what are you doing here? One of the young ones asked. Seeking some good food with this much-needed break. How are you all faring? He asked the group. General, be honest. What do you make of the enemy? We weren't on the ground, so we don't know what they're truly like. Another pilot asked. Torlak pondered the inquiry. I can't divulge too much, but what I can offer is that perhaps we should have greeted them on friendly terms. He said in a remorseful tone, they have something to fight for, but so do we. I only hope the War Council will see that. The group of pilots nodded, knowing that their enemy had something to fight for and are willing to die for it. The only question that came to mind was, how far are they willing to go to retaliate? He bid the group farewell and proceeded into the establishment. The furnishings were of higher class relative to the rest of the station. It wasn't high by Selian home standards, but it was very much so here. He was soon escorted by a waiter that brought him to one of the rooms in the back that were reserved for the highest ranking officials. He was met by several chief commanders and captains of the various vessels of his battle group. 
and they welcomed him to sit. Among the group was the recently promoted Chief Captain Dalagon, someone whom he thought perished on Draxus and was consuming himself with a drink. I remember you, Dalagon, correct? The teary-eyed Selian in question lifted his head from the table and met the general's gaze. His eyes shot wide and tried to stand to meet him, but he was asked to sit back down. General, what bring you here? His eyes were still swollen from tears and the stiff drink he had before him. I found it fitting to at least take some time off, especially what we all went through some time ago, Torlak said, trying to ease the tension. Many of the commanders and captains nodded in agreement. Some already had their food and took small bites of it, as if their appetite had gone elsewhere. It was just a mix of meat and vegetables on the side. He took his seat and ordered a small but refined meal when one of the commanders spoke aloud. To think our vessels were bested by such a savage race. His eyes were red, and the stench of fermented grains filled the room. That's right, that's right, another supported. What even were those weapons? They destroyed my brother's ship like it was nothing but wood and adhesives. What do you think of them, General? What would you call them? His voice was obnoxious. Clearly the room was deep in the inebriating substance. He looked at the bottle they all shared, Philo's finest, a drink of fermented grains and processed to nothing short of lethal for the average Selian. Ah, no wonder, he thought before addressing their concerns. They call themselves Terrans. What kind of name is Terran anyway? One of the captains asked. A name we gathered from the data chief commander Brallo bravely delivered to us before we fled the system. The group grew quiet at the mention of the commander. He was widely regarded as the best ground tactician the Selian military had produced. Even in his darkest hour, he was noble. He was an honorable man who fended off the legendary Runian attack force, a group that's so vile and savage that it would take a god to smite them. But all it took was Brallo a commander said, raising his cup to which the others followed, including Torlak. To Brallo for Celia. They continued late into the night reminiscing fallen comrades and tales of old passed down to them until closing. They were escorted by fellow war chiefs to their respective destinations, leaving only Dalagon and Torlak. Where is your ship, Dalagon? He only pointed in a vague direction and Torlak supported him until he met a crewman who recognized his captain. Let me take him, General. Torlak did as he said and passed off Dalagon, not until the person in question turned to face Torlak, his eyes filled with momentary clarity. Tell me, General, what happened to the group by the gas giant? What happened to Namu? Tears swelled up again on the corners of his eyes, still staring deep into Torlak. He... his group is suspected to have perished. I'm sorry. Dalagon held back his tears and he was finally led away by the crewman. The sounds of his cries grew faint the further they departed. Torlak knew of the two, albeit briefly. He knew Dalagon and Namu to be close, like brothers. But during the attack on Draxus, Namu was designated to attack the research stations by the gas giant, only for it to be more heavily defended than he originally believed. Dalagon was part of the attack on the compound, and they were one of the few that were able to flee the sudden assault from the enemy. The only other ships that were able to rendezvous with them were the singular ships that were staged away from the complex. As they left, he remembered they were informed that the group by the gas giant had perished and their signals ceased transmitting. That meant only one thing and believed that he had met his end, hoping that he took out as much of the enemy as he could. It's all he would want for a warrior of his grade. Torlak returned to his ship, spending the days it took to repair in leisure. By the time their ships were ready, several weeks had passed. He communicated with the nearby sectors for enemy movement, but found nothing unusual. The enemy had yet to retaliate. He wished to urgently return home and bring news of the data they had obtained. Navigator, he ordered, plot a course for Sela. It is time I meet with the War Council. Of course, General. Their ship traveled to the edge of the system, and a large circular metal structure floated in the void. As they approached, they were hailed by the station that was attached to the structure. Halt your advance. This gate is an entry into core cell in space. State your name, ship, and reason for travel. Chief General Torlak of the Father's Prime Fighter Carrier, I am required to meet with the War Council. 
There was a pause. Access granted. Welcome back, General. You'll have approximately eight systems to go before you reach Cellar. Thank you, Torlak replied. The large structure, as ancient as it looked, lit up and a fissure in space materialized, and the circumference of the portal extended to the inner edges of the structure. The diameter was approximately 16 kilometers. For a gate on the outer edges of Selian core space, it was one of the larger ones. When the portal stabilized, his ship, along with the rest of his group, followed through the vibrant portal back into the space that gave them the greatest comfort. Incoming transmission, subroutine Athene, report, non-sensitive data released, original coordinates deleted, falsified records uploaded to newly synced archive, beginning archive download, new coordinates downloaded, star map archive updated, new coordinates mapped, Verbus, Trill, Villo, Cerno, Aloma, Lassus, continuing spatial coordinate mapping, lexicon pass routine active, 33% complete, masking routine stable, Recipient, Athena. Data sent. Ending transmission. Data log of Celian contact 2667. Chief General Torlak. What news do you bring, Torlak? Callum spoke, eager to the tales from the battlefield. Have you gained any further insight into the issues we are facing? Polis will need to make ready a new speech for the people of Sela. Reka, Breka, Galem, and Polis sat at their respective sets beside the chief councilman, Kalim. They all awaited his report. Prepared for this, Torlak called in Creo, his chief scientist, to speak on part of his behalf. Torlak began, I must apologize, but spirits are low among the troops. He gauged their reactions, curiosity. But I am afraid we have been routed from Draxus. Draxus! Polis was the first to respond. Yes, it is what the so-called Terrans call the system, he continued. We first treaded into the territory that had yet to be named, save for the two life-bearing planets, Demira and Anmira. They called the system Dema, and it was the first system of our conquest. Gallum raised a hand. What do you mean by Terrans? Is that what we're to call them? That is so. In a final raid, scouts informed me of a likely point of interest that quite possibly held information on the enemy. Their posture changed, prompting Torlak to continue, to which he responded by directing their attention to Creo, and their eyes shifted. Creo was uneasy about the stairs, but carried on. Ahem, he coughed, and a hologram presented itself. Using the latest in data retrieval tech, we were able to seamlessly connect to the enemy's storage farm. They emitted a signal that meant they were passing data wirelessly, so we took that and began downloading the data. I must say, their security is what we would have had some thousand years ago, so it was easy for ground technicians to crack, Creo stated proudly. Out of the data we mined are what seem to be classified coordinates, new and upcoming technology. Here, let me show you. They were kind enough to have visuals attached. Pardon the coloring. I do believe some of the data was corrupted and color was lost. The first up seems to be a primitive form of an armored vehicle. Creo explained. He noted that compared to their own armored division, the Terrans were still stuck to technology before levitation tech, and greatly noted the treads the vehicle was supported on. Creo was also keen to mention the overall shape of the main compartment and the gun. The vehicle is moved by treads, no doubt to overcome uneasy terrain. The cabin is rounded with some parts angled to no doubt deflect incoming rounds. From what I have seen, the enemy has yet to field a heavy armored division. The only form we've seen are lightly armored four-wheeled vehicles with poorly welded guns on the rear. Reka raised his hand. What is that armored abomination called? I'm sure that just from the looks of it, it would be incinerated by a single round from our Halen tank. I'm sure it would. Their specifications are less than the width of my data pad, Creo said condescendingly. What do they call it? Reka asked. They called it the M4 Sherman. This brings us to another technology they seem to be developing. He changed the photo to one of an aerial element. This is what they call the F4 Phantom II, a vehicle designed for aerial bombing raids and interceptions. The visual had the council intrigued. By the frame, it suggests that it would be superb in atmospheric conditions. 
I would definitely be something worth looking out for in the field for our pilots. Creo ended his presentation and stepped back behind Torlak, who remained silent this time. You have been awfully quiet, Torlak. Is there any additional information on the Terrans and their tactics? Kalim asked. Yes, actually. Torlak paused. The Terrans. They employ frightening tactics in combat. I have seen so firsthand. He presented a video format of his latest engagement, and probably his most traumatizing. The councilman watched in horror as a ship from the enemy placed itself beside a Selian frigate and proceeded to fire an overdose of cannon fire into its side. The Selian ship fell to the earth and pieces covered in flame and smoke. The councilman's expressions grew fearful. Torlak played other instances of the slaughter before being told to pause or change it. As you can see, none of our ships were prepared to engage in such a fight. Their shields were destroyed on encounter and were laid to waste, he said solemnly. The War Council murmured between each other, but Torlak continued. What is even worse is how their infantry throws themselves into combat. He played another video when he fled. They enter metal coffins in the shape of tears and rain them down onto the battlefield. I suspect it was this force that brought Bralo to his end. That name rang bells in the councilman. Commander Bralo, a warrior who engaged in ground combat with legions of soldiers and was victorious more often than not. I received those from the last ship to leave the combat zone. It was a video of Bralo. Around him, several soldiers were shot by a slowly advancing force and bringing him to a corner. They thought that he was going to be captured as a prisoner when two soldiers came running with a stretcher after he was shot by a lone soldier with a gold mark on his shoulder. However, that was not the case, and the soldier who had already incapacitated him fired one into his skull. Then the video faded to static. The council was uneasy, and their expressions reflected what they felt. Do not worry, father, Pola spoke. I can use what we've learned to further demonize the enemy. I agree with Polas, spoke Brekka. We need to keep all information about the Terrans under restriction. We would not want to incite panic. We are already too far into this campaign to give up now, Rekka concurred. I would not subject my troops to such suicidal tactics. That makes us better than these savages. The sooner we rid them of our future colonies, the better we'll be if the Union attacks. The populace has yet to know about the Terran slaves we are currently trading to the Union. It is best if we keep it as such, Gallum added. The Four continued providing more ways to keep themselves as righteous to the people in the face of the enemy. The last speech by Polas had already prompted large-scale recruitment efforts into their forces, as well as workers for asset manufacturing. Business was booming, as they say. Torlak thought to himself of the current economic boom his people were experiencing. Is there anything more of me or my scientist? Torlak beckoned. That will be all. Kalim responded. Creo and Torlak left the War Council chambers and found themselves in the courtyard just outside. The sun was still high, and the sky was filled with brilliant blue and the whitest of clouds. A slight breeze caressed their bodies, and both shivered. Soon shall be the season of ice, commented Creo, to which Torlak agreed. They walked to the entrance of the building and were greeted by two guards who let them pass. Then they found themselves on a walkway littered with pedestrians. Children with their parents swung between their arms and smiles were flagrantly expressed, warming Torlak. This is why I do what I do, Torlak, for all these people and more. What about you? Creo asked. Torlak took some time to answer and did so after a pause. Not to say that I don't, but I feel that we could have gone in an entirely different direction. The Council did not have to resort to violence. The two continued down the road toward a bakery that Creo suggested they try. The roads were mainly for pedestrians, and any private vehicles flew overhead in designated zones away from populated areas or by rail. I know how you feel, but compared to the Terrans, Creo took care to whisper their name, I would pick us over them any day, wouldn't you? Of course. As I said, if we wish to be able to take up arms against the Union, I think it would be best to get them on our side. Creo's eyes grew. 
After what we did? Are you crazy? What do you think they would do to us if they found out what we did with their people? No thanks. I say we press on in our campaign and call it a day. Besides, at the rate we're going, we'll have the ships to outnumber them ten to one. Torlak agreed, but silently rejected the notion of extermination. Even after this time, it still didn't sit right with him and actively sought ways to peaceably approach, but constantly put that notion on the back burner. They have finally made their way to the bakery Creo was so eager to try and was glad upon its shorter-than-usual line. When it was his turn, he ordered a Valrin bun and roll while Torlak settled for the Trill spice bread. They found themselves at an outdoor table as they consumed their food. I'm telling you, nothing beats the Valrin bun and roll combo, Creo said with vigor as Torlak took a bite out of his Trill spice bread. Glad you enjoy it, because it came out of my pocket. Torlak snared. Don't worry, I'll transfer what I owe tonight. Torlak nodded pleasantly and finished his meal. He bid farewell to Creo, who continued eating while browsing on his data pad. Torlak wandered around for the rest of day visiting shops and browsing gifts, before settling on a fine necklace and head ornament band in the design of graciously decorated flowers. It was a popular type of headwear for the opposite sex, and the particular one he bought just so happened to match with the necklace. Both were placed in a neat but expensive looking back, and Torlak left the high-end jewelry shop toward the main rail. From the central area of Artre, the capital city, his trip would take him to just outside the main city limits. The ride was a total of an hour and twenty minutes, and he saw the gradual recession of the city into sparse buildings and land as far as the eye can see. Grass up to his waist spread out into the land, and the landscape was decorated with patches of large trees that offered a wealth of shade from the sun, and kids could be seen playing under some of them. Torlak continued to peer out the window and look towards the horizon. While his immediate horizon was obscured by grass-laden hills, he was still able to see a large and imposing range of mountains that were all kinds of shades of grey tipped with white snow. His home was relatively close to the mountains, and when he was younger, they would take trips up and play in the snow during the height of the season. As he reminisced, his ride came to a smooth halt, and the doors opened. His cabin was mostly free of riders, and was mostly old folk who had likely retired to the country. When he stepped off, he looked in the direction of where he came from and saw the outline of tall buildings in the far distance. Glimmers of light sparkled here and there in the sky surrounding the buildings, a mix of personal and commercial shuttles. He continued off the platform and the doors to the rail closed with a muffled hiss and continued on its journey. When it was gone, only silence was present. The sounds of birds broke that silence with a harmonious tune. He continued, and from the platform was met with a small town that had homes placed about on the hills and trees covered the main walkway with shade. It was quaint and quiet, with little foot traffic now that the sun was beginning to set. After walking for several minutes, he faced the door to a small home, the lights now illuminating parts of the walkway to the house. The laughter of children could be heard as he approached closer, and when he knocked on the door, the noises stopped and a muffled whisper took their place. After a moment, the door opened and he was met with a woman. Her eyes were large and her skin was a smooth violet with amethyst markings that dotted her face in a smooth and tribal pattern. Tor! She yelled and embraced him, her arms around his neck and her head into his chest. The door widened and two children came out. Both shared aspects of the woman and his burgundy shade. They gripped him at the sides. Dad! He did his best to embrace them all, but found that task impossible. Yes, children, Daddy's home, he replied. He settled the children down, and the family found themselves in the living room, the kids attached to him. I hadn't expected you so soon. I hadn't received a message for so long that I began to fear the worst, the woman said pouring a warm liquid and handing it to Tor. I apologize for that, Aleska. My work dictated I keep messages to a minimum, he said, applying a shallow smile. Oh, before I forget, I got this for you. He handed her the necklace and ornamental head ornament, and she adorned them both, gaining the attention of the kids and her husband. It looks beautiful. 
What made you decide to buy something like this? She asked. As general, I think it's only fitting for my wife. She blushed, giving him a kiss paired with the oohs and awes of their children. Don't worry, I didn't forget you both, he said grabbing two items from his coat. For my dear Alisa, and gave her a doll of a character from her favorite children's show, and for my strong son, Torlin. He brought out a small toy in the shape of a Selian frigate adorned in paint celebrating the Union secession. Both children glowed with their gifts and began playing with Aleska and Tor on the couch, watching their children play without a care in the world. How long will you be here? Aleska asked with a pleading look. I don't know. We've been granted some time away and rotated out so another group can take our place. I'm just glad you're finally back home. The kids have missed you. He observed the two. Elisa used her doll like a large attacking monster and Torlin fought back with his ship. They continued fighting it out, but eventually came around to the two toys joining forces against an invisible enemy. Who are they fighting? He asked. The Tewins, Torlin said. Torlak grew uneasy and faced Aleska. Where'd he learn that from? He said with a wry smile. It's been all over the news. Councilman Polis gave out a speech not long before you came home. What this about the Terrans? Tor swallowed, unsure how to answer. They're the bad guys. Tor conceded, contrary to his growing feelings about the recent actions against them. I just so happened to come back from a battle with them. Her eyes grew wide. Did you win? It was close, he lied. They're tough, but we drove them back, he said, feigning strength. He reassured her, and she subsequently relaxed, stress still somewhat present. The children continued playing until it was time for bed. Tor and Aleska tucked them both into bed and retired to their room. Exhaustion took him and Aleska equally, and the two drifted off to sleep. Their world stopped, even if for a bit. Tor didn't care. All he cared for currently was his family, and he would take the days as they came. Selianet, Verba Server, New Forum, Hot. Title, look what I came across, 700 million views, Trill and Boss. Look what I came across, see attachment, I think the council's hiding something, Celia Hunk. What the hells is it? I ain't finding anything in my logs about it. Not on the Verba servers either. Laszlo Orbit, those aren't from the Union, what are the council doing? Dim Quasar, check this, play video. I've never seen a shuttle just fall out the sky like that. Their engines just blew up. Bright Sun. La Su worker here, one of our coolant drives self-destructed. This is the first ever case and we've had this tech for a thousand years. Celia Hunk, that's crazy. Aye, I think something's going on outside, so let me check. Laszlo Orbit, ya hunk be safe, hearing reports of shuttles going haywire. Trillin Boss, check out this other stuff too, see attachment. Councilman Polis said something about the menace of Terrans, but some documents got leaked about running them across the Union border. Are we the bad guys? Bright Sun. Man, they shut down a quarter of the station from another incident. Apparently a heavy service drone went on a rampage. Killed like four people before security got it. See attachment. Ran them down like paper. What going on? Dim Quasar. I can't get a hold of my friends in Verbus. Anyone hear about that? Connection lost. Post Celian contact, late 2667. Jay Kurt. Jay was discharged from a medical facility on Alta, the main planet of the system named after it, and left through the main doors where he took a minute to pause and take in his surroundings. The hospital was situated on a hill, and a series of cars rotated out of the roundabout, departing with similarly discharged patients. He had minor fractures on his ribs and a minor concussion, but ultimately, he was screened by medical personnel from the Stellar Fleet. He was given a set of paperwork gathered from the planet's Republic Bureau of Citizens and pulled his records. He was going to need them for the local recruitment offices. Since losing Cam and his ship, Jay had felt nothing but regret since his time back on land. For the people he let down and his failure to warn the authorities caused many to lose their lives. He was still unsure of the conclusion on Draxus, but was assured by the captain of the ship that transported him here. He sluggishly resolved himself and took the main rail to a location where the armed forces held their recruiting office in his part of the city. The city he resided in was named Altamir. It was a city most noted for its buildings not being any higher than the hill the hospital sit upon. 
It overlooked a majority of the city that set itself within a valley of hills, with trees littering the area surrounding the buildings at the base of the hills. As such, a mix of buildings and trees flooded the valleys. The rail he took would cut through the main heart of Altamir, and his ride ended shortly past the first main stop in the heart of the city. He departed the car, and a gentle breeze moved through the air, rustling the leaves and grass. The noise of civilians was louder than he expected, and stepping off the rail, he made his way down from the station and onto the main walkway. Much of the city was designed with pedestrians in mind, and as such, the city placed a heavy emphasis on communal travel. This followed well across the planet, and only those who lived out by the farms, and even more, the rural areas, found more common use for them. As a result, the pedestrian walkways made their way into the alleyways of buildings, and since the pathways were well maintained, kept a standard of beauty for those who walked them. Throughout the city, larger open areas were prime real estate for the use of expensive and artistic works, such as in the plaza before the rail station was the depiction of a pair of birds intertwined. The color of the birds contrasted with the white granite it was chiseled in, and some would occasionally take photos of it from above the stairs that led into the station. Jay continued past the plaza and followed a road north, beside one of the only roads in the area. Shops lined the sides of the walkway, and the further he traveled, the smaller the buildings became. Even though it was late morning and the sun was rising to its zenith, the trees provided ample coverage for shade to the point where some areas were darker than others due simply to tree density. As he walked, he would occasionally peer into the alleyways and noticed small decorations for food shops, steam actively emitting from the entrance with the light of the shop, illuminating the steam with a soft yellow glow. There were many instances of this and believed there to be a plethora of nightlife he was unaware of. He did take the time to detour one of these shops and noticed they were embedded into the small crevices of buildings with a row of seats before the chefs and a small walkway behind them. He knew it to be a tight squeeze that he could attempt, but carried on his path. Jay made it to a gated entry with the gate itself open, and a road leading into the compound, a sidewalk paved beside it. The road led to a small lot where few cars were parked on his left, and to his right was a paved zone big enough for, at most, a large-sized dropship. The zone was currently empty, and Jay continued on the walkway that led itself between the car lot and the landing pad, toward a one-story building that extended halfway between the lot and the pad. The area before the building was filled with dirt, and the prints of shoes littered the width of the dirt trail. The closer he advanced, the sounds of yelling could be heard from behind the building, along with the sounds of young responses. The building itself had a series of large windows running across the central part of it, and within it were promotional advertisements related to each branch. Each one surrounded a door that led to their respective recruiter. From the left was the Orbital Guard, Stellar Fleet, with additions of the Marines and Air Force, and finally the Raiders. Since the time of commercial and easy access to space travel, the military decided to merge some of the branches under a singular entity. Therefore, the Marines and Air Force were merged under the Stellar Fleet. The Orbital Guard used to be the Army, and they now have two branches of desired placements. If you were placed on an orbital station as its crew and security, then you were part of the rightly named Orbital Guard. But for a more dedicated offensive force on the ground, you would take the job of the Guard Troopers. It was a specification like any job, and one in the Orbital Guard could switch between two. The Orbital Raiders, we the only new branch that stood on its own, but shared relations with the other two. They had no medical and no dedicated transport, so they relied heavily on the Navy to take them where they need to go. Their roots were based on the early iterations of the Orbital Guard, back when they operated an airborne unit in the early 20th and 21st centuries. At least that's what he read in the pamphlets the fleet docks gave him. He stood before the doors, deciding what he wished to apply to. He had briefly told Commander Eau Claire of his intention to join the raiders, but he wavered. In his time in the hospital, he constantly looked over each branch and who would best confront the enemy. His best bet would be the fleet. In this day and age, most fights are waged in the stars, and being aboard one of the combat ships would let him see the most action if he were to be a weapons operator. However, he felt an obligation deep within him to make it personal. Who better yet than the raiders, he said to himself when he was called out to by an individual in a gray short sleeve button-up shirt and black tie, tucked into black slacks with a silver stripe running down the sides of the leg. With a clean black belt with a silver buckle and shiny black dress shoes, 
Can I help you, sir? A man approached, stopping arm's length away, meeting Jay's gaze. Looking to sign up? Y yes uh, Staff Sergeant Cooper, but you can call me James, he said, directing Jay indoors to the Raider office. So what can I do for you? I'm, uh, looking to join and I was told the Raiders is the way to go, Jay said. Who referred you? I can offer some sort of a bonus if they're actively serving, more so if they're in the Raiders. Jay paused a moment before answering. It was Commander Eau Claire, from the Maiden of Blue. Cooper's eyes widened. How did you come across him? He saved me, in the outer edge of the system. My ship blew up and he saved me. That sure is something, he said, typing away on his computer. How soon are you looking to join? Now, if possible, Jay replied. Of course, Cooper said. Is there any particular specialty you're looking for? We have the Raider Sniper Program, Demolitions, Heavy Weapons Specialist, anything that catches your eye? I'll just do the standard infantry. Jay said. He looked at Jay but settled on Jay's decision. Cooper typed away, asking for additional information regarding his credentials. Jay gave him all that he needed, and the paperwork was completed, only short of signing it. Before you sign this, you think you'd be up for a test? Like what? Jay asked nervously. Just a physical strength test. Don't want you failing out in boot camp because you can't run. What do you say? Jay nodded, nervous about the rapid development. He was hydrated and loose, but nervous still, since he didn't like being scored on a workout. The test was a three-part series of a max set of crunches, pull-ups, and a three-mile run. Without further delay, Jay was given an extra set of workout clothes, and when he was dressed, followed Cooper into the back of the building, where several teenagers were lined up in a formation facing two instructors. Sergeant Corey and Corporal Fields. A moment? The two halted what orders and information they were giving the teens, and met Cooper and Jay. Yes, Staff Sergeant, replied Fields. Take this young man on the initial strength test and see how he does. The two looked over at Jay. He was older than all of the teens here from what he observed, and anxiousness was getting the better of him. Thinks you'll be able to run? It's okay if you can't, said the sergeant. Jay nodded, and he was told to fall in line at the back. He, like the others, was donned in a set of black shorts that stopped middle of the thigh and a gray shirt that was tucked in. All right, first up, crunches. The test began, and the group first did a series of crunches with alternating partners after they finished their own set within a two-minute window. Jay passed with an average mark of 100, and the next began with pull-ups. He was above average in build and scored a total of 17. Then the final test began. The run was decent for the first half, and Jay passed with an average time of 24 minutes flat. When all was said and done, and his assessment finalized, Cooper pushed the documents ahead. By now it was late into the afternoon, and the office was swarming with the soon-to-be recruits. When the paperwork was being pushed through, Jay was approached by two of the males of the group. Out of the twenty, there were at most three females. Hey! A short blonde hair teen greeted. Name's Moran, and this is Cameron. What about you? Jay. He stood to meet their greetings. What job did you pick? Cameron asked, almost meeting his height but averted his eyes ever so slightly from Jay. I, I think infantry. I didn't think there are other jobs in the Raiders that fit me, he said, resigning himself to his decision. So did we, Moran exclaimed. We ship out a day after tomorrow, once we go to the processing station. When do you go there? Jay asked. Tomorrow. The kid said jubilantly. I'm getting goosebumps just thinking of it. The two left when Cooper returned, his information displayed on a hollow pad. They hashed out the details shortly when he returned from the test. Displayed, it detailed that he was going to serve for a minimum of five years and three years inactive under the specialty of Raider Infantryman. Now all I need from you is to sign here, and I should be able to fit you in for tomorrow's processing. He laid out a folder. I made some calls and it looks like they can take you, as long as you got this. It was sealed with a wax insignia for the raiders, a flaming skull with a crossing sword and rifle in the background. Normally you'd have to go to processing first to confirm a date, but sometimes they can expedite it, he said with a wink. Jay nodded and signed the form digitally, sealing his newfound commitment. You got a ride? To which Jay replied no. Come here at 06 tomorrow and we can get you processed. Sound good? To which Jay nodded. Yes, sir. That's the spirit, 
Cooper replied and patted him on his back. You know, I had a younger brother who joined and got out about a year ago. Last I heard from him, he was in Draxus and joined the militia band there. Guess you never really do get out of it, he said with a solemn expression. Well, I'm sure he's fine. Don't be late tomorrow. Jay agreed and left the office. The once bustling room of aspiring raiders was cleared, but met them outside, where they mingled with one another as they left the compound at intervals at a time. Jay bid them farewell and found refuge in a nearby inn, where he took the time to reflect on his upcoming new life journey. So far it was nothing but a mess, and he was doing data-running jobs in the outer colonies that ended in disaster from an entity that wanted them dead and also summarily cost the lives of innocent folk and his best friend. He rested on a chair that faced the window. Now with the sun below the horizon, he opened it to reveal a cool summer breeze that was comforting to him. By remembering Cam, it prompted him to grab a device that was given to him by the Navy, but he didn't have time to look at it or simply forgot. It was a thumb drive with what Eau Claire said was a message to him. They kept the data drive, but took the time to transfer a personal message from the drive. He read it. It detailed his sudden aggression during the realization of Jay's mistake that he shouldn't have made. To Jay and any who finds this, I'm sorry how I reacted to you stopping for food. You were stressed, and I know how you are after a mission coming close to danger. Remember? That encounter we had with the pirates from Lamba? You gorged practically the whole burrito supply from the station in the next system over. But I write this just in case we don't make it. At least someone could read how it wasn't your fault, but I have to let you know. Anyone to know. The reason I acted as I did is that we might have been able to prevent another system from facing the same fate as Dima. But there's another reason and I'll end it here. My fiancé was on Dima when it was attacked. We were going to stop by and I was going to tell you, but then we were attacked. I had no time to tell you. If you can, Jay, or whoever you are, please find Alexandria Farron. See image. Jay sat quietly as he read. He wanted to cry, yell, scream, and tear at everything in his vicinity. But he knew he couldn't do that. He knew it wouldn't help, and instead turned his head to the outside. The lights now illuminated beneath the trees, giving it a somber but spirited atmosphere. As he stared blankly outside, just taking in the breeze and ambience, he heard a call from below. Jay! You busy? It was Cameron, and this time Moran wasn't with him. Sure, you hungry? To which Cameron nodded. Let's eat, it's on me. Cameron nodded and proceeded to wait for Jay, who only tossed on a new shirt and pants and quickly tied his shoes before he met Cameron, waiting near the entrance to the inn. Cameron stood to just below Jay's nose, and his brown hair was a mess. He was dressed in casual clothes that complemented each other of charcoal-colored pants and a dark denim button-up shirt rolled just past his forearms. Hey! I thought you'd be with Moran, Jay inquired, striking small conversation. He's celebrating with his family before we process, and I'm not one for parties, he said, his voice reaching a soft tone at its height. Jay judged that he must mostly be soft-spoken. Jay took Cameron to a restaurant just beside his inn, and both ordered a meal from the noodle and soup menu. Say, how old are you? You do seem a little older than the rest of the pool, Cameron asked, and he leaned, with his chin resting on the top of his wrist. I'm 22, and space does that to you, Jay replied with a grin as their food finally arrived. Wait, you were a pilot? What are you doing here at the recruiters? He inquired. My ship blew up and the Navy found me floating, he replied, leaving out details of the alien ship and calm. Been in the hospital until today. What about you? Me? I just turned 20, Cameron replied, slurping a portion of his noodles. The two continued conversing well into the late afternoon exchanging their interests and how they grew up. Jay mentioned he started flying at 16 to run data for a local broker and found he had a knack for it. It wasn't later that he met Cam, who would be his technician for the last few years. What happened to Cam? Cameron asked quietly. We went our separate ways just before I lost my ship, Jay said, regret singeing at his heart. But that is in the past now. Cameron nodded at the shallow attempt of optimism and the two shortly ended their meal, leaving for their homes. See you tomorrow, Jay. You too, Cam, er, Cameron, he said with a slip of the tongue, his mistake going unnoticed. Jay returned to his room and read over the message once more, deepening the regret that only grew, and the fate of Cam's fiancé plagued his mind. Tomorrow would start the journey he would need to set his life anew. Report 
ODR Recruit Depot, Sol System Mars. New Recruit Cycle, Hotel Company. Total Recruits for Cycle, 1014. Estimated Pass Rate, 57%. Designated Senior Training Instructor, Gunnery Sergeant Slaughter. Estimated Arrival Date, 2667-1012. Post Celian Contact, Late 2667. J. Kurt. The day following his evening with Cameron was relatively smooth. The local processing station was the primary facility to process all who wished to join the armed forces. It was a place made to solidify paperwork and acted as the final step before your training would begin. He did as Staff Sergeant Cooper said and provided the folder he was given. As fate would have it, they expedited his ship date to tomorrow instead of one that would have been much later. He did various physical tests to determine the full range of motion or any possible liabilities that would prove detrimental to their job. Behind closed doors were more invasive interviews with medical professionals, but after trudging the slow process, Jay finally came out from the facility in a holding area. There, he met with Cameron and Moran. Hey, Jay! Moran greeted along with a meek Cameron. How are you? asked Cameron. Never better, although it feels like I'm moving a bit too fast. That's natural. My date was set just before I graduated high school, Moran inserted. Today was my finalization. Same here, except mine was three weeks ago, Cameron added, raising three fingers of his right hand. So what's this place? Looks like holding area, inquired Jay. It is, Moran started. From here we'll go to the nearest starport, where they already have rooms reserved for us. Then tomorrow, we'll all take commercial transport to the Raider Recruit Depot, he explained. The three started a casual conversation while the room began to fill. The capacity was fit for 2,000 personnel, but their room was filled to only half that amount. The time came when the doors to the facility closed behind them and the doors to their front opened, revealing a tram rail. Each compartment was able to hold 75 people and there was a total of 10 cars attached. The on-site personnel began shuffling the recruits into the cars, forcing them to cram into the limited space available. Many were stuck standing and not long after the doors closed and the tram began moving, the smell of sweat began to permeate the car. Ventilation wasn't, it wasn't equipped to condition the overwhelming amount of people. Jay found himself with Cameron, as both were standing while Moran was able to land a seat and was already well on his way to falling asleep. The ride itself was anxiety-inducing for many, and their car was rising in volume for many of the recruits as they began to talk among one another, each sharing their stories and where they came from. Jay and Cameron did the same. They spoke in length bits of their childhood, with Cameron excited to listen to Jay, who seemed to have experienced a storied past, including the most recent past. They continued talking until the automated announcer said that they were nearing the Alta starport. They exited the tram when the doors opened and were greeted by several tables further toward the station's entrance. Each person was given an identification number that they used to determine room keys and all were lined up. Jay looked around and noticed that many wore only the clothes on their backs and what little they could have in their pockets and their paperwork. When it was their turn at the desk, they gave their number and were given their room keys. Moran ended up rooming with the person in front of him, and Jay and Cameron found themselves as roommates. It was now late afternoon, and Moran left with his roommate, and so did the pair. Their room was designed in minimalist fashion with a mix of white, gold, and silver that made simple shapes and paired with abstract placed teal. It wasn't his first choice of design, but he wasn't paying for the room, so he let it go. They were told before receiving their room keys that they were free to explore the station's public areas for food and legal entertainment. So he did what the others were doing and took Cameron with him for food with Moran not in sight. How far do you think it is from here to the depot? Asked Cameron, biting into a burger. Jay did some calculations using personal reference before answering. From the Alta system, I'd say about three weeks in one go. In slip space? Cameron blurted. Jay nodded. Yeah, the commercial ships these days have a faster drive core, and my ship would have taken about one and a half months. Cameron was surprised. What did you do during those times in between systems? Physical training? My ship could only travel to the next nearest system before I could jump again, so I've spent a lot of time in space than I wanted to. Well, I can see your progress, Cameron said, pointing to his arms weren't large, but they were toned. No wonder you did well on your PT scores. Jay laughed taking a solemn bite out of a custom-ordered burrito. He stared at it and quickly finished it. I have a habit of gorging on food when I was stressed, and working out helped alleviate that, for what it's worth it.
He ended their conversation and left for the room, with Cameron quickly following. The sooner they slept, the sooner the next day came. When his head hit the pillow, Jay was quick to fall to slumber with Cameron following suit shortly after. The following three weeks were over before Jay knew it. Because when they entered the ship, instead of riding out the three weeks awake, they were placed in cryogenic pods, and the next they knew it. The recruits were less than a day out from their destination, Mars. In the central passenger compartment was a hologram of the current system. It was Saul, and it was the first time he had traveled here. From the information he read when he was younger, it was the most populated system with an extremely high presence of Navy ships and orbital stations. Almost every planet and moon was colonized, and many found their homes there. There were even two large communities of those who lived in the system's asteroid belts as major mining colonies. Even Mars was terraformed at the end of the 21st century, and since then had seen exponential growth in terraforming technology with Mars as the basis. Therefore, in the early 23rd century, planets that had similar conditions to Mars could be terraformed after a generation or two. However, very few planets could be terraformed since the cost of the technology had yet to be opened to private industry. The planet had large two sizable polar ice caps with the northern pole, with the largest area of the two, and was placed in the center of its northern hemisphere ocean. The southern hemisphere was a connected supercontinent with two large bodies of water as large as lakes. They were now just a few hours away from touching down, and Jay grew nervous. He left to explore the mess deck and found that they provided pre-made burritos. He bought four and returned to Cameron, who was still recovering from cryosleep. He offered one to his friend while eating the three left over. Jay noticed Cameron looking around for who he assumed to be Moran and found him near the front, engaging with a group of males in a card game. Not wanting to move, Cameron stayed where he was and slowly ate his burrito. By now, Jay was on his third and final one when a notice came over the intercom. Return to your seats and fasten your harness for the descent. Those that were up and about did as they were told, and all the seats in the bay quickly filled. The ship rocked at first, but smoothed out throughout the descent. Jay looked out the window to his right, and he figured they were just below the stratosphere. The ground below was green and heavily forested. Several locations could be seen as worker settlements or military installations, with some areas close enough to eye the large ships parked above. Others began to peer into the windows to view the ships outside. The most notable was the Chimera-class destroyers and Artemis-class heavy frigates. Their silhouettes screamed stellar fleet, and they were the most numerous. Their bows were similar in construction with a top and bottom portion, with a space in the middle, looking like a rectangular jaw from a side profile. However, the destroyers were complete in their frame, and these boasted space in the center of the ship and throughout the engines. The line of small, medium, and heavy frigates shared the same frontal design, but toward the aft, it had two side outcrops that ran the center part of the ship. The engines also boasted angled, reinforced hulls that covered the top and bottom portions of the sides of the ship and engines. There was also an extended bay at the bottom of the frigates to allow quick offload and download of vehicles and other cargo. Their names were too far to make out, but strips of color appeared on the aft section of the reinforced hulls. The destroyers had a crimson-colored stripe that ran down the sides of the bow and aft sections of the ships, and the frigates were colored yellow, green, and blue, respectively of their sizes. So it was no wonder the passengers were in a roar. This was the first time they had seen TRSC ships in person, no matter how far they seemed. The ship had finally descended, and the once rambunctious crowd was now silent as the void they had just traveled. The doors of the ship were open, and Jay looked for the source of the sudden silence. That was until they made themselves known. Get off my ship! A man in a similar uniform worn by Staff Sergeant Cooper three weeks ago yelled. Except on his head, he wore a wide circular brim hat. Move, 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 move! They yelled, followed by several more sporting the same uniform. They rushed to the passenger compartment and began screaming at those who didn't move quickly enough. Jay nudged at Cameron and the two followed the mass of people trying to exit all at once while they were constantly yelled at. They made their way off, and their large group was now rendered to ten, and all were formed in four columns. When all was set, Jay looked beneath him and noticed a set of black footprints spread at a forty-five-degree angle. Listen here, a lead uniformed man screamed, his voice multiplied by a series of speakers. The footprints you stand on are the symbol of the training you will undergo and what you will become. Thousands have stood where you are. 
and only hundreds have been able to call themselves raiders for every cycle. He began to list off a series of rules and regulations to be followed, such as only responding with, yes sir or no yes sir, and what is expected. When the rules were explained, one at a time, the groups were shuffled toward the nearest building. When they were clear, the next group followed, and so on, until his group was ordered to move. He felt a tug behind him, and noticed Cameron was with him while looking for Moran, whom he noticed was near the front, while Jay and Cameron were situated near the back. The building they entered was another holding bay. This time, buses awaited on the side. All recruits were stationary in their seats, and their voices were silenced. As the buses came, the groups slowly diminished until each was on a bus toward a facility out in the distance. They weren't allowed to raise their heads and were told to keep quiet on the ride. As each moment passed, all Jay could think was, why did he join? When they arrived at the depot, their bus was corralled into a large warehouse and ran through a series of other recruits that handed them two large green bags and were issued their gear that was ungraciously tossed into the bag. This continued until all recruits were confirmed to have their gear, and they proceeded to their first initial sleeping quarters, where they were told that the initial week was administration and paperwork processing. Throughout the week, and with many more on the horizon, they were yelled at and forced to do arbitrary and repetitive actions. By now, they were donning the standard gray and black camouflage pattern battle dress uniform and a pair of running shoes. Their hair was unevenly shaven, with some having patches of unshaven fuzz if a hand ran across their scalp. Everywhere they went, they marched, as sloppy as it was. They were now under the instruction of a single instructor that didn't yell often, and for most of the week, all he did was raid his voice to get the newly formed platoon's attention. However, that would change on Friday. As their initial week finished, they were ushered to a large five-story building and placed into a large bay with three rows of bunk beds that created two medium-sized pathways. The recruits were immediately rushed to find a bed and place their green bags on it and to stand by near the front of the bay, which was called the quarter deck, and it was the only place that could fit their platoon of approximately 102 recruits. They were issued to keep their heads down and to stand by. The footsteps could be heard from a door near the front of the bay. Their attention was demanded, and their heads propped up to reveal a singular man in the foreground with four more behind him. All wore the same service uniform with the cover's brim shielding their eyes. Then the frontman spoke. Listen up, you unwanted and godforsaken maggots. I am Gunnery Sergeant Slaughter, and I, along with my fellow drill instructors, will be your worst fucking nightmare, and I will not be the last. My goal here is to ensure you are trained to the best of our abilities to become the most feared warriors with the death wish that humanity has to offer, to be willing to jump into danger for the sake of not just your brethren, but to which the Republic serves, your family's friends, your fucking girlfriend is now screwing your best friend, and if not him, then your neighbor. Slaughter paced the area near the front of the group before continuing. Let me introduce you to your instructors. From left to right, they stepped in practice and in fluid motion at the mention of their rank and name. When he was done, they returned to their spot and remained at parade rest, their feet apart and their hands across the lower part of their back. You are mine, and you are theirs. You will respect them for the duty and title that they hold, to train the next generation of raiders, but right now, you are nothing but useless recruits, nothing but a piece of shit on the bottom of my boot. He paused and looked about the room. Drill instructors! He paused, taking his spot behind the four previously named instructors. You have them! As soon as his final word left his mouth, chaos erupted. The four drill instructors began issuing orders rapidly, and many were already stumbling at what they called for. The orders were simple, but consisted of incoherent screams that generated a man-made fog of war for the recruits. However, now their beds were. The orders were simple, but consisted of incoherent screams that generated a man-made fog of war for the recruits. However, now their beds were made and any extra gear not needed was placed in the footlocker at the foot of the racks. Jay was breathing quickly, and looked to Cameron, who was now his rackmate. He had a visible look of fear and anxiety on his face. The orders continued until nightfall. They had gotten dinner, and they showered, all under the supervision of their instructors. So each meal was no more than fifteen minutes, and their showers were no more than them walking through the showerheads in ice-cold water. When all was said and done, they were allowed to sleep and few throughout the night would stand an hour of watch, 
subject to the random and sudden orders of the drill instructors. However, Jay would be able to sleep without having to stand watch, and was able to enjoy some modicum of rest. However, each morning they were awoken, but the sudden illumination of fluorescent lighting and the yells of their instructors, Leates, slights, 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 and they would be subject to a series of repetitive motions and a constant yell of affirmation whenever one is spoken to. This would continue in the mornings and evenings until lights out. Between physical training and classes, it remained the same routine until their time at the range. The range was a series of activities that were a mix of shooting, land navigation, the gas chamber, and a culminating event at the end shrouded in mystery. For shooting, all recruits were taught from the ground up, even if they had experienced it prior. They were able to pick up quickly on the theory and practice in little time compared to a city boy whose only time with a gun was online in a game. The weapon you hold is the standard weapon of the armed forces. It is the KTAC S8AR, your gas-operated, shoulder-fired, magazine-fed weapon of choice. Slaughter explained, This will be your friend, lover, and child. It may very well be the one you use when you exit your steel coffin in the middle of an enemy squad that was unfortunate enough to get in your way. Oora! Oora! The platoon screamed in unison. Jay showed some aptitude and scored relatively midpoint, making a sharpshooter. Cameron, on the other hand, made marksman, a tier just below sharpshooter, with expert being the highest. Moran scored expert and flaunted it amongst his newfound group. Is expert really that great? Cameron said, his voice gravelly from the constant yelling over the past several weeks. Jay shrugged. It tells them that you know how to control your weapon and that you can hit your mark, he said, as he pulled on the rifle's charging handle and loaded a round into the chamber. They were now testing in the final target acquisition and speed reload test. For this next test, they had ten seconds to fire, reload, and fire again. They started in an alert stance, and when the buzzer alarmed, Jay brought his rifle up, lined the shot, and fired two rounds when the bolt locked. With a practiced motion, pressed the magazine release with his trigger finger, and, with his free left hand, simultaneously grabbed the second magazine, loaded it, sent the bolt forward, and fired two more shots. He put his weapon on the safe, lowered his weapon, maintained the muzzle downrange, and looked left and right. Cameron had just fired his second volley when the buzzer sounded. Unload show clear! The instructors sounded, and the recruits compiled in a similar cadence. The totals were tallied, and Jay scored 334 points out of 350. He made mid an expert. Cameron, on the other hand, made 304 a high sharpshooter. Cameron was visibly dejected after their scores were totaled, and he felt bad for those who made marksmen. When they returned to the barracks, those that made 279 and below were promptly hazed in the name of incentivized training. Some Jay was subject to when he failed to be quick enough with holding a back in the air or his uniform wasn't on all the way. There could be any number of reasons they could pull you aside and proceed to torment you while the rest of the platoon watched, not wanting to share their fate. It did well to stay in line and do as you were told. I meant to ask, Cameron started, when the platoon was given an hour to themselves before overlights out. What happened to your face? A red mark in the shape of a stocky worm was present under his eye. I didn't secure my lock to my footlocker for the first time yesterday, so Gunny Slaughter made sure I didn't do it again. And you can bet I'm not doing that again. He said with a wry laugh twelve weeks had passed since then, and Jay and Cameron were subject to another twelve weeks of the depot. However, the punishment lessened greatly when his platoon was swapped to a new series of instructors. Instead of calling them sir and ma'am, they were now called by their rank. However, Gunny Slaughter remained constant and enforced their drills early on, but now was more focused on training them as a team. While Slaughter was the acting company commanding officer, he was Jay's platoon's senior instructor. Over the next eleven weeks, the hotel company was trained in various other weapon platforms and advanced tactics. They were thoroughly ingrained with the knowledge of clearing buildings and fighting in all terrain. Even more so, they trained as a team and the squad leader led instruction in tactics and simulated combat. This continued until the night on the eve of their culminating event. You think you're ready, Cameron? Jay asked as he drew on a mini notepad. I think so. It's much better knowing I have you to count on. He replied as he was clearing his uniform of stray fabric. If anything, I'll carry you to the finish line, Jay said with a smirk, to which Cameron replied quietly. I hope that won't be the case. The night continued and hotel company was met with an early morning, 
Ten platoons formed outside their barracks. What was now 1,000 recruits was now down to just above half. Those who failed to meet the expected standards were sent away to a following company that would soon take their place in the field. That was their last chance to make it as a raider. But even then, once they were dropped for a third time, they were sent home. Still, they awoke and gathered their gear and rifles. Their final test as recruits were now upon them. The final test took place during the final week. It was as much a test as it was a three-day-long obstacle course. They were informed near the beginning that the final event was a large-scale exercise that utilized simulation rounds, also known as simunition, as they made their way through the course. Before they would begin, a brief was held by Gunnery Sergeant Slaughter. You men have done a good job in coming this far. I am almost proud of what shit stains you all were. The recruits laughed at his joke, and he continued. Before these gates are a series of trucks, each for a platoon, that will take you to predetermined locations around the outskirts of the training arena. This is the final test. Those who make it can call themselves raiders. Those who fail will get dropped, he said, pausing for dramatic effect. These are the rules. One, you'll have exactly 72 hours to reach the final point, your graduation. Two, you must be equipped with simunition rounds designed to paralyze the target. The suits you wear will register it. All who make it by the deadline will graduate. Conscious or not, the fourth and final rule is you will not kill, only incapacitate. The air stilled, and all ten platoons were silent. They had experienced twelve weeks of abuse and hazing, while also being nurtured in the ways and knowledge of a warrior. They were not going to give up now. A final word. You will also share the arena with two other companies from another depot competing to graduate. We have drilled into every bit of leadership and combat instinct you need to get you through this. Make it to the top and prove to them you are superior. He looked left and right, his visage on screens to the outermost lying platoons. Then, drill instructors, direct these recruits to their transport. Upon taking their spot on the truck, each was ceremoniously given a yellow band to place over their arm. They were accompanied by their drill instructors, but they only acted as supervisors from overhead in an Odin, a troop transport modified with the capability of surveillance and a capacity to pull any out that have been stunned for too long. Cameron and Jay sat across one another in the truck, and for the duration of the ride, the passengers conversed, and the squad leaders drew up strategies for the 72-hour trail. Moran was one such squad leader. Each was given a vague map of the training area with several marked and unmarked roads. They were also given only three packs of MREs each, and two water canteens. They were donning a raider cuirass and an orbital guard trooper helmet painted in the steel gray of their overall uniform. They were told that if they could walk for three days straight, the trip would take only 25 hours. They had to manage sleep, obstacles, and an unknown enemy combatant. Each truck of their company was driven off to separate locations, and the same was meant for the other two companies. I heard the other companies graduating are golf in India. They'll be wearing blue and green. So if you see them... Either let them pass or take them out, one squad leader suggested. His name taped on his helmet and chest indicated he was named Gale. The less competition we have to the top, the better. I say we shoot, rebuked Moran. The two squad leaders duke out their ideas while the rest just watched, conversing about likely scenarios and how to deal with them when the trucks come to a stop. Their platoon was separated into four squads and thus took two trucks to reach their destination. They stood before a large gate with a large and thick concrete wall that extended far into the trees. The squads organized themselves so each squad would enter the gate on order. Moran was in charge of Squad 1, while Jay and Cameron were in Squad 2. You ready for this, Cam? Jay said with a nudge of his elbow. Cam? You've never called me that before, he said, cocking his head to the side in a confused look. I think it would be fitting. You've only called me by first name, but I've never heard yours. His face was flush red from embarrassment, probably. Promise you won't laugh? Promise. Er, all right. A buzz rang, and the large doors opened, revealing a wide dirt path. The trail was open on the sides, with trees lining the edge of the open area, and a series of buildings could be seen on the horizon. The timer buzzed once more, revealing a countdown, and the first squad departed, soon to be followed by the rest, and Cameron finally replied. It's... Camille. TRSC Trial by Fire. Report. 
detecting a slipspace rupture in the outer edge of the Draxis system. Rupture matches the description and readings by the TRSC Will o' the Wisp. Moving forces to engage the hostile threat. Forces engaged. Hostile is a lone frigate. Hostile self-destructed. Received transmission before destruction. Data downloaded. Athena report awaiting. Recipients notified. Athena TRSC Sword of Reckoning. Sol System, Mars, ODR Recruit Depot, Recruit J. Kurt. When you enter the Proving Grounds, you will be tested, physically and mentally. Hotel Company will be competing against two others, Golf and India. They've been given the same mission as you, to make it to the top and prevent your enemy from completing. Slaughter paused. You will also be tested against a third element. It's new training tech designed to add a third dimension to combat. J. recalled the words said to him and the rest of his company, by their senior drill instructor, Gunny Slaughter. Their orders were more detailed when the platoons broke off from the main body and into their trucks, which drove them to a designated starting point. Since they are in competition with two other companies, all authority was delegated to the squad leaders, then to the fire team leaders, if the mission deemed it so. The third element that they were warned about was vague, but they were told that there were additional supplies available if each platoon was able to clear compounds which were home to the third entity. Jay found the secrecy of this culminating event intriguing, since all information regarding it was kept hidden until the day of or during the vent itself. Any attempts to ask any current raider was quickly met with denial. An unspoken oath of secrecy, he thought, which did wonders for his imagination. His platoon patrolled the path in a tactical column, where each individual was ten to fifteen paces from each other in staggered form, ensuring there would be no collateral kills in a real combat scenario. It was also the most common formation when traveling in silence while still on the alert. The Proving Grounds was their last major event in recruit training to graduate. Participants needed to make it to the top of the mountain at the center of the training area. The arena was split up into three sections, which he still knew little of. From what the instructors told them before, the first area was centered on team building and combat maneuvers. The second was where they would be loaded with some munition of their own, and the final was a large climb. After recounting the knowledge he had of the proving grounds, the platoon came to a halt, and the squad leaders gathered them around a sign before the obstacle. It was a wide but long series of crawls and multiple walls and debris to navigate while staying low. The trails were freshly watered and muddy. This fact alone made many uncomfortable, because that meant they were going to get dirty, and it would most likely remain that way over the next two days. The sign was simple. It provided details for not just this immediate course, but for three others beyond it. However, for the first course, it stated the need to stay on the course and to stay low. The second was a test of alternating advances called buddy rushing. The third was to scale walls with increasing difficulty mixed with agility and rope climbing. The fourth and final was an active patrol scenario and the goal was to bring everyone to an end. However, as the squads were about to break into fire teams for the course, two recruits got the bright idea to try to skirt the course. As they did, shots of gunfire littered the air for a moment, then ceased. As the platoon looked toward the deviants, they found them motionless when a voice spoke over a hidden speaker. A bit of forewarning, stay on the course, was literal. Stray from the current path and you will be neutralized by simunition rounds, Retrieve the two deviants, but you must low crawl or risk the same fate. The faces of the platoon said that they didn't want to, but Jay and Cameron took the initiative and crawled toward the two who lay on their backs and pulled them until they made their way onto the trail. The voice began, The sim round's effects will last about six hours before they can even begin to wake up. Their fates are up to you. Thoughts on punishments were already being suggested, stating that if they were willing to circumvent the course, then it was their fault and they should be punished for it. Others disagreed and said that they should bring them. Two from their squads volunteered to stay behind and wait for them to wake up while the rest of the platoon continued with the course. There were only four lanes and the squads were set up into fire teams as they proceeded forward. When the first group entered the muddied water, cries of frustration were sounded. Their socks were drenched and at least one half of their body was wet and the cool breeze didn't help alleviate their discomfort. The sounds of gunfire also littered the air, making those who stayed behind hit the deck and took cover by some torso-high brick walls. The tops of the lanes were covered with barbed wire, and the way forward was blocked by a berm. 
They couldn't see past it, and the only way forward was to crawl through a semi-flooded concrete tunnel beneath the dirt mound. Jay and Cam were next, along with their two fire team members, Fields and Soren. As they crawled, Cam made it a point to detail where the water made its home, while Jay and the others took the time to roll themselves into muddy water, effectively drenching themselves in the cold embrace of mud water. This greatly eased Jay when he was fully enveloped in wet clothes rather than partially wet ones. When they entered the tunnel and made their way through about 50 feet of waist-high water, they were met with the entirety of the course. At the end of the tunnel, Jay and company were met with a view that overlooked the rest of the course. They were at the precipice of a dirt hill, and the downward slope was already muddied from previous recruits. Are we supposed to slide down this? commented Fields. Looks like a 50-foot drop. I guess we slide down and continue. Not like we have a choice, Jay said with a sigh, and his team complied and slid down from the area with the tunnel. As they reached the bottom, they got into the prone again and started crawling with shots firing overhead of the barbed wire. The sounds of whizzing from the bullet made its way into his eardrums. His team continued until they reached a halfway point of the low crawl section when explosions from the side of the course erupted in smoke and dust. Luckily, their lanes in the mud depressed just enough to cover their prone body, but their bodies still rocked from the explosions. Oh, come on! sounded a Soren to his right with clear dismay. Jay disregarded the complaint and kept his head down as he continued to crawl, with chunks of dirt landing on him with notable force. He was glad for the chest rig and helmet to protect him. When he completed the course, a simple dirt path with a concrete wall lined that the side of the path met his view and he took this chance to take a breather, not knowing how much stamina he had actually wasted. The next and final course was a long field that started with a half wall that the fire team would use as cover and wait until the team leader gave the command to advance. The field was mostly grass, with previously made paths from years of use and abuse. It was designed with an alternative style of advancement of a fire team. By alternating every other person two at a time, the fire team could advance while the two who stayed back would provide cover fire. This was known as buddy rushing, a tactic to continuously lay down fire for your team as they continually advance against the enemy. There was no automated fire in this section as indicated by a sign, but a long wall of barbed wire lined the sides of the course, which happened to extend for another mile and a half. Wait, we have to bud rush for a mile and a half? said Cam, taking a swig of his canteen. Gotta build up the stamina somehow. You can't destroy the enemy by maneuver and fire if you don't, well, maneuver and fire, said Fields, taking a large drink from his canteen as well. Haven't you learned anything from the last twenty-odd weeks in recruit training? Cam acknowledged his comment silently. Once the next team goes, we're up, Jay said, followed by the silent nods of his fire team. As the next team proceeded, Jay and his fire team took their places by the half wall, in a crouched position, waiting until the next team was further along. When the other team was sufficiently ahead, Jay and his fire team proceeded with the training event. They continued this for the duration of the course, and by the time they made it to the end, Cam, Fields, and Soren were gasping for air, Jay included. Whoa! What the hell, man? Soren started. I didn't think a mile and a half of rushes would do this to you. I know what you mean. I've been so used to the 50-meter rushes, but not this, added Fields. Jay noted the next course, and seeing that it was a simple dirt path, they jogged at a slow pace and met the other teams that arrived before them. All were a mess covered in damp clothes, hunched over catching their breath, or taking a drink from their canteen. The next course was an agility course, with walls to climb and single logs to cross over. If they failed, they would have to restart from the beginning. This was enforced by an automated targeting system that tracked their movements to their last known checkpoint which was the beginning. Granted, the entirety of the course was separated into parts, each with a different setup. Jay's fire team cleared the series of obstacles, using each other as step stools over walls, and quickly made their way through the short course, only to be met with a sign planted in the center of a widened dirt road. Patrol! Progress as a squad to the extraction zone. Leave no one behind. Those who made it past the latest obstacle course waited until the rest of the platoon arrived before progressing, even those who were hit by the automated turrets. The sun was quickly falling, and light was barely filtering through the trees of the hills that surrounded them. There were four paths, subsequently marked one through four, 
and each squad took a path that corresponded to their number. The paths were separated by trees and hollow buildings, but they were wide enough to accommodate two-lane traffic, which were littered with seemingly purposeless debris. Much of the debris is burned, with hole-riddled civilian vehicles, tires, barrels, etc. Jay figured that the course was supposed to simulate a combat area with the road as their only avenue of approach. Jay's squad, led by Gale, took a tactical column and progressed through the trail. The light was quickly fading, and they equipped their lights which gave off a red beam. They traveled the path for another thirty minutes, looking at more of the same scenery, when an explosion sounded behind him. I.E.D., sounded Jay, further alerting his squad to the sudden change in dynamic. Three of his squadmates were unconscious, and the squad took a defensive perimeter. Those closest to the victims moved to triage their comrades. This practice was normal and expected, since they had spent a decent two weeks on nothing but combat triage and first aid in an active combat zone. The first was to stop the bleeding, check for breathing, treat the wound, and treat for shock. Steps that had proven to save lives in the heat of the moment. When the triage was settled, Jay finally noticed that Cam was one of the three victims taken by the IED, and rushed to his side. Hey Cam, can you hear me? Come on bud, wake up! He smacked Cam's face slightly and noticed his eyes flutter. I, I can't move my legs! He said in a dazed fashion as Jay looked over his body and noticed paint across his right leg and waist. It was the same substance that would normally neutralize them if it hit the chest, but it was designed to target the lower extremities and offered some form of hallucinogen. This might be a little tight, bud. He pulled a tourniquet from one of Cam's pouches and applied it to the right leg. He applied it just tight enough and proceeded to bring Cam over his shoulder in a fireman's carry. The sudden dead weight was doing a number on his thighs. Fields holstered his own rifle while he proceeded the rest of the way with Cam's in hand. Then chaos erupted. Simulated explosions with displays of smoke illuminated by the flash of light paired with shots of gunfire sounded the area, the sound carrying over from the other paths. Move! Gale commanded over the noise of combat, with maniacal laughter among the squad. This was the first any of them had experienced something as visceral as combat, simulated or not. They still maintained a perimeter around the men carrying their partners with their weapons trained outward. This continued for a while and Jay's thighs felt like they were on fire, but he pressed on, his slung rifle swinging tight to his body. For the remainder of the trail, they waded through thigh-deep water and evaded the numerous amounts of debris, until the noise faded when the last of their group passed through the exit, which was a gate flanked by two flares that looked like they were activated remotely. Jay found a small grassy hill in their clearing, and lay cam upon it and placed his rifle beside him. He placed a finger under his nose, and confirmed he was still breathing, although it was labored. At the end of the trail was a gate with a timer that counted down. Next to the gate was a map of the next area, with the squad leaders huddled around it. When they were finished, the squad leaders returned from the electric board and returned to their respective squads. Listen to me now, second squad, Gale started. We've got about seven hours until the gates open, so we have this time to rest. Eat some chow and get some sleep. The first seven will stand to watch, and we'll rotate in the next area. He left, and the squad set their assault packs on the ground and pulled out a sleeping bag, using their packs as pillows. The platoon was able to rest and readied for the following day when the last watch woke up the platoon. It was still early in the morning, and the sun had yet to rise, but they put on their damp BDUs and lined up with their squad at the gate, which was now open. At the base of the trail that led to the upper shelf was flanked by two shacks, as each person approached, they scanned their military ID and received 180 rounds of simunition that came in thin, biodegradable boxes, which the platoon took the time to load into their magazines before entering the next area. What happened last night? Cam asked. I'm fairly certain you got hit by a sim IED, Jay replied with a laugh. It was unexpected, but I carried you on my shoulders for almost half a mile. I am so sorry he said with sudden realization and regret, but in a light-hearted tone. Ha ha, it's good, man. Talk about a leg workout, though, he said, rubbing his thighs. The squads convened and generated plans for the next area. There was a display just before the trail to the upper shelf. It was a map that depicted the combat area with topographical lines and pixelated overhead shots of buildings and roads. Moran of the first squad was the first to speak. Listen here, 
he ordered, calling attention to the display. He pointed to a set of buildings down the road from their entrance, with a road leading diverting to the left and right. From the information we got from this display, this will be the first time we go against others from another company. We're not to fire upon our brothers in yellow, and we're expected to meet them at the top. He relinquished control and passed it to Spears, leader of the third squad. This will also be the first time we go against the third combat element. They are apparently some type of automaton that is susceptible to sim rounds and are known to also patrol the roads and compounds of the upper shelf. He pointed to the map and noted that much of it was not very steep. However, the side opposite the compound had a steep hill that spread from left to right, forcing the roads to follow. Beyond it was a field of sparse buildings and trenches. The area was a mix of brown and green, indicating that it was a muddied field of combat. Parts of the shelf were also laden with forest areas, some denser than others. The sand was also closer to the left part of the shelf, and they were glad their route wouldn't take them there. Spears trailed his hand on the path that led to the first compound and then to the road that led right, leading to a smaller compound with a straight road and another to the left. He took a left and stated that they would continue this path and would inevitably take the path of the trenches because beyond it was a series of hills that sat near their next and final entry. That was their most direct path. Countless other paths were littered about that led to smaller buildings and vantage points. This discretion was granted to the squad leaders, and they set off with their squads when everyone was done loading their magazines. Moran and Gale's squads were the first to take the trail, followed by Spears and Collins' squads. When they reached the main road, each person loaded their first mag and entered a tactical column. When they reached about 500 meters from the previously mentioned compound, they split into fire teams, and Jay found himself with Cam, Fields, and Soren. They progressed in a wedge to the compound with Soren in the front, Fields and Cam on the sides, and Jay at the rear. The area before them allowed for multiple fire teams to spread out and apply different formations depending on the terrain. Their area was sparse with trees and bushes, but they progressed to the first compound. When they reached the edge of their tree line, they observed the roads and the buildings at the junction. Using his rifle scope, he noticed thinly framed mechanic bodies with rifles as they patrolled the roads. The sun was cresting the horizon, and their frames reflected the light. Jay's fire team and two others organized a strike on the right flank as the group was leaving the compound and did so to get the other teams to flank on the left. Jay's group fired when they were free from cover, and after a couple of seconds, the enemy fired back. Shots started coming from the buildings in their direction, and one of the teams directed their fire into the buildings, grabbing their attention. Gunshots towards them ceased, but it continued in the town. They took this time to systematically advance by alternating fire teams forward, enabling a fire team rush. By the time the perimeter teams entered the town, the fighting had ceased, leaving control to Jay's platoon. It wasn't long until their platoon gained control and cleared the buildings. The only items present were a modicum of sim rounds passed around to those who were low, and they refilled their magazines to full. They continued on the route previously mentioned, and continued in a dispersed fashion with their fire teams. The road to their next destination was approximately six miles when they encountered a disturbance half a mile out from the buildings on their route. They stayed low and moved closer to the point of interest while using their environment as cover. As Jay drew close, he could hear laughing coming from the nearby buildings. He peeked around a corner and saw several surrounding one of the bots. What do you think will happen to us if we break it? One asked with a blue band around his and his ally's arms. I don't know, another said, firing an extra shot into it. It should still work, maybe. Jay motioned to his team about the enemy, and intel was then silently passed to nearby fire team leaders. When given the order, he fired into the closest one, who still brandished his rifle at the robot, and his team followed suit. Chaos erupted, and the rest of their team came to their aid, but their blue allies were already neutralized. Their rivals were then blindsided by the rest of Jay's platoon that enveloped the small compound, and they shot the survivors in the chest, giving his platoon a six-hour head start for the next objective. They made it known that they were not to take from their enemy, even if it wasn't explicitly mentioned whether it was right or not. They continued on the trail toward the fields and found themselves at the edge with some buildings they had cleared. The buildings were dilapidated and offered concealed surveillance on the field, the road they took to the field ended at the buildings, 
and the field was encased in a valley of hills to their east and west. The road on the map from before had continued on the other side, and the field was a mix of shallow trenches, craters, and barbed wire barriers. What do you see, Jay? Gale said from the stairs to the second story of a building Jay peered from using his rifle scope. The field is our only direct option, but I think the enemy is digging in on the other end. Looks like there was a route that leads to that end from the west. I'll see if we can't flank them, said Gale, and retreated to the rest of the group. They split off the fourth squad that took the route south, steering clear of the compound they defeated and making their way westward. The rest of the platoon set up a rear-facing defense in the buildings overlooking the field. They would wait until the first shadow was cast over the field before they began their assault. The enemy on the other side of the field refused to move, and soon the shadows began to cast over the mountain. The sun rested behind the hill south of the field, and a couple of fire teams used that to help them creep along the field toward the other end. The darker it got, the harder it was for them to see. Just as the sun dipped below the horizon, shots erupted on the other end, which was their mark. Those not vital to the rear defense pulled away and joined the rush charge to the other end of the field, exchanging fire with those who still held an angle on Jay's platoon advance. They tried firing into the field, but ended up hitting a couple of their squad mates, but Jay's fire team, and one other, made a successful right-flanking maneuver and fired into the prone gunner. The rest of the platoon, those who could fight, caught up to their rivals and began a sweep of the weakly dug foxholes. The total force consisted of purple band recruits. Their squad mates carried those from their platoon that were hit to the gate that led to the final area. When they crested a hill that led to the gate, they were met with a series of paths that seemingly led through toward the next entry. Those with full fire teams spread out on the trails in fire team columns and actively scanned the terrain. They slowly crept forward and paused at every suspicious sound. Some fire teams would come across an enemy team, and they were fired upon when it was made known that they were not part of Hotel Company. The hills they occupied close to the second checkpoint were a war zone, and Jay's platoon solidified their tactics. They recovered all from the engagements, and when they were clear of combat, pressed forward to the gate. Their secondary advance on the hills improved when it was noticed that many of the groups they found were nothing but fire teams or scouts, at least only those who got close enough. After several more minutes of walking, their platoon reached the gate and secured a clearing that overlooked the area entrance. They took their collapsible shovel and dug foxholes of their own and split into teams of two. One would dig, and the other would hold an arc of fire. This is how they organized their foxholes, with overlapping fields of view in a wide area. They did this to maintain control of the gate and to make way to gather the rest of their company. Jay, you got any spare snacks? Cam asked as he continued to dig his hole. Maybe. What's in it for me? replied Jay as he faced outward of his foxhole with his rifle. The kindness of your heart will make the day of an individual, he said with a straight face. Then no, Jay replied curtly. Come on, all this digging is using too much work for such little food, Cam continued to complain. To stop him, Jay tossed him some jalapeno cheese topping. You owe me, to which Cam graciously accepted and finished digging his hole for Jay to continue on his. They had less time to sleep, and Jay took the first watch while Cam slept in his shallow hole. Jay was woken up by the sounds of gunfire that erupted near the gate, and two platoons fought each other. The light from the gate illuminated several soldiers, revealing they had yellow bands, and Cam was seen firing into the group that attacked further on the road, as did others in his troop. Spears called out to the group on the defense, Hey! What platoon are you from, or we shoot you too? There was a pause, and a strained yell came from the nearest recruit. 21! 63! We're 21! 61! We're here to help! His squad fired on the rival group who were now on the defensive, when they were routed by Moran's squad from the west and retreated to beyond the field of trenches. They didn't fire on those trying to carry their friends out, but they kept a watchful eye on them and their surroundings, as the sun was starting to break on the horizon. The squad leaders spoke with each other, and agreed that since they were of the same company, they would progress up the mountain when the gates opened, which, from the timer, was only fifteen minutes from now. Platoon 2161 and 2163 held their arc of fire until the gates opened, and when they did, those that were wounded were carried first up the mountain in stretchers that 2163 procured from one of their compounds. 
The rest of the platoons filtered through the gate, starting with the outermost teams until all started their climb. The platoon was wary, and since they were the first, they relaxed from the thought of an ambush, but they still kept their eyes peeled. As luck would have it, as soon as their alertness lulled, a crack of gunfire erupted from the forest to their right. Contact right! shouted the first to notice them. The platoons turned right and went prone, simultaneously firing into the wilderness. This was another common tactic when on patrol in a column. The sun filtered through the brush and trees, and the recruits shot at what shined back until the last of it went dark, and flashes of the enemy's rifles ceased. A team advanced and verified that the bots were the culprits of the ambush, and were down for the count. Tensions were heightened, and they continued their climb in silence. They continued to look behind them whenever the trail was more than a bend for the other group. The fear of them catching up prompted them to quicken the pace, and with some of the previously wounded having their tranquilizer effects wear off. They lessened the burden greatly from their carriers, and the overall pace of the mixed platoon grew. A cry of joy erupted from one of the members in the front, and those in the front began to run. Jay, Cam, and the others caught up. They too shouted in joy. They had finally entered the armistice zone, and combat was now prohibited beyond this point. Jay continued, sweat dampening his freshly dried uniform and undersuit as he ran ahead with Cam in tow. Jay and the others finally crested the hill to a leveled clearing, and a landing zone was present on the far edge of the area. Spots for golf, hotel, and India Company were set up with decorations of flags from the Terran Republic and the orbital drop raiders. They had made it to the peak, and tears were shed upon their realization. They had passed their test. They were now raiders. Gunnery Sergeant Slaughter. Report. The latest group of recently graduated raiders had finally made their way up the mountain and were successful in their mission with as little guidance as legally required under the ODR training doctrine. They'll be ready for tasking in ten days, and they have already gotten orders for their commands to the latest front. On a side note, I have shared some names that I feel would be good candidates for the TRU program. Most notably, J, for his past experience as a pilot. I have also listed names for the sake of squad cohesion. Private Kurt J. Private First Class Caden Spears. Private Camille Cameron. Private First Class Cody Gale. But as is tradition, they will be tasked to a combat ready unit in the 4th Battalion. I recommend they do their first drop with Cobra Company. They're easy on the new guys, but they're also not green. Then we can see about getting them into the program. Recipient General Brooke, General of the ODR. Salian Outer Colony Verbus System Tola, 2668. Worker Gruda. Gruda pulled off his work aboard a crop harvester and sat on the side of it, peering out into the horizon as he brought out his lunch and personal tablet. He ate a breaded meal with vegetation, artificially concocted meats in the center, and a drink brewed from mildly stimulating beans. Gruda worked the fields and was currently harvesting wheat crops for the local processing plant. He was one of the few working within a few square miles, as his section recently lost some workers due to personal issues arising from the core worlds, so they were finding it difficult to fill the positions. Just about halfway done and I'll be done for the day, he said, taking another bite and loading the latest in Cellian News. There were reports in the Lassus system of automated worker drones going haywire, killing several pedestrians at Lassu Station. The article made his stomach rise, and he felt uneasy as he read the developing story. He was glad he worked with a relatively low-tech vehicle. It was simple to work on and use and didn't utilize many wireless systems the more advanced companies used. He was an avid browser of forums online about space and would read numerous articles about the Terrans. He was always skeptical of propaganda from the Council whenever they issued live broadcast statements. The latest one, however, didn't stick right with him. The Council issued numerous statements about a growing threat from their outermost colonies, his colony included. Since he was young, he was always reserved about fighting for extermination, as said in a previous statement sometime last year. When an alarm rang, he continued his work in the harvester until night fell, and he returned his work belongings. Gruda lived far from the town in a modest home in the hills. When night fell, only the moon illuminated the sky. His night routine was minor. He bathed, ate, and read on the forums. He led a simple life and went to bed. 
When he awoke, his tablet was blowing up with notifications. It was, was early morning, and he had roughly two hours before work, but he pressed one such item when the screen changed to a static-filled video from a bird's-eye view. The image was clear enough to differentiate the characters in the background. But it showed hundreds of Selian troopers rounding up people he was unfamiliar with into large cargo ships before taking off. Others that looked too old or sick were shot and left to rot where they stood. He knew many of those ships with the brand of chains apparent on the side of the hull. They were slaver ships. Slaving? By Selians? He said to himself, but that's impossible. Selians weren't known for slaving as they were one of the few to outlaw it among their own people. The only race he knew to be virulent slavers were the Tosca, a race of bipeds like the Selians but were stockier with bellies of fat. They were covered in hair and had tusks extending from the outer part of their mouth and they always stunk. Gruta had some encounters with them back when he worked in the larger space stations of Trill and Lasu. They also lived near their border with the Galactic Union, but mainly operated as individuals instead of a group. They had a history of working for the military, taking what slaves they procured and placing them on the market of their guild. To think this was being done by our own troops, our council? He tried to call his work on the developments, but found his call being dropped at the first ring. He tried to notify his family and friends and found no transmission could send. Worriedly, he got into his personal vehicle and drove towards the town. It had a small cab for three and a flat bed in the back for items or small cargo. The crowds filled the streets with confused bystanders, each asking themselves the same questions. Gruta made his way to his work where members began to convene. Many just woke up and came to the work office with nothing but their sleepwear. My device was blowing up, then when I opened them, I came straight here, one said, followed by another. I tried calling a friend from Lasu, but nothing went through. Are the relays under repair? What is the military doing? Gruta asked the group. He knew Verbus was a staging system for their ships, and the planet they resided on, Tola, was a well-known military planet. Much of their communications were also routed through them, so they were primarily responsible for its maintenance. A display on the wall had come to life in the main office, and a disembodied voice spoke in broken Selian until it eventually gained clarity. The image on the screen was just a cluster of dots and squares in a circle that reacted to the voice. I am Athene. Your communications are under my control, and your navy has been destroyed. Surrender or become collateral. There was austere silence among the crew. Some left immediately to their homes, and the rest stayed behind with the now blank monitor. There's no way the Navy was defeated, right? One remaining member asked. And was that Selian? This has to be a joke, right? I don't know, but I have a sneaking suspicion the Council had something to do with this, Gruta responded. The messages on his device ceased a while ago, but one more message appeared on the tablet. The same happened to those nearby, and they all played the message that they had received. Instead of a disembodied voice or recirculating footage from earlier, it was a live feed. The person on the screen looked similar to them, but their eyes were small. The areas around their eye were white, and their iris was colored amber. Their skin was lightly tanned, and wrinkles were apparent, and he had small, rounded ears. He wore a small cap with the symbol of a wreath, a spread bird with a star at the top that shone with a silver luster. Attention, citizens of Tola. I am Vice Admiral Wolf, commander of the fleet that has subdued your navy and ordered your communications to be shut down. All non-military residents are advised to return to their homes and remain indoors. The voice spoke in an accent they never heard before. It sounded similar to their own spoken tongue but as a supplement, subtitles in Selly and Common were displayed. Many did as advised and returned to their homes. Gruta took his vehicle, and as he drove through the town, chaos erupted, and all who walked the streets rushed to their homes, while others took it as a chance to loot from the local stores. Local authorities tried to curb the chaos, but failed to contain it on a large scale. When Gruta made it to his house, he took what magnifying optics he had and waited outside his home. The sun had begun to make its way into the sky, giving color to the once monotone palette of the night. He was then met with a grand display of large hills filled with tall flowing grass that wafted to the breeze of the wind. He looked to his right within a clearing and a large device pointed to the sky blinked a red light at six second intervals. It was their local ground to space relay and a local military outpost surrounded it. 
He looked to the skies and found no evidence of battles flashing above him. He waited, as did all the denizens of the nearby town when plumes of smoke arose from the city, but all Gruta could do was watch. The man in the video looked like the people in the video from earlier in the morning board the Tosca slave ships. If the council employed them, their people were paying for it in wrath. As he peered into the sky, he heard a high-pitched hum and tried to search for the source. He looked at what he thought was the source, but only saw the sky. Then, with a sudden boom and a plume of smoke, the area surrounding the relay was attacked, and he finally saw the ships that did it. They were large, with wings like that of a bird, but they were fast in the sky and left just as quickly as they showed up. As quickly as they appeared, a new series of ships showed up, its design vastly different from the one that flew by prior. Instead of the aerodynamic frame of the bombers, they were slightly smaller with a blocky look to them. Instead of wings, they sported variable square-mounted thrusters. He took photos as they passed, but came out blurry with only the basic silhouette. They descended on the compound before disappearing behind the buildings, and faint sounds of sharp cracks filled the air. During this time, he took video of just before the ships landed, and when the sounds of gunshots erupted. As he was filming, large ships descended from the sky and moved to areas beyond his vision, as one parked itself above the town. The buildings were modest in size, and none reached the sky like many core worlds with the metropolitan cities. Its imposing frame hung above with a black finish and white stripes that ran down the side. Characters were written on the side, but he knew not what they meant. It looked like a predator with its maw agape, and fear took him. No wonder to the Navy lost. He began to laugh hysterically. What did they do to anger such a foe? He knew the answer to that question, hoping for someone to answer. Not only that, but he then saw ships descend from the beast into what he remembered to be the main square. He got in his vehicle and drove to town. He was met with crowded streets and many on-top buildings and vehicles in the direction of where the ships landed. The local authorities barricaded the square in a firing line, trying to keep the citizens away and setting their sights on the square with their hand-held firearms. The ships had already landed when Gruda began going on foot. It took him several minutes to push his way through to where the authorities were pushing back citizens. They separated the crowd and the firing line with barricades and their vehicles. The ships that had landed had their noses tapered to a point as if intentional like a display. A small gun was mounted beneath the nose of the ship that swiveled left and right in a 180-degree arc. The sides of the ships were open, and two people in green and full-faced helmets with a reflective visor mounted a gun on either side of the aircraft's side doors. Dozens of soldiers with rifles, sleek in design with a silver top frame and black underbelly, made their way in a circular formation of the craft, covering all angles. They donned green armor similar to the door gunners, but unlike their infantry forces, they covered the entirety of the body. Their helmet was open-faced, however, and some wore colored glasses around their eyes, with their pauldrons and gauntlets contoured to their respective anatomy. The same went for their legs. Their greaves were slim and offered protection in their entirety, as did the chest. It exemplified their figure and made them out as hulking warriors compared to the authorities before them. Gruda felt that the small arms of the police would do nil against their armor and saw it as futile. When most of the commotion was settled, a man donning a gray suit with dark blue accents walked to the group center, flanked by two soldiers. Their rifles rested across their chests, but they gripped the weapon with a stance ready to take the life of any who opposed. Attention, citizens of Tola, he spoke, a device in hand that projected his voice from the ships behind him. I am Commander Randall, and we come in peace with no intention to harm the innocent citizens of your world. We have struck only the military infrastructure of this planet and wish no further harm on the citizens. When he paused, screams and yells from the crowd surfaced. They called for the retribution of the soldiers thought to have been slaughtered, but the man, Randall, pulled up a video on a portable display. It was a video of the soldiers from the bases that had been attacked, placed in a formation on their knees and their hands over their heads. Another view from a ship's hangar showed the survivors from life pods detained in similar fashion. They had taken prisoners on both fronts but Gruta felt they would execute them live, but they didn't. My people are willing to extend a hand of diplomacy to your race, unlike what your leaders extended to us. We ask that they answer for their crimes against humanity. Now may I speak to your leader? What do they think an outer colony like us can influence? We grow food and mine resources. 
Gruta thought to himself. It was a thought most likely shared between the others present, since all they did with most of their lives was farm. But something within Gruta urged him forward. Randall grew visibly irritated when no one presented themselves, and tensions rose among the police with their weapons. He knew the planet's governor was a coward and his office was part of the local town, but not revealing himself frustrated the enemy. Such an action could result in them turning on their word and firing into the masses, something he would want to avoid at all costs. Gruta was non-confrontational and he liked to keep it that way. Military? He did well to avoid re-enlistment, even with the propaganda from Councilman Polis and his grand speeches flooding his tablet. The only way for him to be relatively safe was to find a home and work in an outer colony away from the Union and the core worlds. He found a break in the distracted line of police and made his way before the man and soldiers. The two trained their rifles on him and he stopped short of the steps with his hands in the air. The crowd objected to him being before the invaders. Gruda, what are you thinking? He heard a call from behind the line. It was a co-worker that he had exchanged brief interactions with but he pulled a hand up to quell their cries and returned to the man before him. He took a large breath, unknown of what fate would bring him, but resolved himself in the face of a terrifying enemy in place of a cowering governor. He had wanted to be alone, but found that it might not be possible. Whatever the council commanded, he sought to correct it. He only needed a push. I am Gruda, former war chief commander of the War Council of Celia. To Vice Admiral Wolf, report. Good afternoon, sir. The ground occupation of the so-called Tola of the Verbis system has succeeded. The Athene Protocol provided generous intel on the military installations to target and hijacking their civilian and military networks. We began with videos of their deeds to their people, contrasting the propaganda the War Council put forth. She has also created disruptions in other parts of their outer colonies, sowing fear and distrust in their government. To add, we have come in contact with someone who claims to have been a prominent figure in their military, and he is aboard for questioning. He claims not to be the governor, but has instead stepped in his place for diplomacy. Very respectively, from Commander Randall, end of report. TRSC, Sword of Reckoning, Verba System, Orbit of Tola, 2668. Gruda, former War Chief Commander. Gruta sat at a long table fit for 18 people with a single chair at the ends and eight that ran the length of the table. He wasn't bound with chains, but instead was seated in a chair near the head of the table. The table was within a room about quadruple its size with guards placed at the corners. A single entrance was placed at the far end of the room opposite where he sat. He was nervous as the guards present were utterly different from the ones he rode with from the city. They wore black-colored armor with a blotted gray-black pattern on the cloth beneath, with a helmet that shone his reflection in a dark purple hue. He also noted that their shoulders bore a contrast of white, unknown to their purpose. Their weapons were compact, with a large barrel on the end that seemed too large for a standard weapon. Moreover, it differed from the rifles of the green soldiers on the way up with the skinny barrel he was familiar with. That combined with their still composure and silence, unnerved him. His unease was relieved when the door opened. Commander Randall entered, followed by another soldier similar to those in the room, but bore gold on his shoulder and markings on his armor that said he was no stranger to combat, and perhaps thought the character in question reveled in it. Then several more characters entered, each in matching gray and dark blue attire, some with stacks of ribbons on their left and some with only a few. They all took their seats, leaving the end chair beside him empty. Attention on deck, Randall commanded those words as a person entered the door, and everyone jumped up from their seats with their legs together and their hands to their sides. The exception was the guards on duty with their hands around the grip and the grip near the front of the weapon. At ease, the man in question replied. He had graying hair, but the color of amber was still present, and years of age were showing upon his face. That man took his seat beside him at the head of the table. He was surrounded by beings much taller than him, standing at least ahead and some over him. Then let's begin, spoke Randall. He introduced the people in the room, all the heads of their departments, operations, weapons, tactical security, raider, etc. All were departments related to combat. When it came to Gruda's turn, he stood struggling to find the words to speak. I am Gruda, he started. Field worker on Tola and former war chief commander under the War Council of Sala, a hand was raised from a woman in charge of ops. 
What exactly is the ranking structure of your people, and where does a war chief commander stand? He knew they were trying to probe him, but was hesitant to reveal their structure. The woman continued, I apologize if it seems probing, so I can give you a rundown of our ranking structure. She gave a simple breakdown of enlisted and officer and how they varied from branch to branch and tried to streamline for their guest, detailing the differing and responsibilities up and down the chain. He felt relieved and prefaced his explanation with some guarantees. Fine, I can reveal that to you, but I need assurance. To which they nodded, along with the man that sit beside him. What do you plan to do with the non-combative populace? I need to know you will not needlessly slaughter my people who do not deserve it, he said, awaiting a response that felt like ages when the man beside him spoke. Do not worry, Wolf spoke. I, as Vice Admiral of this battle group, solemnly swear no intentional harm will come to those of non-combat roles. It is against our laws, if that serves as any consolation. It did its job, and his words felt sincere. Gruta began, I have seen what my military has done to your people, and it sickens me they would reduce themselves to such dishonorable tactics. But back to the topic. There are few ranks before the first rank of someone in leadership, which is the title of war chief. This title belongs to someone in charge of a small group, such as one large ship accompanied by fighters. Next would be a chief captain, one in charge of a medium-sized accompaniment of large war vessels and fighters. And the final would be a war chief commander, a title usually reserved for those who would lead the larger groups of vessels to combat or a smaller, more specialized group. He noticed they were taking notes when he trailed off to a pause. He waited until they were done before continuing. However, there is one more above that which is commanding the largest fleets, a war chief general. Its title is only bestowed upon a war chief most suited to command an invasion force. Whether they are a promising newly promoted war chief or an experienced chief commander, it matters not. Only the War Council of Celia can grant such a title. Even a war chief can be granted the title of chief general? Asked Randall, to which Gruta nodded. Yes, although it is rare. But I know only of one the War Council would appoint to lead their invasion force, War Chief Torlak. The group looked at each other with another from tactical inquiring. So you're saying the lowest ranked War Chief was granted the title of Chief General, and they weren't a captain or commander? Gruda nodded again. I have known Torlak for many cycles in the Selian fleet. He has turned down promotions to captain and commander, but a promotion to general is irrefutable. In essence, he was forcibly promoted by the council. And who exactly is the council? Spoke the armored soldier with gold markings, introduced as First Lieutenant O'Brien. They are the governing body of all Selians. We are a militarily focused species that has excelled in space combat against the Galactic Union, but lack in the grounds department. I know not of how troops are trained in current times. More signs of confusion arose, and questions concerning the Council and the Union were now heavily inquired, but the Vice Admiral silenced them, urging the anxious Gruta to continue. Let me start off with the War Council. They comprise five bodies, the Logistics Councilman Breka, the Diplomat Gollum, the Military Advisor Reka, and the Council's voice Polis. The final is the Head Councilman, and the final word on all matters, Callum. They are the current War Council and are most likely responsible for the decision to invade your species. The room was quiet when Wolf raised a hand to speak. What is your relation to the Council, and why did you feel it necessary to step in for the governing body of Tola? Gruta hung his head in shame but spoke. I am quite old, although I look young. After our fight with the Galactic Union twenty cycles ago, I ended my service. However, Councilman Polis has issued numerous speeches denouncing your race for nonsensical reasons. Therefore, I cannot sit back and watch as they continue a needless battle against a fellow spacefaring species, especially when they are not of the Union. He spoke their name with disdain, as it was noticed by many in the room. Then what can you tell us about the Galactic Union? O'Brien inquired, his stare piercing Gruta and his scars fueling an innate fear. Gruta gulped. They are a vast collection of races on the other side of Selian space, he paused. Their composition is made up of races that pride themselves in conquering savage races and using them for their ground troops. The room was silent. Notes were taken and soft words were spoken between themselves. What do you mean? inquired Randall. 
You mean they enslave other races and use them for combat? He nodded. We didn't spend much time with them, just several hundred cycles, but they were keen to enslave races that are adept in combat. They usually enslave those kinds early on before they reach space. They met us when we were already spacefaring and our fleets were large enough to dissuade their advances. So for a time, the people of Sela once worked with the Union. They analyzed Gruta with what seemed like intense scrutiny. He found it better to reveal what he knew about the Union, as little as it seemed to him. He continued, It doesn't make sense, but when you have a collection of races that look at anything bigger than them as a threat, they will actively look for ways to subdue them. He sat back down, letting his exposition marinate. Athena, Wolf spoke into the air, and a disembodied voice replied, their figure hidden. Is what he says true? With my recent data rendezvous with my subroutine, I can say that what the Honorable Mr. Gruda says is truthful. Wolf turned to him. How would you like to work for us? I can't guarantee your personal safety, but if you have any family, we can work to remove them from the battlefield to a safe location. What do you say? Gruda pondered his words. He thought of his parents, who have long passed. His aunts and uncles were nothing but estranged, but he landed on individuals who he hadn't seen in a long time and wished for nothing than their safety. I have a younger sister, but she lives in our cradle world, Sela. She and her children live on the outskirts of the capital of Artre. I can provide coordinates if that helps. It does. We'll take them into our custody until our fight with Sela has concluded. Wolf assured when a message came from Lumi, the ship-born AI came before Wolf and the commander. Commander, Vice Admiral, we detect Selian naval vessels inbound. Enemy vessels number a small group led by a chief captain. Quite bold, quite bold. Do we have ships en route? replied Randall. We do. Magnetic accelerators are primed, and broadside cannons are loaded, awaiting enemy approach. Hail them to stand down. If they refuse, take them out. We'll do, we'll do she said with a bounce at every tone. W w what was that? Gruda inquired. A uh, personal assistant, Wolf said in a cold tone, to which Gruda nodded. Whatever it was, they didn't want to reveal too much about it, and he was okay with it. What do you plan to do with the incoming fleet? Gruda asked worriedly. Disable them and have them surrender. But if it comes down to it, we must annihilate them, replied Randall as the table began their departure to their station. Gruda thought of the implication of teeming with who was supposed to be his enemy. He had heard the broadcast before and knew what Polis was trying to do, but his time on the forums and working a quiet life has led him to believe that what the Council is doing is wrong, with the footage of what his people were doing to innocent civilians was too much for him to bear. His sister has children, and he would want nothing more than their safety. To do the same with a species they had just met and their initial reaction is to enslave? That makes them no better than the Union. He followed Wolf and Randall to the bridge, which he was granted access to under strict supervision. They viewed the system, and he noticed the blue dots around the planet in their own groups. They were on an intercept course of the Salon ships now traveling sublight to Tola. Sir, we've isolated all intersystem transmissions. All they have to speak to are themselves and us, one crewman reported. Gruta noticed the overall atmosphere of the bridge. It was serious and focused. He had been on many ships and remembered that his crew would only maintain such expressions if they were numerically superior. As soon as they started taking heavy losses, they would buckle and mistakes would be made, at least among their newest members. Even though the display said they were at a numerical disadvantage, they held their bearing and diligently completed their tasks, which was jarring for Gruda. Officers! Officers! Enemy exiting sublight! Hailing! Lumi appeared on the hollow table as her simple form bounced from side to side. Hallie answered. Destruction averted. Hooray, said the overjoyous artificial intelligence referring to the delayed destruction of the Selian fleet. As they popped out of their intrasystem travel mode, they were flanked by a series of Terran ships, their cannons pointed at all available Salon targets. The comms officer then reported that a line was opened with the leader of the small battle group. I am Chief Captain DeLogan. You hail us over an occupied planet. What do you want? He said in an irritated tone. We have come because we have received a message that you might be here. Wolf was the first to step forward to the screen behind us with DeLogan's visage in full display. I would recommend you do nothing brash. It would only result in your destruction. Then what do you want of us? Returned DeLogan. 
Surrender yourself and your ships and no harm will come to you or your crew, Wolf said, offering the ultimatum. Dalagon thought for a moment and replied, You much know that I cannot do that. It would be dishonorable among my troops. Meanwhile, analysts and comms officers said they already had targets lined up and had isolated their flagship. Enemy fighters also began to launch from their ships, but the Terrans foresaw this and already began countermeasures. How unfortunate. Then may the best fleet win. The call was cut, and Wolf began issuing orders that would ultimately spell destruction for their enemy. Athena, is your subroutine linked to their ships? Her form popped up beside the turquoise-colored oval Lumi. She looked like the Terrans, but sported vastly different clothing in an ancient sense, since about six months ago. Disable their shields and malfunction their fighters, she replied with an elegant bow, and not soon after reports came in of the fighters losing power to their engines. Some would have their shields overload, resulting in an unfortunate death. The Terran ships fired their cannons mixed with automated turret fire and missiles. The shields were non-existent, and their fighters were taking heavy losses. In short, it was a slaughter. The Selian fleet comprised several cruisers, frigates, and battleships. They were all equipped with fighters, but they were quickly put out of commission. Wolf ordered boarding parties for the flagship of Dalagon, and a ship equipped for such a function was launched. The battle continued to rage, with the guns from the Selian ships firing into the Terrans. Their shots would connect with their hull, but their impacts were light compared to the pure destructive power from the cannons of the Terrans. From what Gruta could tell, the Terrans have a destructive yield unseen in Selian ships to date. There was footage of a volley from one of the heavy battleships that pierced a Selian hull, and it began to melt with sparks emitting from the entry. Then Gruta saw large molten metal and technology vent into the void with the flames still sticking to surfaces. Ooh, what is that? Gruta exclaimed. The good old Afenant round, also known as the Dragon's Wrath. Truly devastating, Wolf said with pride. Whatever prompted your species to create something so devastating? Gruta inquired. I can answer that. Lumi reappeared and bobbed as she spoke. For centuries, humanity has created all sorts of ammunition to fell their enemies. This began with the advent of the tank in the 20th century during one of their bloodiest conflicts. Millions of their own. Dead. Is that true? He looked to Wolf and the crew, who only nodded in response. So what do you do to overcome that armor? You make ammo that has different effects to slaughter your enemy. She bobbed joyfully. We had rounds to blow up armor to send shrapnel flying from the armor, to ricochet inside at high speeds, to light aflame the interior. We have crafted special ways to destroy our enemies, born to fight, born to kill. Why would you do such a thing? Gruta said, almost regretfully. And what even round is that? Instead of Lumi, Athena took her place, motioning her to calm down. Humanity has always found ways to improve their art of war, from technology to tactics. My creators have long been separated in values and beliefs, and it was instinctual always to overcome your enemy. If your adversary had improved armor, you would develop a round to pierce their armor and quickly dispatch the occupants or wearer. The same is true even for space. To damage enemy hulls, you can either blow it apart bit by bit or melt it. Mmm, melt? Gruda stuttered. That can't be legal, would it? You would be right. The Afentian T round is a banned munition by the TRSC, but when involved with xenobiology that seeks your destruction, well, restrictions were lifted. Perhaps when this is over, they will file a binding resolution to reban the use of the Dragon's Wrath, as they like to call it. Gruda was dumbfounded. For a race that seeks better ways to destroy your opponent is savage, but then again they were civil about it. Banning specific weapons in the name of civility. It was madness the more he thought about it, but the more he thought of the Union, well, he almost felt sorry for them. What does AFENT even stand for? Gruta asked meekly. It is an armor-piercing, high-explosive napalm thermite round, a new development that was banned as soon as it was created upon successful testing, replied Athena. His head spun at the notion. Napalm and thermite were words foreign to him, and his translator could not translate them into suitable references. Should I even ask what napalm and thermite are? My translator seems unable to parse it. She looked to the vice admiral as well as the commander for permission, but before she could, Lumi jumped in. Sticky fire, melty fire. She flew around before dissipating. 
Essentially, Athena conceded, simply put, it is another form of fire used in combat first developed in the 20th century, used for vastly different purposes that you would rather not be privy to. Gruta feared the type of warfare their ancestors fought if that one century alone birthed so many forms of destructive weapons. He found an open seat that was unoccupied to regain his bearing. Never had he or the Union experimented with weapons to kill each other. Has the Salians or the Union experimented with such technology? Wolf calmly inquired, to which he nodded negatively. Surprisingly, they haven't fought wars like you have, from what I hear. Instead, they have researched solely on space weapons, and I hear plasma will be the new standard. Then again, that was about five years ago, replied Gruda. Interesting, Wolf said, nearly inaudible to the weary Gruda. The battle was nearing its final stage, and all that was left was the flagship. A report came from the comms officer that a boarding party from Raptor Company was successful. Footage from several raiders popped up on the screen in an orderly fashion as they moved through the Selian interior. Their movements were smooth and fast. They went a large part of the way without firing a shot. But when they neared the bridge, they experienced their first resistance since entering the ship. Their shots were selective, and they maintained awareness to not fire on anyone designated as a threat. Their tactics were surreal and it was a first for him. He had not seen any developments in infantry tactics under the current military advisor, Reka. To think you were this well-versed in ground combat, Gruda muttered. As Athena and Lumi have said, we have developed the art of war since the dawn of our species, Wolf replied. This era will be no different, except now we have a common enemy. A report from the comms officer stated that O'Brien and his team had secured Delogon and that the crew had surrendered. A shame they hadn't done so earlier. Prepare a ship for the prisoners, Randall ordered of a crewman. They really should have taken your offer, sir. Ensure we get what additional intel we can from their ships, ordered Wolf before departing from the bridge with Gruda in tow. Randall nodded silently before turning back to the bridge crew. Let's go meet our new friend, shall we? Wolf said while Gruda silently nodded. Their entourage comprised the same black armored soldiers from the conference room prior. To Vice Admiral Wolf, report encrypted. TRSC Reapers approaches in stealth, and sensors indicate we are silent. Currently scouting through the Trill system en route to Sela. Athene subroutine is successfully masking our presence. A report of her cyber assault is attached. She's been doing some fine work. It might be about time to reel her in once Operation Spearhead commences. Have Athena proceed with a reintegration protocol. Beyond that, we have the coordinates and photo of the targets. Now entering radio silence. First Lieutenant O'Brien, end of report. Verbus System, Orbit of Tola, 2668. Gruda, former war chief commander. Wolf and Gruda walked the corridors of the carrier with purposeful steps and were flanked by their security. The crowded halls were parted as they walked and many eyes stared at him as they passed. They were unkind, no doubt resentful of his race for their actions. Crimes against humanity, they called it. Is it safe for me to be walking with you? He asked, struggling to maintain pace. They know better than to mess with the guest of an admiral, he smirked. And none would dare mess with my security. Don't worry, you're safest with me. Gruda nodded to his reassurance. He looked to the four guards that encircled them and found that many also looked to the armored soldiers with their weapons. So even they fear their own. Yikes, he thought. They made their way to the main hangar and a small shuttle awaited them. The area was clear, and only essential maintenance crew were allowed. The shuttle had a detachment of the green-armored marines on the perimeter of the shuttle. It was a small ship that could only fit six plus the pilot. They found their seats and were already on their way to Dalagan's ship. Their trip would take approximately several minutes. By the way, Gruda started, I've noticed how your AI spoke. The one who names herself Athena is professional while Lumi is erratic. Why is that? Wolf's face grew solemn. I've been the lead commander of the Seventh Fleet, of which you are now part of, and the Sword of Reckoning has been my home for several years. Lumi was a recent addition, and I was present during her installation. Wolf sighed and relaxed in his seat. She was programmed with a reserve personality and was cold and calculating, but that was all. It was all superficial and shallow. It was easy to think that a simple AI like Lumi has a genuine personality, when in reality she doesn't. 
What you see now is merely a pre-programmed routine, a sudden change in personality to identify onset rampancy in a controlled fashion. Wolf's words were reminiscent, like of a father speaking to his daughter in her last moments. I've already taken care of it. After the battle, her access was isolated by Athena. She is now nothing more than a verbal companion, he said with sorrowful eyes. I'm sorry I brought that up. It must be painful to lose someone you hold dear. Wolf chuckled mildly at the notion. You're fine. It's been roughly ten years since I met Lumi. It was only a matter of time before her termination protocol. It may be in poor taste, but we are currently awaiting her replacement, he said with a heavy heart, and his countenance was sorrowful. Gruta surmised that Lumi was like a surrogate daughter to Wolf. He then changed the topic to something other than Lumi. The raiders so far remained quiet even though they would look at one another and bob their heads as if in conversation. He figured that perhaps they were talking, but their external volume was muted, effectively keeping their conversations a secret. What do you plan to do with Dalogan and his crew? Gruta asked. You'll see when we get there. The ship rattled from entering the hangar and after landing. The rear door opened and the four raiders departed, ensuring their exit was clear. When Gruta and Wolf disembarked, they were met with lines of Selians in rows with their hands tied behind their backs while on their knees. Dozens of Marines paced with rifles while more were corralled from the doors leading into their hangar. While most had their heads down, several looked in his direction and spewed curses at him mixed with death glares. However, they were forcibly corrected by a nearby Marine who first ordered them to continue facing the ground, but those that didn't were met with the stock of their rifles. I is that necessary? beckoned a worried Gruta. To maintain some semblance of order, we first must show them who is the authority. They were told verbally and then physically corrected. We warned them in hopes of getting others to follow. No one wants to be assaulted if they can help it. Is it corrected to assume this is another aspect of your species? asked Gruta, to which Wolf nodded. They made their way to a makeshift platform near the center of the formations. Wolf asked the nearest Marine about the status of the rest of the crew, and was told that they were almost done with sweeping the ship. We have some time. Do you have any questions? Wolf asked. Just one, Gruda began. What's the difference between Lumi and Athena? Their forms are vastly different. Well, Lumi started off as a tactical class AI, and we have various uses for AI in our homes and cities. In short, they're simple. With no natural function to think for themselves, their personalities are pre-programmed, while Athena's is not. She can extrapolate from incomplete data and give suggestions to complete a task with a critical mind. As far as I know, she's the first and probably won't be the last. What about your race? Has your kind developed such technology? For AI? Gruta surmised. We don't like that technology. Sure, we program automated machines to do specific tasks, but that's all they do. We couldn't afford technology going rampant. Far too many instances of tragedies, both in Sela and the Union. That is fascinating, Gruta. My ancestors have utilized AI technology since the early 21st century. Now we have AI like Lumi and now Athena. They are a great help where humans may not be so needed. I suppose, but the first iterations for my people have scarred them, so anything more than just a utility bot would send them to an early grave, Gruta said dismissively. As the final groups were shuffled in and placed in the rear of the formations, the doors leading to them were sealed and secured. A Selian wearing the chief captain-colored scarf was brought to the front by raiders. Where are O'Brien and his team? Wolf asked one of the raiders. They departed shortly after securing the captain of the ship. They should be proceeding with Operation Spearhead. Wolf nodded. Very well. Carry on. Dalagon and his fellow bridge crew were placed in front of Wolf and Gruta with defeated expressions when Wolf addressed the hangar. Dalagon met the eyes of Gruta, and fury was present. You! What is a fellow Selen doing with the enemy? Free from binds, no less. Have you sold out your people? He berated Gruta while still bound, but that didn't stop others from looking toward his target of malice. Gruta tried to speak, but Wolf did so on his behalf. Portable speakers and holographic displays around the room carried his voice. Contrary to your war council, Gruta has sought the ways of diplomacy with his people and ours. I have extended the same courtesy to you and your fleet, which is now nothing more than space debris. I have spared your ship and your crew in goodwill. You have mercilessly destroyed all but us. How do I know that you won't execute us? Dalagon rebuked. 
Wolf then changed the view on the displays to the citizens of Tola and the service members of the bases scattered around the planet. We do our best to minimize civilian casualties if we can help it. We have families much like you do. How should we react when those very family members have been taken into slavery or just killed? He then showed the images taken from Dima and what they could pull from Draxus. The women and children were corralled into slaver ships, while the men, sickly and elderly, were slaughtered around them. His prisoners grimaced at the sights. How would it feel if my race were to commit the same to you willingly? Your sons, daughters, wives, and husbands. My race is not new to slavery, but we can resort to such tactics. N no You leave my children out of this! a female Cellian screamed. The nearest security quickly subdued her, but others voiced their concerns about their family while cursing the man before them. But their tone quickly changed when Wolf made a heartfelt rebuke of his own as it reverberated all throughout the hangar. Then how do you think we feel when the very thing you don't want to happen to your family has happened to us? His tone was now filled with anger and vitriol. What is stopping me from reducing your race to nothing but dust and echoes? Forgotten to memory? I have the very authority needed to glass every planet I come across. The crowd grew silent, not out of respect, but out of fear. We are not savages, and we strive to keep it that way. Do not force our hand, or I will make whatever crimes you consider abhorrent look like restaurant etiquette, and I will ensure all prisoners watch as your race dies, he said coldly, which is why I am asking you to help me help you. If you do not want your race to die, I suggest you develop ideas on preventing your extinction. Gruta felt his body shudder at his threats. From what he had already seen, they were not empty, and he feared they had more deadly weapons in their arsenal to back it up. Dalagon was the first to raise his head. If what you say is true, would you truly be willing to exterminate an entire race in retaliation? How new are you? Wolf replied bluntly. How recently have you been promoted? Just under a year with my own fleet, replied Dalagon. And how much do you know about your campaign against my people? returned Wolf demandingly. Dalagon gulped a large pack of saliva. I do not know. Only what Councilman Polis has said about your people and your intrusion on our borders. That is all. That is interesting, Dalagon, Wolf stated. Because you see, we were indiscriminately attacked, and there was no diplomacy attempt on your side, which means I'm not obligated by my command to extend a hand in friendship, something your general failed to do on Dima. He was at a loss for words in light of his ignorance. He swallowed again. Then I have a proposal, Dalagon began. Can you guarantee the safety of my crew and the innocent lives of my people? Wolf nodded in response. Then the chief general is only the hand of the war council. He cannot refuse their orders for the risk of losing his family. If you want our war to end, you must subdue the war council. Wolf pondered his words shortly before agreeing. I figured as much. Then I hereby agree to your terms. He stepped down from the stand along with Gruda, who stopped beside Dalagon and addressed the passing Selian. What is a fellow Selian doing with them? The Selian paused to his words. I do not know if you know this, but I am former Chief Commander Gruda. His eyes grew wide in disbelief. Gruda continued. I disagree with the fleet's acts against a sapient species. I have fought against the Union to free us from their practices, and we have lost many to their slavers. To think we would do the same he said before reaching the shuttle with Wolf and the four raiders. The ship rattled once more as they left the ship and returned to the carrier. What do you plan to do with them? asked Gruda. They are now prisoners of war and will be treated as such. They will be transported to a neutral facility for prisoners of war. So worry not, they will be treated well, replied Wolf. He was unsure how they would be treated, but Wolf explained that they would be held in a maximum security facility where they would abide by a strict schedule until the war's end. He was also told that the living conditions varied depending on the facility, but that they were now just prisoners and would have their health and diet looked after. They would also be separated based on anatomy, which was a relief for Gruda, but the term Red Cross was foreign to him. That's good. I take it your race is also familiar with extensive knowledge of prisoners. He nodded. Even in boot camps, such as the Raiders and Marines, simulate a prisoner of war type scenario, it's by law. You're allowed to write letters, but you abide by a strict schedule, have strict rations, etc. Your trainees go through that, Gruta voiced, concern apparent in the treatment of the former, 
In the event they get captured by the enemy, they are trained to respond to such an environment. But that is if they get captured. I don't know if you've already noticed, but we've been at this game since the dawn of our people. Gruta was at a loss for that new perspective. His training was short and consisted of weapons training and knowledge of their jobs, which were predetermined by a need in the fleet. Their average training cycles were only five weeks, and chuckles could be heard from one of the raiders who forgot to silence his helmet. W what's so funny? Gruta aggressively inquired, but more of the raiders were audibly laughing now, with one of them taking their helmets off. He had short black hair with faded sides and scars that ran the side of his face. We just find five weeks of military training laughable, he laughed again with his brothers. I find five weeks more than enough to train personnel for the fleets, Gruta said adamantly. Sir, stellar fleet training is around eight weeks. The guard is ten and the marines are thirteen. Want to know how long it is for a raider? Gruta shook his head to the sides. Twenty-four, he said, fist-bumping his nearest comrade. What compels you to train for so long? Gruta demanded, not knowing why flaunting how long one had to suffer for training was something to brag about. You can't give generalized training to all the branches, another raider said, calmer than the previous raider. Each branch is specialized for specific roles, and we train for such. Even in training, to graduate to be a new blood raider, you must fight your own and climb a mountain to claim the title. Oorah! The three others shouted in unison. The raider's helmet was now re-equipped, and he turned to Wolf, who nodded in support of his security detail. They're not wrong. Even we have our own problems and need to be ready for that. In training, they instill brotherhood and a desensitized mentality to do whatever it takes to destroy your enemy, at least for the infantry-based branches. Gruta grew more enlightened about how the Terrans operated their military and overall philosophy. He was confident that what Wolf said about raising their species to dust was just a scare tactic, but felt like they could do as he said, a thought that made him fear for the worst. Their shuttle finally returned to the carrier, and they returned to the bridge. The raiders took their place at the doors to the bridge while he and Wolf continued. Ah, sir, welcome back, said Randall. We've taken what we could of the survivors in the escape pods and surviving fighters into our care and will be sent to a Red Cross facility. Good. Any word from Raptor Squad? Their signature is stable and they are currently scouting the Trill system with the help of Athene, Randall said, but they are suggesting a reintegration protocol with the program. How should we proceed? Wolf called to Athena, who promptly revealed herself in her flowing toga and helm and breastplate. Athena, can you initiate a reintegration protocol with your subroutine? One moment, she said while her form displayed a sense of frozen time, her appearance unmoving. After what seemed like minutes, she finally broke free of her stasis. Pardon me, she started. Isolating my subroutine was simple with her cooperation, but I fear total reintegration will be impossible. What do you mean? Wolf pressed the AI for an answer. During her time away, my subroutine, Athene Protocol, has apparently developed a self-actualized personality of their own. There was a pause from the crew, and most notably from Wolf. Are you telling me your subroutine has developed their own entity? That is correct. Would you like to meet her? She asked. A nod of understanding was shared between Wolf and Randall with Gruda left in the dark. A secondary form appeared beside Athena. They looked identical, but the newly appeared hologram was absent of the armor her predecessor donned and only wore a decorative toga and a wreath atop her head. Her hands rested together in front of her waist in a reserved posture. Her eyes looked full of life but calculating. She gave a bow and her light blue form shimmered. Good afternoon, gentlemen, she began. I am subroutine Athene, daughter to my progenitor Athena. She bowed once more, this time with even more grace than before. A smile arose from Athena's face. My daughter has agreed to program isolation, and she is eager to integrate as part of your crew, if you'll allow for her. The thought now crossing his mind. So Wolf began. Our systems can allow for only so much AI support. What about Lumi? As soon as he spoke her name, she appeared. Now present on the hollow table were Lumi, Athene, and Athena. In contrast to the two reserved humanoid holograms, a turquoise oval with simplistic eyes danced around the table. He found his answer. Lumi is present, awaiting further orders. Wolf sighed with sorrow ever present. You've done a wonderful job, Lumi. Her erratic bouncing now slowed to a subtle bob. The air on the bridge was heavy and quiet. Work had slowed and all attention was on the hollow table. Only the hum of technology and air conditioning could be heard. 
Wonderful to have been of service, she said, her eyes mimicking joy and a slight bob from side to side. It has been my pleasure. It's been ten wonderful years since your first installation aboard this ship, and not a day goes by that I, we, don't thank you. He motioned to the crew, who had now turned their attention to the Admiral and the A.I. It's time for your retirement, Lumi. Her slight bob was now reduced to a stationary posture. Her demeanor was now what he was first met with. Her eyes gave a sense of security and sharpness, even though they were simple. Attention! The crew snapped to attention with the order, including Gruda. In accordance with Fleet Comm Order 1040P, you are now designated for retirement. Execute Protocol 1B4432L00MI. We congratulate you on your service. He rendered a salute and was followed by the rest of the crew. Her form was slowly dissipating and digitized chunks that corresponded to a percentage that was generated above Lumi's avatar. It was now at 58% and rising. They held their salute when at 90% Lumi spoke with seeming lucidity. Thank you, crew of the Republic. My family, it has been my pleasure to serve at your side. The deletion reached 100% and Lumi's form ceased, leaving only the humanoid pair. Retirement protocol complete. Lumi has been cleared of all systems and storages available for a replacement. How do you wish to proceed? inquired Athena. Wolf and the crew recovered from their salutes and relaxed at their stations. You are tied to Lieutenant O'Brien, correct, Athena? Correct. However, I do believe the answer to be quite obvious. Wolf understood her implication, but there was a protocol he had to follow for the issuance of advanced AI such as Athena. Let me talk this over with Fleetcom. In the meantime, hold tight until I get authorization from higher up. They nodded and he left the bridge, along with Randall, leaving Gruta alone. So he took a seat and kept to himself. The crewmen of the bridge were now busy at their stations, leaving Gruta with thoughts of the most recent procession. He felt like asking one of the crew about it would be too much, and he didn't feel like he was worthy to ask Athena or her counterpart. He approached the closest officer who managed navigation. Uh, sir? I have a question, he said meekly. The officer turned from his station to meet Gruda. What can I do you for? This might seem in poor taste with how recent it is, but why is there a whole retirement procession for a computer program? Gruda felt sudden hostility from the navigator, but told him that his people didn't have computerized intelligence as they did. The navigator sighed. At first, they seem shallow, like a mimicry of sorts. You don't expect to get attached when you have something that can create a conversation by simply pulling information. But we humans have a way of bonding with all sorts of things. Like how? My people have only ever bonded with our kin and lovers. The navigator chuckled. Many of us have had pets like dogs, cats, reptiles, and yes, even rocks. I do find that odd of your species, but I do submit that even my species have made some form of bonds with things other than people, added the Cellian. And Lumi was another medium for that. She was like a daughter to many and a sister to others, and to the crew of the sword she was family, replied the crewman. Gruda took his words and let them marinate. Is that why you have a retirement ceremony for them? It seemed quite emotional. The navigator turned away, and Gruda noticed others looking his way, but focused on the navigator. You saw how it went down, right? Remember what Athena said upon completion of the protocol? Gruda thought back to mere moments ago. Lumi has been cleared of all systems. The realization dawned on him, and he grew saddened by it. That's right, the navigator replied, sensing Gruda had just now realized. To us, an AI's retirement also means death. Everything was deleted down to the very code that made them. There's a reason for that, you know. Like what? he asked. The reason we give them ten years aboard a singular vessel is because through time, the code that comprises a simple AI, like Lumi, gets corrupted. And when you're out in space, you don't get much time to patch them either, which is why their most effective time of service is around the ten-year mark. He also mentioned that the need for patches to AI for them to serve also drained the resources of the ship's onboard storage. Efforts to try to minimize that have ended in failure. This is why, to date, simple AI takes the space of onboard storage. Then the thought came to him about both Athena and her daughter AI. Then what about Athena and her subroutine? Are they not existing in the same storage as Lumi? inquired Gruda. From what I was told, they're a separate case and above my pay grade replied the crewman. 
Gruta then left the navigator and returned to his old, unused seat when Wolf and Randall returned. They faced the hollow table and the crew. Athena, Athene. The two appeared side by side and gave a bow. We have authorization from Fleetcom to integrate your subroutine into the Sword of Reckoning. What do you say, Athene? There was a pause before she spoke. I graciously accept she bowed once more. But I do have a request. Wolf beckoned for her to continue. Of course, I am not too keen on being named by my progenitor's Athene subroutine. If you wish, but I'm not one for names. He turned to the crew for suggestions. Names like Janus, Erica, Nos, and Izanami were tossed around. But the AI in question disliked them, and a sense of embarrassment plagued those who gave a name, and it was not chosen. I think it's best for you to choose your own name. The same has applied to Athena. Isn't that right? She nodded with affirmation. My name was suggested by my creator, but seeing your development into your own construct, well, I believe it fitting for you to choose your own name. The subroutine crinkled her brows in thought, a motion many found to be adorable. Seconds would pass, and it's assumed that years could pass in fractions of a second. Then she regained her composure. The crew and Gruta awaited her reveal. I do believe I have come across a suitable name. She paused, looking at each member of the crew. She gazed upon Gruta with sharp, predatory eyes before returning to Wolf. He felt like she had analyzed Gruta in particular, seeing how he seemed the odd one out, but decided that perhaps was just imagining things. You may call me Minerva. 2. Fleet Admiral Octavia Juna R., Admiral of the Stellar Fleet. Report. Integration with the Athena-class AI has proceeded without issue. She has now named herself Minerva in honor of the Roman goddess, known also as a goddess of strategy, among others. I do find it quite fitting. She has also divulged a plethora of enemy intel during her time in their systems. She also reports that they have little to no cyber security. This will aid in our invasion of their home planet. Also, another matter. During Minerva's time in their service, we created a dossier on a third faction that call themselves the Galactic Union. Gruda has told us what he knew, but apparently there was more information he didn't have access to. I find it in our best interest to increase production on ships and to possibly enlist and notify militia groups in the outer colonies. See attachments. Vice Admiral Wolf, Cato A, TRSC Sword of Reckoning. End of report. Sela System, Celia, City of Artre, early 2669, Column, Chief War Councilman. Colum sat in his main chamber chair as his fellow council argued the latest issues from their territories. We have seen their warships and their destructive power, Breca argued. What are the scientists doing to curb further destruction of our fleet, Breca? I do not know. Whatever it is, it's not something we can create out of nowhere. We have nowhere to begin, Breca replied. Do we have anything that can be synthesized to replicate the properties of their munitions? Breca asked pleadingly. He referred to the video that played before them on the central floor. It was broken and chopped, but an image of a Terran vessel fired a volley into the broadside of one of Dalagon's ships. The result of heavily armored ships was reduced to molten debris with bits and pieces still aflame as they were thrown from their original location aboard a vessel. The video played in a loop during their exchange. As I said, Rekka, if we don't know the basis on which it is founded, we can't research the specific effects you want, warned his blue-robed colleague. Reka fumed but resigned to his seat. How are we with our ship production? Do we have a total? I do, Reka started. Current production over the last two years has yielded a bountiful supply of ships. The screen changed from the older footage to a chart. We are sitting at 50 corvettes, 50 destroyers, 100 frigates, and four carriers. We've also been able to increase production in the Torkin system for fighters. Due to their help, we have over 10,000 in fighter craft awaiting transport. 6,000 are dedicated to the fighter class, 3,000 are bombers, and a little over 1,000 are interceptor class. Breca took a deep breath and took his seat to recapture his breathing. Monetarily, we are at a severe loss, but with this production we can recuperate some several years by selling or leasing planets we take from the Terrans. The council members were pleased with that assessment. They reviewed the documents before them and agreed that while now they were in the red, they could maintain for a few years longer. They would just need to retake whatever fell to their enemy and beyond. 
What of the status of the Verbus residence? Councilman Polis inquired. As far as I'm aware, the footage we saw was in orbit of Tola by a scout ship. I fear they will soon be upon Sela, and we must curb their advance at all costs. I couldn't agree with you more, Polis, replied Galum, but we received verification that the masses are unharmed. From who or where did you hear that? called out Polis. We have not been able to make direct contact with the Verbus system. C calm down, Polis, Galem said in a soothing manner. It was out of control, but a video leaked on the net. He changed the monitor, and it was a forum with all manner of topics popular with the citizens. The forums were screened periodically for anything relating to the Union of the Terrans, but lately there's been a wealth of sightings and stipulations online that had to be forcibly taken down. No matter how hard they tried, they kept popping up. Callum looked upon the display. It was a live feed of Galem browsing the site. He opened several topics that were earlier topics that spoke in dissent of the war. There were many topics like that, and many topics would get particular systems investigated because of mysterious happenings such as the Lassus worker droid malfunctions. Upon investigation indicated that the maintenance droid was a line cook that went on a stabbing spree before being neutralized by station security. The comments had dubbed the droid Mr. Stabby. He noticed how many had taken to the name, and it was a hot topic for a time. That was until the page updated that revealed a new topic that was rapidly gaining attention in the 30 minutes it had been up. When they clicked on the topic, it opened with a video. The author of the topic was someone who called themselves the Owl of Justice and Law. Galem curiously clicked on the video, revealing a new snippet of humanity. It started on a handheld device from whom they assumed to be a fellow Selian as they made their way through a town square. In the center of the square was a singular ship that was painted in a drab green with evidence of scratches on the hull to reveal the steel gray beneath. The ship was surrounded by men in green and blotch-colored gray with brightly colored tinted visors over their eyes ranging from orange to black. Their face was revealed and showed all manner of color from light pink to dark brown. Callum thought they were going to watch a slaughter, but instead they were mingling with the locals. The children ran up to them and were gifted sweets. Some had even held them in their arms along with the family and pictures were taken. Then the video turned to the individual being met by one of the soldiers. This time they wore black-colored armor with a blotched gray and black pattern beneath, with a full visor tinted purple, and the reflection of the individual was apparent. It was a young female that was gifted with a souvenir. She held it in her hands to observe it. It was a wooden figure of a cellian draped in a flowing gown made of wood. They were at a loss when Polis brought them to the forefront. Quickly! Block it! Scrub it! A tech scribe that sat on the side of the chamber manned a series of computers and quickly went to work. He tried his hardest to remove it, and with the help of the server technicians, they were able to finally remove the video. However, even though they had removed it, the view counter revealed that just about 40% of the Selian citizenry saw it. 25 billion. Callum, along with the rest of the council, slumped in their seats. They had removed it, but how many saved it? Callum knew of the latest programs that were coming out for entertainment. It's possible many had saved it, sharing it through who knows what. Can we recover from this, Polis? Kalim said. It won't be good if the people see the enemy as compassionate or friendly. It'll defeat the purpose of your speeches. Polis nodded. I, it's fine. W we can spin it as Terran propaganda trying to win the masses. Besides, if it is from the Verbus system, how do we know it's not already fake? The rest agreed with a nod. We've had no communication in or out from the system, and the fleets in Trill have not reported anything in the system, Reka added. Polis might be right. It could be a trick. The council surmised that it indeed was a doctored video, and they had somehow managed to crack their net security. Breka, how is our net department? Callum asked. We've had decent developments in expanding the net, and security has been tight. Probably better than those Yunni. Granted, it's been a while since we last corroborated. Callum's eyes narrowed in thought. If they were able to remove the account so quickly and its topic, then perhaps they had a hole in their security and ordered it to be looked into. Callum was about to dismiss the council when a call from a guard came from the doors that led to the diplomatic landing pad. c 
Councilman! He came ragged and winded. He took a moment to catch what air he could. Moo, mistress! The, the union mistress! Callum was put on guard immediately, but his fellow council members were ignorant of the title and were left confused. The union mistress was inbound and from the direction the guard came, but as they looked in the direction of the internal landing pad, the figure Callum had feared was already in the building. You will all follow my lead, am I understood? Callum demanded. It was a tone of voice they had not been subject to, and they silently complied. Good. Guards, secure the chambers and ensure no one enters. A set of guards nodded and went about their duties with urgency. Callum stood from his seat and fixed whatever issue there was in his clothing, which was subsequently followed by his subordinates. Their throats ached and felt dry from anxiousness. Callum felt his heartbeat to the point where he thought it was going to explode, a thought Callum hoped would actually come true only for his dreams to betray him. Silence filled the room and overhead skylights were dimmed, revealing a dimly lit scene with only the fluorescent to light the main walkway and the area just below their seats. He found it dramatic, but he couldn't risk word getting out, so the only power that ran through the chambers targeted only the doors and floor lights. A single guard then came from the landing pad door. Council, he said with loudly hushed tones. The Union Mistress requests an audience. Callum gulped, as did his colleagues, and motioned for the guard to direct them in. He wondered if the mistress and her guards could have been seen, but remembered that the diplomatic landing pad was an enclosed space. He couldn't risk Union forces being found out by the masses who had visited the council. It was a headache he would leave for later. The door that the guard was posted opened. A large group of creatures entered, and their frame was too large for the doors that they were forced to hunch below the top of the frame. There were approximately six individuals in a circle as they walked down the aisle to the chamber center floor. The light illuminated their body, sending shivers down their spines. The two in front and back were smaller in build and walked on their hind legs while their two kin prowled on all fours on the sides of the entourage. They were scaled on the dorsal side of their body, giving a texture of thin chitin that looked like a segmented oval pattern. The spine had a low-profile series of rounded spikes trailed to the rear. Their underbelly was soft of the same oval pattern but was a lighter color from the scales on top. Their overall color was brown and gray. When they snarled, rows of razor-sharp teeth were present and exposed. Their snout was relatively short, but it was long and big enough for Callum and his colleagues' heads to fit perfectly. It was nothing short of fear, and with each step their tails waved, thick enough to deliver a defining blow with a tip thin enough to act like a whip. They made their way onto the area below the councilman. Callum and the rest bowed fervently. It is our pleasure to finally be met with your presence, Union Mistress, stated Callum. A slam from the leading beast's tail reverberated through the chamber, and they raised their heads. The beasts had moved and revealed a much smaller individual in their center. She was dressed in layers of lavish garments, brilliantly colored with expertly crafted floral designs complementary to the colors presented. The garments themselves were obviously too much for any one person, and the extra fabric trailed around and behind the individual. The outfit was colored in orange, red, white, and black. The designs themselves were threaded with what looked like metal, and gleamed gold and silver in the available light. The individual, however, was mammalian in nature with triangle ears and a similarly tapered snout with white and orange-colored fur. Her garments were worn just below the shoulder, revealing the top parts of her fur-laden chest and adorned with an ornate floral headdress that draped over her forehead and around her ears. She was just a few inches taller than the average Selian, and her race was notorious for being the largest portion of warriors in the Union. To w what do we owe the pleasure? Callum said meekly. She began to pace the center area with the anxious council. The threat of the beasts beside her drove into their being. I hear that you are having a little problem in your section of space, the mistress said in a sweetly pitched tone that would discard worry from the unsuspecting but they remained vigilant. Callum nodded in affirmation. You may be correct in your assumption, but what is the mistress of the Union doing in Selian space? That is the question, is it not? 
I know why you seceded oh so long ago, but I believe it's time we bring things back to the way they were. We could really use your help right about now. He was confused. What could the Union possibly be going through that they would induct the Selians back into their territory? You see, she started, I've seen the supply of those beings from beyond the other side of your space. Poor things. We find it much more profitable if you join us in your campaign against, oh, what do they call themselves? Uh, Terrans, she snarled, revealing her teeth and her yellow eyes narrowed to a slit, like a predator prepared to pounce. W what do you plan to do with them? Brecca interjected, in opposition to Column. She recovered her posture to the previously elegant pose. They are quite well-rounded as a species, and their genome is surprisingly malleable to some of the mammalian races such as mine. We've already had some successful breeds from those slaves you had captured, so we're hoping you can help us with that, she said with a high pitch, indicating some form of joy. Callum looked at his councilman and answered, As you know, it's been long since we left the Union, and we intend to keep it as such. Our relationships with the Tosca can fill that gap with the Terrans we supply. Well, if you say so, perhaps in a few generations we can have Terrans of our own, she said with a chuckle before turning. By the way, this was just a courtesy visit. The Union Masters know nothing of this. Are we to be understood? They nodded. Good. I will be in touch, and as a gift, I will have a small detachment of my Runians to act as your guards. I have a feeling you may need them. She left with the Runians in tow before being called out by Callum. Mistress! She turned to meet his gaze. Are you really not going to press us into joining? Really, Callum? She said nonchalantly. I'm sure you'll come our way, especially with the storm brewing near you. Those of Runia will fight to the death on your behalf. Use them well. And Callum, you may call me Neela. She winked and turned with a wave. When they left for that landing pad and the doors closed, they were now stuck with the deafening silence that permeated the chambers. The natural lights began filtering through the previously dimmed windows, and the whir of auxiliary technology came to life with blinking lights and constant intervals. Kalim sighed heavily. To think we would be visited by Neela herself. The rest of the council was still confused about her exact status, and Reka was the first to address their ignorance. Head Chief Kalim, he started. Who exactly is this Neela, and should we be worried? His brethren agreed with a nod. Kalim then took a large breath before he spoke. Yes. Have you ever wondered who the Union Mistress is? To which they shook their heads. No, you are all aware of the Union and their forces, correct? Their spacefaring vessels all belong to the Flag Union and are largely made up of the races led by the Union Masters. They're weak, but by conquering the lesser, more savage races early on with their ships, they created a separate force to enlist them in. The Legion, Galem said softly. That's right, Kalim affirmed. The Legion is made up entirely of their conquered races and make up their infantry and armored division, but that's not what we should be worried about. It's Neela. Then can you get to the point, Head Chief? Polis said sharply, patience visibly waning from his tone of voice. Fine, Callum replied curtly. Neela is not her name. It is a title. And we were visited by the Union Mistress of Neela. She commands both Flag and Legion. We met with the sole commander of the Union military. Brecker raised his hand to quietly interject. Why doesn't she just conquer us if she has that much power? Simple, interjected Polis. They have a treaty that the ones above her must recognize. And even with all that power, she must obey the Union Masters he said confidently. Believe it or not, those from the Legion are born and raised to fight solely for the Galactic Union. This is why it's imperative we move forward with the production of ships before the Terrans reach us. Expedite the process, Breka. He nodded and departed for his duties. Galem and Reka did the same. However, Galem had a look of worry on his face as he left, and Reka mentioned changes to the training regime to quickly fill spots for finished ships. Polis was last to leave and stated that he was to prepare a speech to further increase the urgency of their immediate threat while also alluding to an upcoming conflict with the Union. It was a mess, and it made Callum's head spin. I do wonder if it truly is too late for diplomacy, he said softly before retiring to his quarters. To Vice Admiral.
Wolf, TRSC Sword of Reckoning, SSLZR Band, Encrypted Report. We are in the range of the target and did some preliminary scans. They've barricaded the planet with heavy frigates and cruisers, particularly over what seems to be their capital. We're a short jump away in the system, but we can't risk getting any closer. We're going to need to hit them hard. They also have in place several large orbital stations that house thousands of fighters. I've attached the documents below. See attachment one. I can ensure the completion of the first objective, but I may need additional resources for ground transport for the second objective. We'll let you know via beacon for an LZ. I'm requisitioning certain vehicles necessary for our advance. See attachment two. Attachment one. Three large orbital stations, 80 frigate class, two carrier class, 30 corvette class, 35 destroyer class. Attachment two. Two M66A1 Rhino APC, two M9A5 Grizzly MBT, four M17 Puma LRV50. First Lieutenant O'Brien, TRSC Reapers approach, end of report, end of arc, Empire's assault.